The Positive Theory of Capital by Eugen von Bomberg. Book 5. Present and Future. Chapter 1. Present and Future in Economic Life. Present goods are, as a rule, worth more than future goods of like kind and number. This proposition is the kernel and center of the interest theory which I have to present. All the lines of explanation by which I hope to elucidate the phenomena of interest run through this fact and round it, both essentially and superficially, is grouped the whole of the theoretical work we have to do. The first part of our explanation will try to prove the truth of the proposition. The second will then show that, out of the fact, spring naturally and necessarily all the manifold forms which the phenomena of interest take. In the present book, we have to take up the first part, and I shall try to go into it with that minuteness, which is due to the cardinal importance of such a proposition. To this end, we shall, first of all, make a general survey of the relations between present and future in human economy, a subject obviously of the highest importance, but one which, strangely enough, has up till now attracted but scanty scientific attention. In the present, we live and move but our future is not a matter of indifference to us, and our desires are, with reason, directed towards a well-being not limited by the present. It is only as the logical carrying out of this general principle that we set before us, in our economical arrangements, the larger object of providing for our future as well as for our present well-being. As a fact, the future has a great place in our economical provision, a greater indeed than people usually think. It is, of course, a commonplace, but all the same, it is a truth seldom seen in all its bearings, that our economical conduct has exceedingly little reference to the present, but is almost entirely taken up with the future. Let us clearly understand what this latter statement means. It means that our anxiety in the present is to have at our disposal in the future means for the satisfaction of wants that will not emerge till the future. In other words, it means that our pleasure or pains, which we only experience in the future, determine as now to provide goods or services, which again will only assert their use in the future. But how is it possible that feelings which are not yet felt, and therefore feelings which essentially do not exist, can be motives and will and deed? Now, as a suggestive writer has said, we do not indeed possess the gift of feeling future sensations but we possess the other gift of anticipating them in imagination. Either it is that we have already in the past, once or many times, experienced the same want as we expect in the future and retain a picture of it in our memory. Or at least we have already experienced wants or feelings that bear a certain resemblance to the feelings we are expecting. And can from such analogous reminiscences construct for ourselves an imaginative picture which is more or less true. On such pictures of memory and imagination, we base our economical calculations and our economical decisions. Certainly, as many a one will be apt to object, it is an unsafe and deceptive foundation, but all the same, it is almost the only one that we have. It is the rarest possible thing for us to base a valuation of goods or an economical decision on a pain that we are feeling at the very moment. It is indeed one of the characteristics of a civilized community that it anticipates want by providing for it, and does not allow the pain of emptiness which the unsatisfied want would involve to get its full height. We do not begin to prepare our meals when hunger has reached its highest point of torment. We do not wait till the flood has overwhelmed house and home before we think of putting up the dam. We do not delay building the fire engine till the flames have broken over us. At the moment when we decide on an economical action, the wants which cause us to make the decision are almost always in the future, and so however near that future may be, they are acting on us, not as actual feelings, but as simple anticipations. How many a man has never, even in the past, fully felt the want which makes him value the goods he daily uses? How many rich people know only from hearsay, what real hunger is. Hence it is obvious that however deceitful and unsafe this gift of anticipation may be, and however far astray it may lead us in individual cases, 
we still have every cause to be heartily thankful that we have it. Otherwise, neither actual feeling the future wants, nor yet forewarned of them by anticipation, we could not, of course, provide for them in advance. Once want had made itself felt, any measures we could take would be miserably inadequate to provide for it. And poorer than the poorest savages, we should drag out a hazardous hand-to-mouth existence. But economical action means something more than thinking generally about the wants which are to be provided for as indeed all economizing arises from the quantitative insufficiency of the means of satisfaction as compared with the wants requiring satisfaction. So it demands a constant selection, a constant choosing, between those wants which can and should be provided for, and those others which cannot be provided for. The selection naturally proceeds upon a comparison of the importance and urgency, or, as we may say, the intensity of the feelings of pleasure and pain which are associated with individual wants and their satisfaction. Now if it is seldom that in the moment of an economical decision we actually feel that one want to which it refers, it is much more seldom that on the moment of our choice we experience as actual feelings all those sensations of pleasure and pain between which we have to choose. Our comparisons must almost invariably be partially and very often completely made on imaginative anticipations which we make of future feelings. And this leads us to a fact which I should like to emphasize. The future feelings we imagine are commensurable. They are commensurable with present actually felt sensations, and they are commensurable with one another, and that too without reference to whether they belong to the same or different levels of time. It is as easy for me to choose between a pleasure which seems desirable at the moment and another pleasure which I can obtain in eight days, as between two different pleasures which are both obtainable in eight days, or again, as between two pleasures of which the one is obtainable in eight days, the other in eight months or eight years. The fact that we borrow from the future sensations the motive of our present actions is one side of our connection with the future. Another side is that, by our present actions, we prepare goods or material services for the benefit of the future. If we analyze the totality of goods which constitutes our wealth, we shall find that by far the greater part has the character of want. For want of a better name, we may call future goods. All productive goods without exception are destined altogether to the service of the future. Durable consumption goods gives off only a fraction of their material services in the present and all the remainder in the future. If a dwelling house, for instance, remains occupied for a hundred years and affords shelter and comfort all that time, only an infinitesimal fraction of these services is rendered today. A still very small fraction is rendered in the present year. A great bulk of the service is spread over remote future periods. Even in the case of those perishable goods, such as meat and drink, wood and candles, which keep ready for immediate consumption in our domestic economy. Only one portion of their use is, strictly speaking, devoted to the service of the moment. The greater part is carried over into the future. Although it may be the immediate future, as among our motives, future feelings are the dominant ones. So among the goods we possess and use, future goods occupy the larger place. And there is yet another important analogy, as future feelings, whether they belong to the near or to the far future, are commensurable, alike with one another, and the present feelings, so are future goods commensurable, alike with one another, and with present goods. We can compare the value of a camellia, which fades in an hour, with that of a ticket for next week's concert, or with that of a bunch of next year's roses or we can give one of these goods for the other. It makes no difference to the matter whether the future good which we compare or barter is at hand and ready for delivery now, or whether it is represented in bodily shape by nothing more than the means of production out of which it will come, or whether at the moment it is neither itself ready nor is capable of being palpably represented is, that is to say, a future good in the narrowest and strictest sense of that word. Thus we give present money in exchange not only for the present consumption good, bread, 
but also for the present productive good meal, in which the future good bread lies concealed. But just as easily can we buy from a farmer, for money down, his next year's harvest. In reserved seats, we buy the future services of actors and singers. In buying consoles, we give our present money for a series of future payments. Future goods and services are to us, I have cause to emphasize this, entirely familiar objects of economic dealing, just as future feelings are entirely familiar economic motives. Both have their ultimate ground in their continuity of our personal life. What we shall experience in a week or a year hence affects us not less than what we experience today, and has therefore equal claims to be considered in our economic arrangements. Both arrangements have for their end our well-being. Whether this theoretically similar claim of future and present is always fully recognized in practical life is another question which will require much consideration. Provision for the future makes no inconsiderable demands on our intellectual strength, makes some demands even on our moral strength, and these demands are not equally met by men at all stages of civilization. The present always gets its rights. It enforces itself upon us through our senses to cry for food when hunger occurs even to a baby. But the future we must anticipate and picture. Indeed, to have any effect in the future, we must form a double series of anticipations. We must be able to form a mental picture of what will be the state of our wants, needs, feelings, at any particular point of time. And we must be able to form another set of anticipations as to the fate of those measures which we take at the moment with a view to the future. Our knowledge of causal processes must enable us beforehand to form an adequate picture of the forms which goods will take, of the quantity of them, and of the time when they come to maturity as a result of those productive or commercial activities which we are now commencing. To make this double work of anticipating a comparatively remote future clear and true to fact, it is not possible to the infant and not much more possible to the child and savage. Civilization, of course, teaches us this difficult art gradually, but even among the most advanced peoples, the art is still very far from being perfect, and the practical economic provision for the future is correspondingly inadequate. But be the degree of anticipation and provision for the future what it may, whatever it exists in the most general way, and that is even among the most barbarous tribes, Future goods and services are as much actual objects of economical dealing as present goods. We strive to get them, we produce them, we value them, we buy and sell them. I say we value them, and this is a point that must be looked more closely into. On what principles do we estimate the value of future goods? The answer is on the same principles as we estimate the value of goods in general, that is, according to the marginal utility which they bring us in the circumstances of want and provision for want. But here, naturally, we have not to deal with the relations of want and provision that obtain at the moment, but with the want and provision of that future period when the goods in question will be at our disposal. To the inhabitants of a besieged town, threatened with starvation, grain that was promised for delivery a year after the raising of the siege would certainly not be valued and paid according to the standard of the moment's need, while on the contrary, a brewer who, in January, concludes a purchase for a hundred cubic feet of ice to be delivered in July of the coming summer, will just as certainly not measure the value of the ice according to the oversupply that obtains at that moment when the bargain is concluded, but according to the scarcity which is likely to come with the summer. Very frequently, however, there enters into the valuation of goods an element which causes us to value them a little or even a great deal under their future marginal utility, but which, as I shall show presently, has no connection with the phenomenon of interest. This is the element of uncertainty. To us, nothing future is absolutely certain. However, closely, we may have bound present and future together in economical connection, and however much reason we may have to expect the future to bring certain goods into existence, or put them at our disposal. Still, the actual fulfillment of our expectations is never, in the strict sense of the word, certain. 
it is always more or less probable. Of course, the probability is often so great that practically it amounts to certainty. As for instance, the expectation that payment will follow an acceptance by the Rothschilds. In such cases, we do neglect the infinitely small amount that is wanting of full certainty and deduct nothing from the valuation we put upon the acceptance on the ground of uncertainty. But frequently, the probability falls considerably short of full certainty. The farmer, for instance, may have done everything in his power to obtain a harvest by plowing, manuring, sowing, and so on. But the harvest may be destroyed wholly or in part by hail, frost, flooding, or insect ravages. Sometimes, indeed, the probability sinks to the level of a very faint possibility, as, for example, when a man holds one of the hundred tickets in a lottery where there is only a single prize. Cases like these cause a certain amount of hesitation to economic men. Are they to value uncertain future sums of goods exactly if they were certain? Impossible. For then every lottery ticket that carried the chance of winning a hundred pounds would be valued at a hundred pounds, and every claim, even the most doubtful, at its full nominal amount, a course which, obviously, would land the men who tried to do business on these lines in the bankruptcy court in the shortest possible time. Or are the uncertain future sums of goods not to have any value put upon them? Is no importance whatever to be attached to them with respect to our well-being? As impossible and as ruinous, for then no man would give the smallest price for a chance in a lottery, or even for 999 chances out of a thousand. No one would dare to make the slightest sacrifice to sow when harvest was uncertain. From this dilemma, there is only one escape. We must ascribe to uncertain future sums of goods an importance as regards our well-being, but at the same time, we must take account of the uncertainty of their acquisition according to the degree of that uncertainty. But practically, this cannot be done otherwise than by transferring the gradation from where the gradation exists, but cannot be expressed, that is, from the degree of probability to where the gradation is not, but where alone it can be expressed, that is, the degree of the expected utility, thus equalizing the greater but less probable utility to a less but more probable utility, and this again to a still less but absolutely certain utility. In a word, we reduce all possibilities of utility to certainty, and restore the balance by deducting from this utility or value the amount we must add to the probability of the expected utility to raise it to certainty. Thus we reckon a claim on the Rothschilds at its full nominal value, disregarding for the moment the discount as belonging to an entirely different sphere of phenomena, while one lottery ticket of a thousand, where the chance is a prize of one hundred pounds, we value perhaps at two shillings one of a hundred at twenty shillings, and one of ten perhaps at ten pounds. Strictly looked at, this kind of valuation, except with a certainty of the anticipated future utility, is practically assured, is always incorrect. For, to recur to our illustration, the ticket will either draw the prize, or it will draw a blank. In the former case, it will have been, as the events show, worth a hundred pounds, in the latter, worth nothing at all. In no case will it have been worth two shillings or twenty shillings or ten pounds. But however false this method of valuation is, in the individual case, it comes at least approximately right, according to the law of averages, over a great many cases. And in the absence of any better method of valuation, which is denied us by the dullness of our imaginative forethought, it is well justified as a practical makeshift. I repeat that the element of uncertainty, which is a cause of a lesser value, being put upon particular classes of the future goods has no causal connection with the phenomenon of interest. The lesser valuation, which is its effect, is a special one, and extends to one class of future goods only, and there it bears the character of a deduction as premium for risk. With the exception of this peculiarity, the valuation of present and future goods is made on identical principles, but to conclude from this that the amount of value of present and future goods must be identical, would be too hasty. On the contrary, since present goods are available at a different time from future ones, and therefore come under different actual circumstances, and are intended for the services 
of a different set of wants it is to be argued from all we know about value that the value of such goods must as a rule be different and so it is in fact we arrive thus at a proposition which is a fundamental one in our inquiry as a rule present goods have a higher subjective value than future goods of the like and number and since the resultant of subjective valuations determines objective exchange value, present goods as a rule have a higher exchange value and price than future goods of the kind and number. This phenomenon is the result of the cooperation of a number of causes, causes which, individually, are of very different natures, but which, as it happens, work in the same direction. These causes we shall consider in order. Chapter 2 Differences in want and provision for want. The first great cause of difference in value between present and future goods consists in the different circumstances of want and provision, in present and future. Present goods, as we know, receive their value from the circumstances of want and provision in the present. Future goods, from the same circumstances in those future periods of time, when they will come into our disposal. If a person is badly in want of certain goods, or of goods in general, while he has reason to hope that, at a future period, he will be better off, he will always value a given quantity of immediately available goods at a higher figure than the same quantity of future goods. In economic life, this occurs very frequently, and may be considered as typical in the two following cases. First, in all cases of immediate distress and necessity, a peasant who had a bad harvest or sustained loss by fire, an artisan who has had heavy expenses through illness or death in his family, a laborer who is starving. All these agree in value the present shilling, which lifts them out of direst need ever so much more than the future shilling, the proof being the serious conditions to which such people often submit in order to raise money at the moment. Second, in the case of persons who have reason to look forward to economical circumstances of increasing comfort, thus all kinds of beginners who have no means such as young artists, lawyers, officials, budding doctors, men going into business, are only too ready in return for a sum of present goods which assist them to start in the vocation they have chosen, and acts as foundation for their economical existence, to promise a considerably larger sum on the condition that they do not require to pay it until they are in receipt of a decent income. Of course, the contrary also occurs, not unfrequently in economic life, there are persons who are comparatively well off at the moment and who are likely to be worse off in the future. To this category belongs, among others, that very considerable number of people whose income is obtained mostly or altogether by personal exertions and will presumably fall away at a later period of life when they become unfit for work. A merchant's clerk, for instance, who is in his 50th year and has an income of 100 pounds, cannot expect to have anything better 10 years later than perhaps a small retirement allowance of £30, or an annuity which he may secure by purchase at an assurance office. It is evident that to such people the marginal utility that depends on a shilling spent now is smaller than the depending on a shilling available in the more badly secured future. It would seem that, in such cases, a present shilling should be less valued than a future one, and so it would be if present goods were necessarily spent in the present, but that is not the case. Most goods, and among them particularly money, which represents all kinds of goods indifferently, are durable and can, therefore, be reserved for the service of the future. The case, then, between present and future goods stands thus. The only possible uses of future goods are, naturally, future, while present goods have the same possibility of future use, and have, besides, according to choice, either the present uses or the future ones, which may turn up in the time that intervenes between the present moment and the future point of time, with which the comparison is being made. Here then are two possibilities. Either it is the case that those uses of the present and near future, which are generally taken into consideration as regards the good in question, are less important than the future uses, and in this case the present good will be reserved for these future uses, will derive its value from them, and will be just equal in value to a future good similarly available, or in the case that one of the earlier uses is more important, and that the present good gets its value from this use, 
and has, therefore, the advantage over the future good, which can only obtain its value from a less important future employment. But usually, one never knows that some unforeseen occurrence in the near future may not give rise to some urgent want. At any rate, such a thing is possible, and it gives a chance of profitable employment to a good already on hand, such as, naturally, a good that will only come into our possession in the future has not got, a chance which, as we have seen, is calculated in the amount of the value and assessed according to practical although incorrect methods as an increment graduated according to its probability. To put in figures, with 100 pounds which will come into my hands at the end of five years, I can only aim at a marginal utility determined by the situation of things in the year 1896. We shall put this utility down at 1,000 ideal units. With 100 pounds at my disposal now, I can at the least realize the same marginal utility of 1,000 units. But if an urgent want arising in the meantime gives me an opportunity to obtain a marginal utility of 1,200, I may possibly realize it. Say now that the probability of such an opportunity occurring equals one tenth. I shall estimate the value of the present 100 pounds at 1,000 units certain, and beyond that, a one tenth of the possible surplus of 200, that is, in all, at 1,020 units. Present goods are, therefore, in the worst case, equal in value to future goods, and as a rule, they have the advantage over them in being employed as a reserve. The only exception occurs in those comparatively rare cases where it is difficult or impracticable to keep the present goods till the time the worst provision comes. This happens, for instance, in the case of goods subject to rapid deterioration or decay, such as ice, fruit, and the like. Any fruit merchant in harvest time will put a considerably higher value on a bushel of grapes to be delivered in April than on a bushel of grapes in his store at the time or say that a rich man is anticipating a long period of arrest, during which his living will be conformed to the hard fare of prison regime, how willingly would he give the price of a hundred present luxurious meals if he could ensure ten such meals during his captivity? We may then draw up the balance sheet, which shows the influence of the different circumstances of want and its provision in present and future as follows. A great many persons who are not so well provided for in the present as they expect to be in the future, set a considerably higher value on present goods than on future. A great many persons who are better provided for in the present than they expect to be in the future, but who have the chance of preserving present goods for the service of the future and, moreover, of using them as a reserve fund for anything that may turn up in the meantime. Value present goods either at the same figure as future or a little higher. It is only a fractional minority of cases where communication between present and future is hindered or threatened by peculiar circumstances that present goods have for their owners, a lower subjective use value than future. This being the state of things, even if there was nothing else cooperating with this difference of want and provision in present and future, the resultant of the subjective valuations, which determines the objective exchange value, would obviously be such that present goods must maintain a proportionate advantage, a proportionate agio over future. But besides this, there are other cooperating circumstances which work even more distinctly in the same direction. Chapter 3. Underestimate of the Future It is one of the most pregnant facts of experience that we attach a less importance to future pleasures and pains, simply because they are future, and in the measure that they are future, Thus it is that, to goods which are destined to meet the wants of the future, we ascribe a value which is really less than the true intensity of their future marginal utility. We systematically underestimate future wants and the goods which are to satisfy them. Of the fact itself, there can be no doubt, but of course, in particular nations, at various stages of life, in different individuals, the phenomenon makes its appearance in very varying degrees. We find it most frankly expressed in children and savages. With them, the slightest enjoyment, if only it can be seized at the moment, outweighs the greatest and most lasting advantage. How many an Indian tribe, with careless greed, has sold the land of its fathers, the source of its maintenance of the pale faces for a couple of casks of fire water. Unfortunately, 
very much the same may be seen in our own highly civilized countries. The working man who drinks on Sunday, the week's wage he gets on Saturday, and starves along with his wife and children the next six days, is not far removed from the Indian. But to a smaller extent and more refined form, the same phenomenon is, I venture to assert, not quite known to any of us, however prudent or cultured or highly principled. Which of us has not been surprised to find that, under the pressure of momentary appetite, he was not able to refuse some favorite dish or cigar which the doctor had forbidden, knowing perfectly that he was doing an injury to his health, which calm consideration would tell him was much more considerable than the pleasure of that trifling indulgence? Or which of us has not to avoid a little momentary embarrassment or annoyance, plunged headlong into a much greater? Who is there that has never postponed some troublesome but unavoidable call, or business, or work which had to be done within a certain time, till the days was past when it could be done with little trouble, and has had to do it in more difficult circumstances, in haste and hurry, with overexertion and ill humour, to the displeasure of those who were injured or wounded by the delay? Anyone who knows himself and keeps his eyes open to what is going on around him, will find this fact of the future underestimate of future pleasures and pains exhibited under a thousand forms in the midst of our civilized society. Of the fact, then, there is no doubt, why it should be more difficult to say, the entire psychological relations, indeed through which future feelings in general act on our judgments and our actions are still very obscure, and it will be understood that the same obscurity covers the reasons why future feelings act with greater weakness on our judgments and actions are still very obscure, and it will be understood that the same obscurity covers the reasons why future feelings act with greater weakness on our judgments and actions than present feelings. Without meaning to forestall the pronouncement of the psychologists, who seem to me more competent to decide on both questions than the economists, I venture to think that this phenomenon rests not on one ground, but on the joint action of no less than three different grounds. The first ground seems to me to be the incompleteness of the imaginations we form to ourselves of our future wants. Whether it be that our power of representation and abstraction is not strong enough, or whether it be that we not take the necessary trouble, the consideration we give our future, and particularly our faraway future wants, is more or less imperfect. Naturally then, all those wants which we have not considered remain without influence on the valuation of such goods as are destined to serve those future wants, and consequently the marginal utility of such goods is put too low. While this first ground is very much a peculiar defect in estimate, the second seems to me to rest on a defect in will. I believe it frequently occurs that a man, called on to make choice between a present and a future pleasure or pain, decides for the present pleasure although he knows perfectly and is even conscious while choosing that his future loss will outweigh his present gain and that taking his welfare as a whole the choice is unprofitable how well many a good fellow knows the painful embarrassments and privations he is bringing on himself by running through his salary on the day he gets it and he has not the strength to resist the temptation of the moment or how often does a man from weakness let himself be hurried into taking some steps or making some promise, which he knows at the moment he will rue before twenty-four hours are over. The cause of such defects in conduct, I say, appears to me, in distinction from the former case, to rest, not on want of knowledge, but on defect of will. I should not be surprised, however, if the psychologist were to explain this case also as only a variation of the former. It may be that the weaker feeling of the moment prevails over the stronger feeling of the future only because of the latter. While present in consciousness, in a general way, is not lively enough and strong enough to take possession of the mind. For our purpose, however, it is a matter of no consequence. Finally, as third ground, I am inclined to name the consideration of the shortness and uncertainty of life. In the case of future goods, their objective acquisition may be practically certain, and yet it is possible that we may not live to acquire them. This mistakes their utility a matter of uncertainty for us, and causes us, in perfect analogy, with the case of objectively uncertain goods, to make a deduction 
from their value corresponding to the degree of uncertainty. The utility of 100, as to which there is 50% of probability that we shall not live to see it, we certainly do not value so highly as a present utility of 100. Probably we value it as we do a present utility of 50. And I am convinced that any of us who was promised today a check for 10,000 on his 100th birthday would be glad to exchange this large but somewhat uncertain gift for a very small sum in present money. To determine correctly the practical influence of this factor, however, we must make a somewhat more accurate calculation, both to the extent to which it prevails and the way in which it works. As regards this, I think, we shall be able to establish what follows. The factor in question is directly active, only in a minority of cases. In most cases, its action is indirect. It works in the most direct and powerful way in those not very numerous cases where men have the thought of death forced on them by peculiar circumstances. For example, among very old men, people suffering from fatal diseases, those placed in dangerous situations or engaged in very perilous callings, such as people in times of plague or soldiers before an engagement, and so on. To disregard a future so uncertain not seldom finds drastic expression in the mad extravagance which seizes people in such circumstances, a fact in the history of civilization which has often been noted by Adam Smith, among others. On the other hand, the thought of the uncertainty of life seems to me to exert no direct influence at all in the vast majority of cases where we are dealing with men in normal circumstances, and dealing, at the same time, with the valuation of goods belonging to a time not very far in the future, say goods that would come into their possession in a couple of days, or months, or even years. I am convinced that a healthy middle-aged man, to whom a payment of 100 next year was due for certain, would not value a single penny, less on the ground that he might not live to see next year. It is only where very long periods of time are concerned that this factor among normally situated men obtains fully and directly. Payments which fall due in a hundred, fifty, or even twenty years lose its value from the consideration of the uncertainty of life as regards all payees. Payments which fall due in ten years lose in value as regards a great many. And here, finally, we have the point from which this third motive may rise to universal indirect efficiency, although, at the same time, a very much weakened efficiency. If certain differences of valuation have once become established as regards long intervals of time, they must, through the agency of exchange transactions, to some degree affect shorter intervals. For the mechanism which determines objective value abhors any sudden leap in value. It is not possible, for example, that a payment of 100, which will be made on the 1st of January 1900, certain, should be worth only 80 till 31st December 1889 and should jump up to the full value of 100 at 12 o'clock that night, because of the due date is now only 10 years off. Equalizing tendencies and transactions, which I can best compare with stock exchange arbitrage, spread the differences of value, which obtain, as regards long periods, uniformity over the entire intermediate period. Putting all these peculiar circumstances together, I should be inclined to consider the practical efficiency of this factor not altogether trifling, Still, I should not place it very high, especially as it is weakened, to a not inconsiderable extent, by the consideration of closely related errors. In any case, the two motives first mentioned have considerably more to do with the undervaluation of the future utility than the third. All three causes of our underestimate of future utility, errors of valuation through faulty representation of coming needs, defects of will, and the consideration of the uncertainty of life, manifest themselves in extremely different degrees in different individuals, and even in the same individual at different times, according to differences of temperament and mood. For the same interval of time, they may cause one to make an undervaluation of 100%, another of 50%, a third of 1% or 2%, while they may send fanatics in the matter of foresight and precaution to the opposite extreme of overvaluing future utility. I should like to call special attention Further, to the fact that the undervaluation which results from these causes is not at all graduated harmoniously in the subjective valuation of the individuals, according to the length of the time that intervenes. I mean it is not graduated in this way. 
For example, that the man who discounts a utility which he expects to get in one year by 5% must discount a utility due in two years by 10%, or one due in three months by one and a quarter percent. On the contrary, the original subjective undervaluations are, in the highest degree, unequal and irregular, in particular so far as the undervaluation is caused by defects of will, there may be a strong difference between an enjoyment which offers itself at the very moment, and one which does not, while on the other hand there may be a very small difference or no difference at all between an enjoyment which is pretty far away, and one which is farther away. Uniformity is practically introduced into the various undervaluations as we shall see later, only through the mediation of exchange business. At any rate, and this is sufficient for us here, all three causes have one common result, that under their influence we estimate the utility of future goods at a lower figure than expresses their true value. We look at the marginal utility of future goods diminished, as it were, in perspective. Now it is easy to show that this phenomenon must substantially contribute to strengthen the efficiency of the first factor in the undervaluation of future goods. The difference in the provision of goods for present and future. All persons who are worse off in the present than they expect to be in the future, persons to whom, therefore, the true marginal utility of a future good is already less than the marginal utility of a similar present good, are led by this second factor to put the future marginal utility still lower than it really is. And this increases the difference in value to the future prejudice of future goods. If, for example, the marginal utility of a definite present good is 100, then the true marginal utility of a similar good in a better provided future is 80. The future good will be rated perhaps at 70 only, thanks to this second factor, and thus the difference of the valuation rises from 20 to 30. In the same way those persons who may be supposed to be in approximately similar circumstances in present and future, and would, other things being equal, value present and future goods at approximately the same figure, will fall under the category of those who value present goods more highly than future. This second factor then increases both the number and the intensity of the differences in valuation to the prejudice of future goods, and naturally, in the market where present goods are exchanged against future, this must make the resultant exchange value more unfavorable to the latter. The agio on present goods moves upwards. Chapter 4. The Technical Superiority of Present Goods There is still a third reason why present goods are, as a rule, worth more than future. The fact on which it is based has long been known in a general way, but its essential nature has been thoroughly misunderstood. Hidden in a perfect wilderness of mistakes, economists ever since Say and Lauderdale have been in the habit of going to it under the name of productivity of capital, for their explanation and justification of interest. This name, which has already been the cause of so many errors, and which besides does not altogether correspond with what it is intended to convey, I shall lay on one side, and shall confine myself to the facts of the case pure and simple. These facts are as follows, that as a rule, present goods are on technical grounds, preferable instruments for the satisfaction of human wants and assures us, therefore, a higher marginal utility than future goods. It is an elementary fact of experience that methods of production which take time are more productive. That is to say, given the same quantity of productive instruments, the lengthier the productive method employed, the greater the quantity of products that can be obtained. In previous chapters we went very thoroughly into this, showed the reasons of it, and illustrated and confirmed it by many examples. I venture to think we may now assume it as proved, if then we take an amount of productive instruments available at a certain point of time as given, we have to represent the product which may be turned out by increasingly lengthy processes under the picture of a series increasing in a certain ratio, regular or irregular. Suppose that in the year 1888 we have command of a definite quantity of productive instruments, say 30 days of labor, we may, in terms of the above proposition, assume something like the following. The month's labor employed in methods that give a return immediately and are, therefore, very unremunerative, will yield only 100 units of product, 
employed in a one year's process, it yields 200 units, but of course yields them for the year 1889. Employed in two years process, it yields 280 units for the year 1890, and so on in increasing progression, say 350 units for 1891, 400 for 1892, 440 for 1893, 470 for 1894, and 500 for 1895. Compare with this what we may get from a similar quantity of productive instruments, namely a month's labor, under the condition that we do not get possession of the labor till a year later. A month's labor which falls due in the year 1889 evidently yields nothing for the economic year 1888. If any result is to be got from it in the year 1889, it can only be by employing it in the most remunerative, because immediate, production. And that result will be as above 100 units. In 1890, it is possible to have a return of 200 units by employing it in a one year's method of production. In 1891, to have 280 units by employing it in a two year's process, and so on. In exactly the same way, with a month's labor falling due two years later, in 1890, nothing can be had to satisfy the wants of the economic years, 1888 and 1889 while 100 units may be got for 1890 by a remunerative immediate process. 200 for 1891, 280 for 1892, and so on. If we group together in one table the result obtainable for the satisfaction of our wants from a similar amount of present, next year's, and succeeding year's productive instruments, we get the following scheme. Putting these figures into words, the table shows that whatever economic period we may fix upon our economic interests for that period are more advanced by a month's labor of 1888 than by a month's labor of 1889, and one of 1889 than by one of 1890, and so on. To meet the wants of 1888, for example, a month's labor expended in the year 1889 or 1890 gives us nothing, while a month's labor expended in 1888 places at our command at least 100 units of product. To meet the wants of 1893, a month of 1890 gives us 350 units, a month of 1889 400 units, a month of 1888 440 units. Whatever period of time we take as our standpoint of comparison, the earlier present amount of productive instruments is seen to be superior, technically to the equally great later future amount but it is superior also in the height of its marginal utility and value. Certainly it is, for if in every conceivable department of wants, for the supply of which we may or shall employ it, it puts more means of satisfaction at our disposal. It must have a greater importance for our well-being. Of course, I am aware that our greater amount need not always have the greater value. A bushel of corn in a year of famine may be worth more than two bushels after a rich harvest. A silver shilling before the discovery of America was worth more than five shillings or an owl, but for one and the same person at one and the same point of time, the greater amount has always the greater value. Whatever may be the absolute value of the bushel or the shilling, this much is certain, that for me two shillings or two bushels which I have today are worth more than one shilling or one bushel which I have today. And in our comparison of the value of a present and a future amount of productive instruments, the case is exactly similar. Possibly the 470 units of product which may be made from a month's labor in 1889 for the year 1895 are worth less than the 350 units which may and be got from the same for the year 1892. And the latter, notwithstanding, their numbers may be the most valuable product which can be made out of a month of 1889 in general. In any case, the 400 units which a man can gain by a month's labor of the year 1888 for the year 1892 are still more valuable, and therefore the superiority of the earlier present amount of productive instruments here and everywhere, however the illustration may be varied, remains confirmed. The truth of the proposition, the technical superiority of present to future means of production must also be associated with the superiority in value, may be made absolutely convincing by mathematical evidence if the tabular comparison which we have drawn out to show the technical productiveness of different years of productive instruments be extended 
to the marginal utility and value of the same. And since we have to deal here with a proposition which will form the chief pillar in my interest theory, I prefer to err on the side of making it too plain rather than risk not making it plain enough, and I shall spare no pains to prove it in the most complete way. In other respects, too, the trouble it costs to us will not be altogether lost. As we proceed, we shall get an occasional glimpse into certain relations, which are seldom or never taken thought of, and yet nonetheless have some importance towards giving us a complete and thorough grasp of the whole. The marginal utility and value of means of production depend, as we know, on the anticipated marginal utility and value of their product. But the means of production of which we have been speaking, the month's labor may be invested in a production that yields an immediate return, or in one, two, three, or ten years period of production, and according as it is so invested, we may obtain the very different product of 100, 200, 280, 350 units, and so on. Which of these products is to be our standard? The foregoing chapters have already given us the answer. In the case of goods which may be employed in different ways, yielding different marginal utilities, it is the highest marginal utility that is the standard. Therefore, in our present case, it is that product which produces the greatest amount of value. But this need not coincide with the largest product, the product which contains the greatest number of units. On the contrary, it seldom or never coincides with that. We should obtain the greatest number of units by an infinitely long production process, or a process lasting a hundred or two hundred years. But goods which come into possession in the lifetime of our grandchildren or great-grandchildren have, in our valuation of today, little or no value. In determining which of various possible products has the highest value for us, we are guided by the two considerations of which we have just spoken. First, we are guided by the anticipated position of our provision at the various periods of time. If, for instance, a man is ill provided for in the present or not provided for at all, the unit of product in the present may, on that very account, have so high a marginal utility and value that the sum of value of 100 present units of product is greater to him than that of 500 units, which he might have at his command in 1895. To another man, again, whose present is also well provided for, or nearly as well provided for as his future, the advantage in numbers may give an advantage in value to the 500 units. The second consideration by which we are guided is that our present valuation of a future good or product does not depend on its true marginal utility, but on our subjective estimation of the marginal utility. But in forming this subjective estimate, there takes place, as we have already seen, a kind of perspective diminution a diminution which is in direct ratio with the futurity of the time to which the good in question belongs. The amount of which we are in search, therefore, the greatest sum of value will evidently belong to that one among the various possible products, the number of whose items multiplied by the value of the unit of product, as that value shows itself with regard to the relation of want and provision for want in the particular economic period, and with regard to the diminution which future goods undergo from perspective, gives the greatest amount of value. We shall put our illustration in figures chosen at random. I wish to emphasize that the figures can be chosen quite at random and varied by the reader, at will, for our proposition maintains its validity in every conceivable position of subjective valuations. Moreover, I intentionally take figures varying very greatly and irregularly, it being obvious enough, without any special demonstration, that if the value of the unit of goods were not to vary for the different periods, or not to vary much, the present means of production, as giving a greater quantity of products, would inevitably give us also a greater sum of value. Assume then, quite at random, that for a certain individual, the true marginal utility and value of the unit of product, taking into account his special circumstances of provision, which we shall suppose are, on the whole, gradually improving, are as follows. In 1888, five units of value. In 1889, four. In 1890, 3.3. .3. In 1891, 2.5. In 1892, 2.2. .2. In 1893, 2.1. In 1894, 2. And in 1895, 1.5. This true marginal utility, then, by reason of perspective, experiences 
for the later periods an irregularity progressive reduction of this kind. For 1888, it is subjectively estimated 5, without reduction. For 1889, instead of 4, it is 3.8. For 1890, instead of 3.3, it is only 3. For 1891, 2.2. For 1892, 2. For 1893, 1.8. And for 1894, 1.5. And for 1895, 1. If now, on the basis of these figures, we calculate the sums of value represented by the different possible products of a month's labor falling due in the various years from 1888 to 1891, we get the following tables. A month's labor available in 1888 yields. A month's labor available in 1889 yields. A month's labor available in 1890 yields. A month's labor available in 1891 yields. The conclusion we draw from these tables is the following. The highest value of product obtainable by the month's labor available in 1888, that which determines its own valuation, is 840. The highest value obtainable by a month's labor available in 1889 is only 720, while the highest value obtainable by a month's labor available in 1890 and 1891 is 630 and 525 respectively. As a fact, therefore, the present month's labor is superior to all future ones not only in technical productiveness, but also in marginal utility and value. I repeat emphatically that this result is not an accidental one, such as might have made its appearance in consequence of the particular figures used in our hypothesis. On the single assumption that longer methods of production lead generally to a greater product, it is a necessary result, a result which must have occurred in an exactly similar way, whatever might have been the figures of quantity of product and value of unit in the different years. I must further lay particular weight on the fact that this result does not make its appearance simply because in our hypothesis we have introduced as already active those other two circumstances which are fitted to account for a surplus value of present as against future goods, namely a difference in the circumstances of provision at the various periods of time and a diminution of the future utility by way of perspective. The superiority and value of present means of production, which is based on their technical superiority, is not one borrowed from these circumstances. It would emerge of its own strength, even if these were not active at all. I have introduced the two circumstances into the hypothesis, only to make it a little more true to life, or rather to keep it from being quite absurd. Take, for instance, the influence of reduction due to a perspective entirely out of illustration, and we get the following figures. We see that now the absolute figures of the sums of value are increased throughout, and also that the economic center of gravity is transferred to another year. But the thing which concerns us is that the result remains unchanged. The month labor of 1888 shows the highest figure of value, and all the others a decreasingly smaller one. But if we were also to abstract the difference in circumstances of provision in different periods of time, the situation we receive the stamp of extreme improbability, even of self-contradiction. If the value of the unit of product were to be the same in all periods of time, however remote, the most abundant product would naturally at the same time be the most valuable. But since the most abundant product is obtained by the most lengthy and roundabout methods of production, perhaps extending over decades of years, the economic center of gravity for all present means of production would, on this assumption, be found at extremely remote periods of time, which is entirely contrary to all experience. And besides, if such a state of things were to emerge at any particular point of time, it would immediately bring its own correction. For if every employment of goods of future periods is not only technically, but economically more remunerative, than the employment of them for the present or near future, of course men would withdraw their stocks of goods, to a great extent, from the service of the present, and direct them to the more remunerative service of the future. But this would immediately cause an ebb tide in the provision for the present, and a flood in the provision for the future, for the future would then have the double advantage of having a greater amount of productive instruments directed to its service and those instruments employed in more fruitful methods of production. Thus the difference in the circumstances of provision, which might have disappeared for the moment which would occur of its own accord.
but it is just at this point that we get the best proof that the superiority in question is the independent of the differences, and that the circumstances of provision, so far from being obliged to borrow its strength and activity from any such difference, it is, on the contrary, able, if need be, to call forth this very difference. Thus we get, as a result of our discretion, the assured conviction of two things. First, that the productive superiority of present goods assures them not only a surplus in product, but a surplus in value. And second, that, in this superiority, we have to deal with a third cause of the surplus value, and one which is independent of any of the two already mentioned. We have now to ask, to what extent is this third cause active? Of this, our former analysis gives a poor and inadequate picture. What has been said is only sufficient to explain how present means of production are worth more than future means of production. But from the same cause as we have now to show, present consumption goods also obtain a preference over future consumption goods, so that in this third cause, we have a quite universally valid reason for present goods having a greater value than future. The connection is as follows. Command over some of present consumption goods provides us with the means of subsistence during the current economic period. This leaves the means of production, which we may have at our disposal during this period, labor, uses of land, capital, free for the technically more productive service of the future, and gives us the more abundant product attainable by them in longer methods of production. On the other hand, command over a sum of future consumption goods leaves, of course, the present unprovided for, and consequently leaves us under the necessity of directing the means of production that are at our command in the present, wholly or partially, to the service of the present. But this involves curtailment of the production process, and, as consequence, a diminished product. The difference of the two products is the advantage connected with the possession of present consumption goods. To illustrate this by an example as simple as it is well-worn, Imagine with Rosher a tribe of fisher folk without capital, subsisting on fish left in pools on the shore by the ebb tide and caught with a bare hand. Here a laborer may catch and eat three fish a day. If he had a boat and a net, he could catch thirty fish a day instead of three, but he cannot have these tools, for their making would cost him a month's time and labor, and in the meantime he would have nothing to live upon. To save himself from starvation, he must continue his wretched and costly fishing by hand. But now, some one cleverer than the rest borrows ninety fish, promising against the loan to give back a hundred and eighty fish after one month. With the borrowed fish, he supports himself during the month, makes a boat and net, and during the next month, catches nine hundred fish instead of ninety. From this take, not only can he make the stipulated payment of a hundred and eighty fish, but he retains a considerable net gain to himself, and thereby affords a striking proof that the ninety present fish he borrowed were worth to him not only much more than ninety, but even more than a hundred and eighty future fish he paid for them. Now, of course, the differences in value are not always so great as in this example. They are greatest among people who live from hand to mouth. For them to get command over present consumption goods means the transition to capitalist production. Less striking, but always more present, is the difference where the people already possess a certain stock of goods. If, for example, their stock of goods is sufficient for three years, they may realize their means of production in an average three years production process. If now by some means or other, they obtain another year's supply of present means of subsistence, they may extend their average production period from three to four years and obtain, therefore, an increment of product, which absolutely is always important, but relatively will be much less than in the first case. We can see here again the matter of fact on which I base my conclusions is an old and well-known one. Even in the time of Adam Smith and Turgot, it was notorious that the possession of present consumption goods confers certain advantages. But as the older theory of capital was, generally speaking, a nest of warped conceptions and incorrect explanations. This fact was also put down in a form as singular as it was inappropriate. Consumption goods, goods for immediate consumption, 
or looked on as productive goods or means of production. As such, they were counted capital, and then all the advantages inherent in them were explained by the productivity of capital. Indeed, a writer of the standing of Jevons, simply through dwelling on the great importance which attaches to the command over present goods, was misled into ascribing to consumption goods the high position of being the only capital. In face of such misinterpretations, our business now is to get at the truth of facts, and the facts are very simple. Consumption goods are not means of production. They are, therefore, not capital, and the advantages which they confer do not proceed from any productive power they possess. Everything turns on the simple fact that, according to the quite familiar laws of value, present goods, in virtue of the above stated casuistical connection of circumstances, are normally the means of obtaining a higher marginal utility and receive thereby a higher value than future goods. Chapter 5. Cooperation of the Three Factors to put together the results at which we have arrived thus far, we have seen that there are three factors, each of which, independently of the other, is adequate to account for a difference in value between present and future goods in favor of the former. These three factors are the difference in the circumstances of provision between present and future, the underestimate due to perspective of future advantages and future goods, and finally, the greater fruitfulness of lengthy methods of production. The question now is, how do these factors, working simultaneously, affect each other? About the two first factors we know already. Their effects are cumulative. In the case of a man badly provided for in the present, if the marginal utility of a present good were 100, and its true marginal utility in a future period only 80, the present good would be valued relatively to the future, in the ratio of 100 to 80, if no other influence intervened. But if there is, besides, a prospective diminution of the true future marginal utility, say by one-eighth, the marginal utility would be put at 70 instead of 80, and the superiority of the present good to the future would be in the ratio of 100 to 70. It is essentially different with the cooperation of the third factor. True, it also tends to strengthen the action of the other factors, but it does so alternatively, not cumulatively. That is to say, that factor which confers the greater advantage on present goods always stands out from the other as the active agent. Say, for example, that the first factor, the circumstances of provision, together with the second factor, that of perspective, take cumulatively, would give present goods an advantage of 30%, while the factor of productivity would give an advantage of 25%. We should not get a total advantage of 55%, but of 30% the advantage being based on the stronger factors. The matter stands thus, the superiority of present goods as making roundabout and more fruitful ways of production possible, cannot be increased by the prospective undervaluation of future goods, because the utility got from lengthy processes is itself a future utility, to which the prospective undervaluation applies as much as it applies to the future goods with which the present goods are compared. Say that, by employing a month's labor now, in 1888, a one year's process I can make for 1889, a product of 200 units, and by employing a month's labor of 1889, I can make for that same year, on account of the short and unproductive method, a product of 100 units only. It will be a reason for my valuing the present month of labor at double the next year's month. If now there comes in a 10% undervaluation of next year's utility, I shall, of course, value the next year's 100 units at 90 present units only. But, for exactly the same reason, I shall value 200 units at 100 present units only. And the ratio of valuation, 2 to 1, remains exactly as if the prospective undervaluation had never come into play at all. As little can the third factor be strengthened by the first factor, namely the consideration of a greater present want, for, evidently, employing a good to a great future productive utility and employing it to satisfy an immediate pressing want are mutually exclusive employments, and it is clear that a good which can only be employed in the one way or the other cannot obtain a cumulative advantage from the two together. But these two factors do work into each other's hands in the following way. Present goods may be used to meet present wants, or they may be invested in production 
for the future. These are two possible employments to which each individual may put his present goods. According to principles with which we are familiar, the stock of goods will be guided into these employments in such a way that the most important chances of using the goods are utilized first, the next important second, and so on down the scale. Here, however, it is to be noted that the employments in producing for future as standing over against the employments in the satisfaction of immediate ones must submit to the prospective diminution with which we are familiar. Say, for instance, that a man's particular circumstances are such that he estimates a utility falling due in the following year at 10% less than an equally great present utility, then a future utility of 110 becomes equal to a present utility of 100. And on that account, when there comes to be a choice between employments, the future utility of 110 may be postponed to a present utility of 102. The last employment, then, which on these principles is still supplied from the stock of goods, indicates, as we know, the marginal utility, and at the same time the value of the unit of goods. Now the following cases may occur. First, the individual may be badly off in the present. In that case, the pressing wants of the moment will, by themselves, absorb the small stock of present goods, and on the ground of this bad provision in the present, these goods will obtain a high value and preference over future goods. The needy man prefers present goods because he must consume them in the present. The opportunities of employing the goods for productive purposes in the future remain in this case, since the poverty-stricken present naturally cannot afford any goods for purposes beyond itself, out of court as economically impossible, and, of course, without any influence on the value or preferable value of present goods. Or, second, the individual may be equally well provided as regards both present and future, but may have less forethought. This case leads to a similar result. Before, it was urgent want that prevented portions of the stock of goods from being withdrawn from the service and enjoyment of the present and invested in future production. Now it is want of thought for the future, and this want of thought confers, at the same time, on the present enjoyment and on the present goods which minister to it, a preference over future. The spendthrift, greedy pleasure values present goods more highly than future, because he wishes to enjoy them in the present. If bad provision goes along with small foresight, the two effects, as we have seen, are cumulative. Or third, the individual is well provided and takes due thought for the future. In this case, of course, the two former sanctions of the preference do not come into play at all, or scarcely at all. In this case, beyond the satisfying of the immediate wants, the other course is economically open, of investing a portion of his present goods in production for the future, thereby their economic center of gravity, their marginal utility, and the formation of their value are shifted to a sphere in which present goods enjoy a preference in value under the third sanction, that of their greater productiveness. A moderately rich and prudent man who has 10,000 pounds must not and will not consume his 10,000 pounds in the present, but will in any case save for the service of the future. But if any one were to make him the proposal to exchange his 10,000 pounds of present money for 10,000 pounds of future money, he would be fully justified in declining the transaction. As with the 10,000 pounds now, he can provide more effectually and richly for the future than with 10,000 pounds at a future period. But finally, there is still a fourth case conceivable. An individual may be so badly off in the present or have so little thought for the future that on those two accounts, he values present goods more highly than future. At the same time, however, he is tempted by business, which promises him so good a return in the future that he stints himself still further in his present provision and engages in the business. Here, after the analogy of the case worked out, the available sums of goods are directed successively into the most important employments of the two spheres taken together, and the competition of these future employments has for result that the satisfaction of present wants is broken off at a higher point or level than it would otherwise be. This must, in the end, raise the value of present goods and indirectly increase their superiority over future. 
Thus the various sanctions come alternatively into play. Where the first two are active, the third is suspended. But where the first two are not active, or not sufficiently active, there comes an action of the third. One can easily understand how very directly this circumstance is calculated to give the phenomenon of the higher valuations of present goods an almost universal validity. The needy and the careless value present goods more highly because they urgently require them in the present or only think about the present. The well-off and the saving value them because they can accomplish more with them in the future, and thus in the long run everyone, whatever his economical position and whatever his economical temperament, has some ground for value in present goods more highly than future. In future it is easy to understand how much the universal emergence of subjective differences in valuation must favor the extension of this phenomenon to the sphere of objective exchange value and price. If the third factor were to act cumulatively with the two first, there would, indeed, be many who would value present goods at an extravagant rate, but it is not certain that there would not be as many, perhaps an overwhelming majority, who would have no preference for present goods, and it is doubtful how, in this case, the resultant exchange value would turn out. But as the third factor is alternative in its actions, it levels up, as it were, in the depressions instead of exaggerating individual heights. Thus it brings about a general raising of subjective valuations, and this is necessarily connected with the raising of the average line, the resultant exchange value. Here we come to our last duty in this book, to show how the ratio that obtains between present and future goods is subjective valuations is transferred to their objective exchange value. In the case of the single individual, extremely various subjective valuations will be formed according as the one or the other of the above-mentioned factors is stronger or weaker. These encounter each other on the market where present goods are exchanged against future. There are many such markets, and they take many different forms. In the next book, we shall more exactly examine their constitution. In the meantime, we must be content to examine the method in which prices are formed in the most general and typical outlines. Indeed, the formation of price here takes the same course as it does elsewhere. The divergence of the subjective valuations which encounter each other on the market makes possible, economically, the exchange of property between the two parties. Those who, on any subjective grounds, put a relatively high value on present goods appear as buyers of present against future commodities. Those who put a relatively low value as sellers, and the market price will be settled between the subjective valuations of the last competitors who actually exchange and the first competitors who are shut out, or, as we have put it, between the valuations of the two marginal pairs, we may represent the position of the market by the following scheme. In the circumstances of the market which this scheme represents, A7 and B7 form the upper marginal pair, B8 and A8 the lower. The market price for 100 present units of goods will be fixed between 106 and 107, say at 106 and a half, next year's units, and this determines an agio of 6.5% in favor of present goods. Once a market price of this kind for present goods has been established, it exerts a reflex leveling influence on the subjective valuations, which were originally so strongly divergent. Even those who, from personal circumstances, would value future goods only a little under or perhaps at equal terms with present goods now value present goods according to the higher exchange value which the position of the market lends to them. This is the reason, and the only reason, why in practical life scarcely anyone would be willing to exchange present goods against an exactly equal sum of future ones. There are plenty of people whose circumstances of want and provision for want are such a kind that the subjective use value of present and future goods to them stands almost equal. But the general position of the market is almost invariably so strongly in favor of present goods that it assures them a preference in exchange value, of which naturally everyone takes advantage. Developed market exchange, however, brings with it a leveling effect from another side. That is to say, it brings an amount of agio in favor of present goods as against future goods which fall due at variously remote points of time into one normal ratio with the length of the elapsing time. It might easily be the case that the causes which tend to the undervaluation of future goods might chance to be quite disproportionately effective on goods 
belonging to different periods of time. Indeed, in the very nature of several of those causes, for instance the consideration of the shortness of human life, they would scarcely obtain at all as against goods of the near future, while as against goods of remote periods they would obtain strongly and irregularly. In itself, therefore, it might be quite possible that while 100 present units of goods, as against 100 units of next year's goods obtained in the market, an agio of 5 units only, as against goods of the next year, they might obtain an agio of more than twice that, say 20, and as against third year's goods, perhaps an agio of 40. But such disproportionate prices for goods of different periods of remoteness could not hold long. By kind of time arbitrage, they would very soon be brought into an equal ratio. If, for instance, the various market prices mentioned above were found quoted at one given moment, speculators would immediately appear on the scene, who would sell present goods against two years' goods, cover the purchase by buying present against next year's goods, and arrange for paying the latter a year later by a second purchase of present against next year's goods. The business would work out thus. In 1888, the speculator buys 1,000 present units for 1,050 units of the year 1889, and sells them at the same time for 1,200 of the year 1890. In 1889, he has to deliver 1,050 units, and he gets them by buying, again with an adju of 5%, the then present 1889 goods for the then next year's 1890 goods. For the 1,050 units, he requires to deliver, he must thus give 1,102 and a half units of 1890. But from the first transaction, he then receives 1,200 of these very 1890 units. He has thus, on the whole business, a utility of about 100 units. Such arbitrage transactions must evidently bring the prices obtainable for goods of various future years to a level. The speculative demand for the much undervalued two years' goods must raise their price. The supply of next year's goods must depress their price till such time as the agio is brought directly into proportion with the length of time. When this happens, say for example that the agio has become equalized at 5% per year, it may hold on at that rate undisturbed, for then it is equally remunerative to exchange present goods against next year's goods for three years successively or to exchange present goods directly against three years' goods, and the arbitrage we have just sketched has no further occasion to interfere in the formation of price. Thus we may accept the following as positive result of the present book. The relation between want and provision for want in present and future, the undervaluation of future pleasures and pains, and the technical advantage residing in present goods, have the effect that, to the overwhelming majority of men, the subjective use value of present goods is higher than that of similar future goods. From this relation of subjective valuations, there follows, in the market generally, a higher objective exchange value and market price for present goods, and this, reflecting back on present goods, gives them a higher subjective exchange value, even among those whose personal circumstances happen to be such that the goods would not naturally have any preference in subjective use value. Finally, the leveling tendencies of the market bring the reduced value of future goods into a regular proportion to their remoteness in time. In the economic community, then, we find universally that future goods have a less value, both subjective and objective, corresponding to the degree of the remoteness in time. Book 6. The Source of Interest Chapter 1. The Loan and Loan Interest In the previous book, I tried to show and account for the natural difference that exists between the value of present and the value of future goods. I have now to show that this difference of value is the source and origin of all interest on capital. But as the exchange of present commodities for future commodities takes various forms, the phenomenal forms of interest are as various, and our inquiry must necessarily deal with them all. In the following chapters, therefore, I intend to take up, in succession, all the principal forms of interest, and I shall endeavour to show that notwithstanding all differences in shape and appearance, the active cause in them all is one and the same, namely the difference in value between present and future goods. 
by far the simplest case of this difference in value is presented in the loan. A loan is nothing else than a real and true exchange of present goods for future goods. Indeed, it is the simplest conceivable phenomenal form, and to some extent, the ideal and type of such an exchange. The lender A gives to the borrower B a sum of present goods, say present pounds sterling. B gets full and free possession of the goods to deal with, as he likes, and as equivalent, B gives into A's full and free possession a sum of entirely similar but future goods, say next year's pound sterling. Here, then, is a mutual transfer of property in two sums of goods, of which one is given as recompense or payment for the other. Between them there is perfect homogeneity, but for the fact that the one belongs to the present, the other to the future. I cannot imagine how an exchange in general, and an exchange between present and future goods in particular, could be expressed more simply and clearly. Now, in the last chapter, we proved that the resultant of the subjective valuations which determines the market price of present and future goods is, as a rule, in favor of present goods. The borrower, therefore, will, as a rule, purchase the money which he receives now by a larger sum of money which he gives later. He must thus pay an agio, or premium, and this agio is interest. Interest then comes in the most direct way from the difference in value between present and future goods. This is the extremely simple explanation of a transaction which for hundreds of years was made the subject of interpretations very involved, very far-fetched and very untrue. Since the days of Molinus and Selmasius, the loan has been conceived of as a transaction analogous to the hire, as a transfer to the temporary use of fungible goods. This method of interpretation seems simple and natural enough. It has, too, the advantage and support of being in harmony with popular ideas and popular speech. We do not say, I sell you or exchange you 100 pounds, but I lend you 100 pounds. The transaction is a loan, and interest is a usura, a use of money. But before a scientific basis could be given to this popular conception, a whole series of subtleties had to be invented, and to obtain these out of the circumstances of actual life, taxed all the resources of sophistry. First, it had to be shown that in transferring a thing, it is possible to transfer more than the whole of it, namely, that in giving the borrower possession of the loaned thing, it is possible to transfer to him the right to all and every use that can be made of the thing, even to the consumption that annihilates it, and besides that, the right to a separate kind of remnant use for which a separate claim, the claim of interest, can be made. Then the further subtlety had to be invented, that in perishable goods, goods which perish in the act of use, there is, all the same, a continuous use ever rising anew from its own ashes, a use which lasts even when the good used has long ceased to exist. It had to be discovered that a hundred weight of coal can be burned to cinders on 1st of January 1888, and yet be used uninterruptedly throughout the whole year, and perhaps for five or ten or a hundred years to come. And what is best of all, that this lasting use can always be bought for a particular price, although and after the coal itself, and the right to consume it to the last atom has been given away for another and a different price. In my former book, Capital and Interest, I subjected this singular theory to a searching critical examination. I showed how under peculiar historical conditions, it came into the world as the birth of circumstances, in which to save interest and justify it against the unquestionably unjust attacks of the canonists, a decent foundation had to be found for it at any price, or, if not found, invented. I showed that this theory had its troubled source in a fiction. It was a fiction adopted in its time by the old jurists, in full consciousness that it was simply a fiction set up for certain practical legal purposes, but afterwards, by a strange misunderstanding, this fiction was adopted as a sufficient scientific fact. I tried further to show that this theory is, in itself, full of mistakes, internal contradictions and impossibilities, and how, finally, when carried to its logical conclusion, it leads inevitably to further contradictions and impossibilities. In opposition to it, and place of it, I now offer my own positive theory, 
then unpublished, and confidently leave it to the reader to judge on which side lies illusion and error, and on which truth. I would gladly refrain from any further commentary here, were it not that, quite recently, we have had a new literary pronouncement in favour of the use theory which I opposed, and directed against the exchange theory which I advocated. And were it not that this revived pronouncement emanates from no less authority than Karl Knies. In 1885, Knies published a second edition of his book, Das Geld. In it, he replies to the criticism I made on some passages of his first edition, and at the same time expressly repeats certain positive objections he had made to the conception of the loan as an exchange. On both counts, I feel bound to answer. It is unfortunate that Kinesis' reply touches only one of the many points on which I attacked his use theory. I had, among other objections, put forward this, that his method of proving the actual existence of a durable use in perishable goods rested on a dialectical confusion, and I had endeavored to strengthen my contention by an exact analysis of the very words of his argument. To this Kinesis answers that I have notwithstanding mistaken his meaning, and he repeats his positive statement in such altered expression, and with such additions as may put his real meaning beyond question. As now put, Kinesis' demonstration is very much amplified. But substantially, I cannot consider it any more satisfactory. On the contrary, it seems to me to bring out more clearly that the existence of this durable use which I disputed is not proved but only assumed. In one of the weightiest of the new passages, Kinesis has no hesitation in explaining, in so many words, that in the loan, although not the same individual grains of corn and pieces of money are returned, but only an equally large and equally valuable amount of grains of corn and pieces of money still to economical consideration, the same goods are given back. Here he sanctions the fiction of identity between fungible goods in optima forma, within the sphere of economical theory and economical discussion. All that follows he bases on the foundation thus obtained. He finds the essence of hire and lease in the fact that here, the hirer, leaseholder, etc., gets the land, house, or the like transferred to him to use for his own purposes for such and such a continuous period, at the expiry of which he has to give back the good in question. In the loan, perishable goods are likewise transferred to be employed by the borrower for such and such a continuous but limited period of time. Consequently, hire and loan are essentially analogous transactions, which was the point to be proved. To this, I would simply answer, the second premise is not truth, but poetry. The sober, prosaic truth is that, in the loan, perishable goods are not transferred to the borrower for a continuous but limited period of time. They are transferred definitely and forever. They are never given back. What is given back, in fact, other goods. What now becomes of the inferred analogy? I am not blind to the use of analogies, and even to the demonstrative force which analogies may have under certain circumstances. I have myself often used them in the course of this book to drive home an argument. But an analogy is a weapon which requires careful handling. Comparisons, as everyone knows, are always imperfect. If the compared things have one side in common, they have always another in which they differ. The legal person, for instance, may very well be compared with the physical person in questions relating to property, while in questions relating to the family, it would scarcely be safe. If then we draw some conclusion from the similarity of two things, our conclusion must keep within the sphere in which the similarity actually exists. From similar circumstances in one sphere, we could not draw a conclusion that the circumstances are similar in another sphere, to which the similarity does not extend. No one, for instance, would consider an argument like this legitimate. The legal person is as much a person as the physical person. A physical person can marry, therefore a legal person can also marry. Yet it seems to me that it is into this vicious and false use of analogies that Knies and other theorists of his school have fallen. I grant at once, in a certain point of view, the individual goods replaced may be looked upon as if they actually were the same individual goods which were given away in the loan. 
they have identically the same effect on the economical position of the lender who receives them. Now, so far as the ground of this identification extends, so far also is one justified in drawing conclusions from it, but no further. The analogical conclusions of the use theorists, however, are entirely beyond this justifiable sphere. What has the theoretical question, whether in perishable goods, a continuous use is possible or not, to do with the fact that it is all the same as regards the interests of the lender, whether he gets the individual goods X or the individual goods Y. Nothing at all any more than the question of the marriageableness of a legal person has anything in common with the fact that, in matters relating to rights of property, an institution or a corporation may without hesitation be conceived of as an independent person. Indeed, if the reader will excuse a ridiculous but, as I think, a convincing example, one might as well use the identity of fungible goods to prove that oysters may keep fresh for ten years. They have only to be lent out for ten years, and the lender receives them back still fresh oysters. The application is so evident that I need scarcely put it in words. The identity of the oysters lent with the oysters returned is no true identity but only an identity assumed ad hoc. So far as concerns the practical interests of the lender, the identity may pass, but as a scientific question of fact, like the physical question whether oysters can remain fresh for 10 years, there is no identity at all. And just such a scientific question of fact is the question whether, in perishable goods, there is a continuous one, years or 10 years use. It is a question that must find its answer in considering the nature of the perishable good and the nature of the use. Properly speaking, not the shadow of an argument can be got from the fact that it is of no moment as regards the practical interests of a person, whether he receives the particular good X or the particular good Y. Now, Canis does make the attempt, and this is a second and indeed the weightiest of the new passages in this edition really to point out a durable use in perishable goods, and to give some indication wherein that use consists. He names by way of illustration the maintenance of life and of labor power, the averting of a loss, the attainment of a business return or profit, as useful effects of this sort, which the borrower may obtain and make for himself from the consumption of the loaned goods during the entire period of time, before the similar quantum of perishable goods is given back. But by illustrations like this, Canis again shows that he is on the wrong track. The enjoyment of effects indirectly obtained from the consumption of goods is not in the least a utility which we get in addition to the consumption, it is just the utility we get from the consumption. Accordingly, it can never be the ground of a special equivalent, which we should have to pay over in addition to the equivalent of the perishable good itself. What would be said of a person who proposed to sell a hundred weight of corn on the following terms? For the quarter of corn itself, that is, for all the useful services which may be got from the corn, by its sudden or gradual consumption, I want thirty shillings, but for the last indirect use of the corn, the use which consists in subsequent enjoyment of useful effects, such as life prolonged, labor power maintained, and so on, I want another shilling. Now if, as probably no one will deny, in selling grain, it is not possible to conceive the subsequent enjoyment as the ground of special equivalent, if the subsequent enjoyment is obviously included in the purchase price of the good transferred into the buyer's possession, it is inconceivable that, all at once, in the case of the loan, where too the quarter of corn passes into the full possession of the borrower and justifies him in drawing all the uses he can, from it, every indirect use is to be separately paid for. And why, again, should this indirect use be paid for only during one, five, ten years, or for so long as the loan runs? Is the utility of sustained life not enjoyed so long as life lasts? Is the utility of preserved labor power not only which lasts so long as we can work? In capital and interest, I had so thoroughly and in my opinion, at least, so clearly laid down the facts about the lasting indirect use and shown the impossibility of its being the ground of loan interest that I really did not expect to see the thing emerge once more and stay in support 
the use theory. Least of all did I expect it from a writer who knew that I have said on the subject, and that without a single word of explanation being vouchsafed in answer to the objections I had raised meantime. I cannot but express my regret, not indeed for personal reasons, but in the interest of our science, that Canis has taken so little notice of, and given such meagre answers to the theoretical considerations which I brought against the use theory. He replies on one single point, and that a point which, however important it may be in itself, has only the importance of an incident in the struggle that is to decide the victory or defeat of the use theory, while to the multitude of really cognate considerations directed against the theory as a whole, considerations which, quite apart from the issue of this incidental question, show it to be internally contradictory and theoretically inadmissible. He has, unfortunately, found no word of rejoinder. Once submitted for discussion, these considerations must be met, and certainly no one was more called on to speak in the defense of his own use theory than was Canis. Hitherto the discussion has been limited to attack and defense of the loan theory of other economists. I have now to reply to an attack made on my own theory. The distinguished writer we have just been discussing has now repeated the objection he urged some years ago against my conception of the loan as a true exchange. It is, he says, in contradiction to the hitherto established conception of what an exchange is. For an exchange, as we are not taking into account senseless and frivolous actions, takes place only when goods different in some way or other are bartered. But fungible goods, such as grain of similar kind and quality, are economically recognized as entirely similar goods. I must say that this statement seems to me to beg the whole question. Instead of inquiring what the connotation of the conception of exchange is, and arguing from that whether the loan can be called a true exchange or not, Kniss starts with a preconceived conception of exchange, and that an arbitrarily and unnaturally limited conception. As a fact, Kniss's limitation of the conception of exchange is to the barter of goods of different kinds, is one we do not find in the nature of exchange nor does it correspond with the hitherto established use of the conception. In the nature of exchange, what is involved is that two goods are given, the one for the other, nothing more as to establish usage. It is very easy to show that the transactions in which entirely similar fungible goods are bartered for one another are considered by all the world true exchanges, and are called so. In proof of this, I might point out that two people, simply from whim or fancy, will exchange two fungible goods, the one for the other. For example, two new copies of the same book. Canis guards himself, indeed, against this argument by saying that we are not taking into account frivolous and senseless actions, but this is making too light of the matter. For certainly, it cannot be denied that such capricious actions may happen and occasionally do happen, and it cannot very well be denied that such transactions, when they do happen, are neither higher nor loan, nor anything else than true exchange. But there is no need to appeal to rare cases like these. There is one group, for instance, where men quite deliberately and on entirely rational economic grounds do barter similar fungible goods. That is where goods otherwise perfectly similar are available under different modalities, to use a philosophic term, as, for instance, in different places. Take the case of Farmer A who owns a plantation of trees two hours' journey away from his farm, while there is a plantation belonging to his neighbor B immediately beside him. In both plantations, the wood cut or ready for cutting is of exactly the same quality. Now evidently, it is a more convenient and more profitable for A to have ten loads of wood near his house than ten loads of wood ten miles away. It will, therefore, be considered quite reasonable and quite intelligible to propose that B should make over to A ten loads from the near plantation, in return for which A will give B ten loads, or perhaps twelve loads, including a premium of the similar wood from his faraway plantation. And if this is agreed to, everybody would pronounce it a real and true exchange. Or we can imagine anybody, from the fiction of identity between fungible goods, drawing an analogical conclusion like the following about the nature of the transaction. 
A makes over to B 10 loads of wood at a spot 10 miles away from his house and receives from B 10 loads of wood here at his house. It is all the same to A whether he receives back the same 10 loads or 10 other loads. From an economic point of view, therefore, it is essentially the same 10 loads which he receives back, only at a different place. The essential nature of the transaction is, accordingly, not an exchange, since no exchange takes place between similar goods, but a transfer of the same goods to a different point in space. That is to say, a freight transaction, and if, for the advantage which lies in this transfer from one place to another, A pays B a premium of two loads, the payment is essentially, from an economic point of view, an expense of carriage. I very much doubt whether anybody would follow him in the conclusion from analogy, although it is, feature for feature, the same as the one above. We should rather have expected that Canice would have been ready to own that the exchange of the two amounts of wood alike in every respect except that they are available in different places was a real and true exchange. And now I ask if it falls within the limits of the conception of exchange when goods present in one place are bartered for goods entirely similar but present in another place, with what right can we exclude from the conception the case where goods present at one time are bartered for goods entirely similar but present at another time? When so much has been made of analogies in the whole course of this controversy, why exclude the one analogy which is, most evidently, the appropriate one? If the difference of the place at which goods are available is a sound economic reason for exchanging fungible goods that are in other respects entirely similar, and if the advantage and convenience of the present place may justify the claim and allowance of a premium, just as much may the difference of the time at which similar goods are available be a sound reason for their exchange, and a guarantee that there will be a premium on the more valuable present goods. This premium, and nothing else, is interest. A great tree does not fall at one blow, and I cannot expect that a loan theory, which has dominated human intellects for centuries, should fall at the first attack. But I venture to hope that I have at least awakened a general feeling that it is necessary to submit the principles of that theory to critical revision. There is one task which the next economist who proposes to maintain the Herman Kniess loan theory will not. I imagine venture to omit, namely once and for all, to point out positively the existence of that enduring use of perishable goods, distinct from their consumption, for which interest is supposed to be paid, and to say clearly and distinctly wherein that use peculiarly consists. Up till now its defenders have acted in a somewhat curious way. They have pointed out by more or less questionable analogies that in the loan a temporary use is transferred and concluded from this that there must be such a use, the consequence being that, with the exception of this last unfortunate attempt of kinesis, the nature of the use, its contents, and so on, were left entirely in the background. I consider that our science has the right to demand the opposite and the natural method of demonstration. Let it first be shown that there is such a use, and wherein it consists, if that can be done, we shall willingly believe that it is transferred in the loan. If that cannot be done, and I doubt very much if it can, then I shall have the greater confidence in pointing to my solution of the question. To the latter, at any rate, I have no fear that the stigma of sophistry and unnaturalness can be attached. Passing from this polemical discretion, which I considered only due, as well to the importance of the subject under dispute, as to the scientific standing of my esteemed opponent, let us return to the main subject. According to our conception, interest is a complementary part of the price payable for a sum of present goods and future goods. It is a part equivalent of the principal lent. In itself, there would be nothing to prevent this part equivalent being paid along with the bulk of the price. In other words, interest and principal might be put together in one single payment at the end of the whole loan transaction. Reasons of practical convenience have, however, made it the general rule that in loans made for any considerable length of time, the premium should be paid separately, and in rates graduated according to time, monthly, half-yearly, yearly, etc. With the essential nature of interest, this method of payment 
has nothing to do, it may indeed be expressly provided otherwise by the loan contract. But quite possibly, it is the case that this custom, which practically has prevailed from time immemorial of separating the payment of interest from the payment of principal, has assisted, perhaps, even directly caused the popular opinion that the principal sum paid back is, by itself, the equivalent of the sum originally given, and that interest is a thing by itself, an equivalent for another and separate something. Now and then a loan may be granted without interest, but the reason of this is seldom or never that the market price of present goods as against future goods is so favourable to the latter that, in the general loan market, they can purchase an equal amount of present goods without premium. Almost invariably, these are cases where the lender dispenses with the payment of premium on some special personal grounds, such as friendship, charity, humanity, class obligation, and so on. It has been usual to conceive of the loan without interest as a gift of the temporary use of the thing lent. Our theory, of course, demands another conception. We put this kind of loan simply among cases where a man, from some personal motive, parts with his commodity under the market price. We say it is the same thing as where a manufacturer gives personal friends at the cost price, say of four shilling the article, which he can sell anywhere at the general market price of five shilling. Lastly, it very seldom occurs, and then never as regards present and future goods in general, but only as regards one particular kind of good, that the relations of supply and demand are such that future goods obtain a higher price than present goods of the same kind, and that a premium in present goods must be paid for for future goods. It will only happen in cases where presumably the relations of supply and demand in the future will be essentially more unfavorable than in the present, and where at the same time, for personal or technical reasons, it is not possible to preserve the present ample stocks till that future point of time when they are assured of the higher value. Suppose the case of a brewer whose ice cellars are too small for his requirements. If in January he puts in as much ice as the cellar will hold and has still 200 carts of ice over, he may be very willing to exchange these for 100 carts of ice deliverable in August. But the possibility of such a case seems to me to afford a not insignificant proof of my loan theory, for I should like to ask how would the use theorists explain this, as a transfer of use like the loan, only that the use has a negative value, and that the borrower, instead of paying a premium, demands a premium? Or perhaps as a storage transaction, the difference between the quantity given and that being considered a fee for a safe deposit? I think both interpretations are so clearly artificial and fictitious that very few people would seriously entertain them. Probably the use theorist would be quite willing to admit that this as a case of real exchange, but so far as they did so, they would be untrue to their own contention, according to which exchange is only possible between goods of different kinds and not between fungible goods of the same kind. Our theory, on the other hand, explains everything naturally and by one formula. Without forcing an interpretation, it can recognize that here the position is exactly the same as in the loan. There is a mutual transfer of property in two sums of goods, which are entirely similar in every other respect but that of being disposable at different points of time, and to this entirely similar state of matters, it gives an entirely similar explanation, that in both categories there is an exchange between present and future goods, the prices of which are the resultant of the subjective valuations put upon two classes of goods within the market. Chapter 2 the Profit of Capitalist Undertaking, Principles of Explanation We come now to the principal form assumed by the interest problem. Among the phenomena of interest, it is one which has practically been of most importance. Usually, indeed, it passes for the spring and source from which all the others are derived, and it has chiefly been the attempt to explain this form of interest that has led to the terribly involved war of opinions which gave only too ample material for my capital and interest. A word or two will indicate generally the peculiar kind of activity which the undertakers exert, and from which they draw their profit. They buy goods of remoter rank, such as 
raw materials, tools, machines, the use of land, and above all, labor, and by the various processes of production, transform them into goods of first rank, finished products ready for consumption. In doing so, they obtain independently of compensation for their own personal cooperation in the work of production as leaders of industry, head workers, etc., a gain approximately proportioned to the amount of capital invested in their business. This gain is called by some natural interest on capital, or profit, and by others, surplus value. How is this gain to be explained? I must introduce the explanation by establishing one important fact. Goods of remoter rank, although materially present commodities, are economically future commodities. As present commodities, they are incapable of satisfying human want. They require first to be changed into consumption goods, and since this process, naturally, takes time, they can only render their services to the wants of a future period. At the earliest, that period distant by the time which the productive process necessarily takes to change them into consumption goods. A group of productive instruments such as seed, manure, agricultural implements, labor, etc., which cannot be transformed into the finished product, grain under a year's process can only serve for the satisfaction of next year's subsistence wants. In this respect, then, goods of remoter rank available in the present, present productive goods are similar to future consumption goods. Their utility is a future utility. They are future commodities. It is evident that this fact cannot be without some far-reaching influence on the value which such goods obtain. As we know, we value goods of remoter rank. In general, according to the marginal utility and value of their finished and final products, the group of productive instruments from which we get 100 bushels of corn has exactly the same importance for the satisfaction of our want as the 100 bushels of corn into which it is transformed. But these 100 bushels, the value of which is the standard for the value of the productive group, are still for the time 100 future bushels. And as we saw in previous chapters, future goods are worth less than present goods. A hundred future bushels are, therefore, worth, we may say, only as much as 95 present ones. From this, it follows that means of production also, if estimated against present goods, are found of less value than the amount of finished and final products, which can be made out of them. Our group of productive instruments, which in a year's time will furnish us 100 quarters of grain, is equal in value to 100 quarters of next year's grain. But like that grain, it's equal to, say, only 95 quarters of this year's grain. Or, if we translate the whole matter into terms of money, economy, and assume that next year, the quarter of corn will be worth 20 shillings, then our group of productive materials, wherewith we hold in our hands the condition of our obtaining a money return of 100 pounds next year, is equal in value to 100 pounds next year, but no more than 95 pounds now. If then we buy or exchange these means of production now, the purchase price naturally is measured in present money, and we buy them for a smaller number of pounds sterling than they will bring their owner in the future. This and nothing else is the foundation of the so-called cheap buying of productive instruments, and especially of labor, which the socialists rightly explain as the source of profit on capital, but wrongly interpret in round terms as the result of a robbery or exploitation of the working classes by the property classes. The buying is not so cheap as it seems. The appearance of cheapness comes, for the most part, from this, that the price is measured by a different standard from the commodity, measured, as it were, by one of these cheap measuring tapes which stretch with wear and indicate a foot by 11 inches. The means of production and their result the finished product towards which the buyer is looking in purchasing them are future commodities, and the price is measured and paid in more valuable present goods, that in this case the number greater of less valuable future goods is purchased by a smaller number of more valuable present goods, is not cheap buying any more than it would be cheap to acquire 100 florins of 50 florin standards for 90 pieces of 45 florin standard. The circumstances of possession are only to a very limited extent responsible for the fact that the future commodity 
which the laborers have to sell their labor is less valuable than the present goods which the capitalists have to offer, which are wages. For the most part, it is elementary facts of human nature and the technique of production that are to blame, fact which we have gone into in detail in the foregoing book. The social importance of the phenomenon of interest, however, will take up our attention later on. In the meantime, I have only to explain what interest is and why it is. Knowing that the undertaker buys the future commodity, means of production, for a smaller number of pieces of present goods than the number of pieces which will compose their future product, we ask, how does he come by his profit? The answer is very simple. From his cheap purchase, indeed, he does not get any result, for estimated by its present value, the commodity is dear. The profit comes first into existence in his hand. It is during the progress of production that the future commodity ripens gradually into the present commodity and grows at the same time to the full value of the present commodity. Time elapses, what was next year becomes this year, and on the great changing stage of life, everything, man himself, his wants and wishes, and with them the standard by which he measures his goods, shifts one scene forward. The wants which, last year, were future wants and little thought of as such, attain their full strength and their full right of present wants, and a similar advance attends the goods which supply these wants. A year ago, they were goods of the future and had to be content with the lower value that attached to them as such today. They are present goods, ripe for consumption, and enjoy the full value of such goods. A year ago, it was to their prejudice that they were measured in the then present goods. Today that standard has sunk into the past, and if the men of today measure them again in present goods, they stand equal with them in the first and chiefest rank, and suffer nothing by the comparison. In short, as time passes, it cancels the cause by reason of which the then future commodity suffered a shrinkage of value, and brings it up to the full value of the present good. The increment of value is the profit of capital. This is not to say, of course, that to make present goods out of future goods, it is sufficient that time should elapse and the future become the present. The goods themselves must not remain stationary. On their part, they must bridge over the gap which divides them from the present, and this they do through the production which changes them from goods of remote rank into finished and final products. If there is no production process, if the capital is left dead, the means of production always remain undervalued future goods. In the year 1888, a group of means of production which can be changed into a finished product in a year's process, that is to say by 1889, is one year away from satisfying the wants of the present. If this group is left unused till 1889, its product, of course, cannot now be obtained till 1890, at the earliest, and it remains as before one year away from satisfying the wants of the present. Its value has no opportunity to expand, and suffers the common fate of dead capital. It bears no surplus value and no interest. This is the truth about undertaker's profit, and I trust it will be found simple enough. The socialists are fond of calling this profit surplus value. The name is more applicable than they have any idea of. It is literally a profit from the increment of value of the future commodity transmuted in the hand of the undertakers into a finished present good. Chapter 3. The Profit of Capitalist Undertaking Complications The principle laid down in the last chapter is simple, but in practical life it is, as usual, obscured by a multitude of casuistical details and developments. These do not, indeed, prevent its operation, but they conceal it under various phenomenal forms, such as make recognition of it not always easy. Some of these developments we must take up, and we shall begin with one of the simplest. The contraction of value from which, in our estimation, future goods suffer is, as we know, by no means uniform to all future goods. It is graduated according to the time which intervenes between the present and the date at which the goods are ready for use. One hundred pounds, for instance, which will be available in a year's time, will be valued at perhaps something like ninety-five pounds in present money. 100 pounds available in a couple of years at 90 pounds, 100 pounds available in three years, hence at 85 pounds, and so on. 
to this graduated contraction of value corresponds a steady graduated increase in value of those goods which are in process of ripening into present goods a group of instruments which at the end of a three years production process promises a product of the value of 100 pounds and in virtue of that promise is valued at 85 pounds at the beginning of the process does not remain stationary at the value of 85 pounds till the moment when the production is completed and then makes one bound up to its full present value of 100 pounds its value increases gradually as the time passes which divides the group from maturity and the production process nears its completion this circumstance is of great practical importance under the division of labor scarcely any kind of production is carried through from beginning to end in the hands of one person the separate stages of production become branches of production visibly independent and conducted by separate undertakers as the value thus increases by stages the corresponding gain accrues as profit on capital not only to the last undertaker the one in whose hand the good becomes an actual present commodity but to each of the undertakers even to the one who has brought the product only a single step nearer maturity a very common application arises from the fact that productive goods contribute various portions of their useful content to the making of various final products which products arrive at maturity at various points of time this is the case with all durable productive goods a plow for instance which lasts 20 years will contribute a 20th part of its life work and use to the ingathering of 20 different harvests corresponding with this twofold property that of means of production and at the same time durable goods such goods both in the formation and in the increase of their value manifest a peculiar combination of phenomena they unite the phenomena already known to us as characteristic of productive goods with certain other special phenomena with accompany all durable goods even those that are not devoted to productive purposes we have however to deal particularly with this latter class of phenomena in a later chapter and accordingly we must postpone the full explanation of this complication until then another complication arises from the fact that almost all productive instruments admit of various kinds of employment and that these employments turn out their finished products at different points of time the same fuel for instance may be employed in cooking a meal or in keeping up a smithy fire where the tools are made for boring a coal seam in the first case only a few hours elapse till the finished product is turned out in the latter it may be years perhaps decades of years this is true in particular of that most important productive good unskilled labor various portions of it are always being employed simultaneously for productive purposes that come to maturity in the most varying periods of time some laborers must always get finishing work which pays its wages almost on the moment others must be employed in the intermediate stages others again at the beginning of the total work of production yet none of them has it written on his forehead whether his work is spent for the present or for the coming year or for the remote future at first sight it might appear that this complication must sensibly prejudice what we have laid down as to the formation and the increase of value here is a good which will be used perhaps as a present good perhaps as a future good suppose that it is valued as a future good and therefore suffers a proportionate diminution of value it seems as if this diminution were unjustifiable if after all the good is used as a present good but again suppose it is valued without deduction as a present good and is after all employed as a future good there is no room for increase of value but obviously again it is least of all possible to estimate different proportions of the same commodity at different values but one portion as a present good without deduction another as a future good with deduction of ten loads of fuel of exactly the same kind and quality one load is worth just as much as the other as well to the householder as in the timber market the apparent difficulty however entirely disappears if we apply the universal law of value carefully to the special circumstances of the case the value of a good is determined by its marginal utility this marginal utility is the least important use or employment that is provided for 
out of the available stock of goods. Suppose the stock contains 500 pieces of a kind which we shall call A. These goods possess the threefold capability of serving one, immediate as consumption goods, two, as means of production in a five years process, or three, as means of production in another branch of employment in 10 years process. If they are used for immediate consumption, the capabilities are as follows. 100 pieces can be used with a useful result which we shall represent by the figure six, another hundred with a result which we shall call five, and a third hundred with a result which we shall call four. But if the goods are employed in the five years production process, there will be a product, call it X, of which the first hundred can be remunerative at nine, the second at eight, and the third at seven per piece. But these products will not be available before five years. In today's estimate, therefore, their value, like the value of all future goods, suffers a reduction. The amount of this reduction depends upon the amount of the agio, which emerges in favor of present goods as a resultant of the many intersecting subjective valuations in the market. If this agio, for instance, amount to 5%, the value of the products available in five years, as compared with present goods, suffers a reduction of a little over a fifth part. In the valuation of today, therefore, the prospect of obtaining of five years from one of the pieces employed as a means of production, a product which will then have a value of nine, is equal to a use realizable at the moment of 7.05. In the same way, the prospect of obtaining products of the value of eight and seven in five years is equal to present uses valued at 6.26 and 5.48, respectively. Similarly, if the goods are employed in a 10 years production process, if this gives the prospect of obtaining a product, call it Y, of which the first 100 can be remunerative at 16, the second 100 at 12, and the third at 8, these products, as not available before 10 years, suffer a reduction in today's estimate of something like two-fifths, and are equal, respectively, to 9.82, 7.35, and 4.91. If we group together the present valuation of all these possibilities, we get the following table. The stock of 500 pieces admits of only five of the above possibilities being utilized. Naturally, those five will be taken, which in the valuation of today, the only standard of today's decisions are the most remunerative. They are indicated in the above table by black figures, and we find them to be as follows. 100 pieces used in immediate consumption, 200 pieces employed in a five years process in making the goods X, 200 pieces employed in a 10 years process in making the goods Y. The least remunerative of the employments indicates the marginal utility and with it the value of a single good A. That least remunerative use bears the value six and as it happens, belongs to the present. A good of class A then will be valued at six. How does this stand now as regards the increment of value and the interest on capital? In the case of the 100 pieces which are employed in the service of the present and fetch utility measured by 6, there is no room for an increment of value. But as they afford their marginal utility immediately, they do not require to bear any interest. The pieces invested in the 5 years process are worth 6 and in 5 years turn on a product which will be worth 8. Here there is room for an increase at the usual rate of 5% for 5 years in the ratio of say 4 to 5, that is from 6 to 7.5. Indeed, the room for increase and the gain in value is much greater. Beyond normal interest, which is secured when the product obtains the value of 7.5, there is a further profit of 0.5 per piece as premium for finding and utilizing the most favorable opportunities of employment in the present conjuncture, in other words, as undertaker's profit. But usually this premium will not long continue. According to principles with which we are familiar, its existence attracts competition, and competition depresses price. How far will it depress it? Not lower than 7.5, for 7.5, obtainable in five years, is equal in present valuation to six of present money, which is just the value of the productive good itself. Anything less than this price of 7.5, consequently, would not be thought a sufficient equivalent 
for the sacrifice of a good valued at six, and in this unremunerative branch, production would be suspended until the limitation of supply again raised the price of the product to 7.5 of future money, as equal to six of present money. This being a state of things favorable to permanence, although the productive and therefore future good has received its value from six from a marginal utility, which belongs to the sphere of the present and so suffers no deduction on account of its future nature. There remains quite sufficient room for a rise to the higher value of the future product. It is the same with the value and increase of value of those pieces invested in the 10 years process. At the moment, valued at the common marginal utility, they are worth six. Their product, which becomes attainable in 10 years, will be worth 12. This leaves room for the normal increase of 5% per annum from 6 to 10, and therefore, over 10 years, makes possible an increment of about two-thirds of the original value. Beyond this again, it leaves room, at least in the first instance, for the obtaining of an undertaker's profit. Should this profit disappear later on in consequence of competition, the future value of this product remains all the same at 10, and thus leaves room permanently for the normal increase of value, in which consists the customary interest. Thus we see that, although the pieces of class A were valued at the one figure, this one value guarantees to each of the possible uses exactly that room for increase, a value which the remoteness of its finished and final result demands. To the immediate use where the utility of the good is at once realized, it guarantees nothing. To the five years process, it allows an expansion of about one fourth to the 10 years process, an expansion of about two thirds more than the original value. Perhaps there is even a greater expansion, in which case there remains a premium to the undertaker, but in any case, it guarantees the expansion just named. And this nice harmony is easily explained from what has just been said. In estimating the present value of the many-sided good, its possible future employments had already been reduced to present value whereby they experience a discount in exact ratio to their futurity. But only those future employments are found economically permissible, whose present reduced value is at least equal to the fixed value of the good, and whose effective future importance, therefore, is at least greater by the amount of the discount made pro rata temporis. Therefore, each of these future uses has a surative in advance a corresponding scope for recovery of its value. The lapse of time replaces the value which was taken from the estimate by way of discount, and this, in the near-hand uses, which require to bear little interest, is small and is correspondingly great in the remote uses which must bear much interest. What has here been represented on a small scale by one slight instance obtains over the whole field of industrial employment. It is not a few hundreds but millions of productive units days of labor, tons of coal, bars of iron, and so on, that are invested. They are invested not in two or three, but in hundreds and thousands of separate employments, and each of these employments has a different period of production. All those means of production enjoy one homogeneous market price. That price is formed by the available stock being distributed out among the most remunerative employments and according to the degree of advantage which they bring. The most remunerative branches in virtue of having the strongest purchasing power are supplied first and with the greatest certainty then the next remunerative branches and so on down the scale till the stock gives out some last portion of the stock then is taken for some last branch of employment and the modest advantage that accrues determines the modest measure of what those last buyers can pay for the productive unit but as the market price for all portions of the commodity is a homogeneous one the value of the employment last applied determines the total market price of the means of production. But how, then, has the advantage and value of the individual kinds of employment been determined? By applying the same discount to employments for future advantage, as has been described in our illustration, only that in rough practical life the discounting is made in a rough way that takes a great deal for granted. In practical life, men generally find already in existence the things of which we have tried to explain, the elements, and are glad to accept them without much reflection as accomplished facts. In the same way do they take interest for granted as an everyday fact, 
and without more due in all calculations relating to future employment, they add or deduct it. If an undertaker is considering whether or not he should lay out £100 on a productive instrument which will yield a result in two years' time, he simply calculates whether the future return will leave at least £100 over and above the two years' interest, and after deduction of the same. If he has thus deducted in advance from the future result an amount of interest proportioned to time and capital, it is a very natural thing that the future proceeds, when actually realized, should contain and yield that very amount of interest. The foregoing cases do not by any means exhaust the series of casuistical complications which obscure the working of our principle in the infinite variety of practical life. Happily, it is not necessary to exhaust them. Many are not of sufficient importance to justify us going into the tedious abstract demonstrations that would be needed to explain them, and for the rest, I venture to hope that in what has been already said, the careful reader will find enough to guide him among complications not expressly discussed without further assistance from me. There still remains for us, however, another important and by no means easy task. It is a word to follow the abstract into the actual and give it form and color. Hitherto, by an argument, which I hope is incontrovertible, but which I know to be highly abstract and general. I have tried to prove that it must be, as I have maintained, I have now to show how it actually is so in the world of industry. So far I have deduced everything from the general proposition that productive goods are, by nature, future commodities. I have shown that, in logical result, the general reasons which explain how future commodities have a less value must also apply to productive goods, and thus explain how there is room for expansion into the full value of present goods, and for the appearance of a surplus value, I shall now attempt to show positively that all this is as I have said, and why it is. To this end, I shall give a description of the markets, where, in economic life, means of production or productive instruments are exchanged against present goods, and shall try to show that, in these markets, the same motives to which we ascribe in general are the power of calling forth a difference of value between present and future goods, do really emerge and emerge indeed in such combinations and with such strength that, as the result of the formation of price, there must always appear a disagio to the prejudice of the means of production. In doing so, I hope not only to bring forward an adequate proof of the correctness of my general deductions, but also to obtain a number of new and important lights on the subject generally. Chapter 4. The Profit of Capitalist Undertaking, the Labor Market The exchange of means of production against the final and finished present goods, practically against money, is made in three kinds of market, the labor market, the market for uses of land, and the market for intermediate products, such as raw materials, tools, machines, factories, etc. Inasmuch as labor and uses of land are the original means of production, from the cooperation of which all finished products come into existence, the formation of their price is peculiarly the one which decides the existence of profit on capital. and the markets for intermediate products, we have only the continuance of a process which has received its own peculiar impulse in the other two markets. And of these two markets, again, the labor market is by far the more important. I shall then first take up the circumstances of this market, and I shall endeavor to show and explain how the market price of the productive good labor must always be less than the value and price of the finished product of labor. Let us assume that in the methods of production current in economical society at the moment, the making of a product ready for consumption requires a period of time extending in all over two years. The technical productiveness of this method, we shall assume, is such that it takes a week's labor to turn out a product which will have the value of 20 shillings. The same product may be turned out by shorter methods, but the result will be disproportionately unfavorable. If a three months process is adopted, the technical result falls to one half. If the worker has no capital and his process is, accordingly, one that yields its return immediately, the productiveness falls to one quarter, that is, respectively, to 10 shillings and 5 shillings. The price which can be paid for the commodity labor in these circumstances is the question now under discussion on the labor market between the laborer 
and the employers of labor. The price is fixed in methods with which we are familiar as a result of the subjective valuations of both parties. How is it now with these valuations? In the circumstances of modern industry, the wage workers scarcely ever possess sufficient means to utilize their own labor in methods of production extending over years. They have, therefore, to face the alternative of selling their labor or employing it of their own account in such short and unproductive processes as the scanty means at their disposal permit. Naturally, they will make that choice which is most advantageous to them. Those workers who are well enough off to embark on their own account on a production process lasting at least three months and yielding a return of 10 shilling per week will be willing to sell their labor at any price over 10 shilling. At any price under 10 shilling, they will rather work on their own account. On the other hand, those workers who are entirely without means and who, working on their own account in a hand-to-mouth process, could only have a return of 5 shillings, will be willing to sell their labor at any price above 5 shilling. As unfortunately, the laborers who are entirely without capital form today the greatest majority. We may assume for our illustration that the supply of labor will be represented by a long row of workers who are ready, in the worst case, to sell the week's labor for 5 shillings, and a shorter row who will do the same for 10 shillings present money. How is it now with the demand for labor that confronts the supply? The demand comes from the capitalist undertakers. The valuation they put upon the labor they wish to buy is so far more definite, inasmuch as the commodity labor capable of so many employments is looked at by them in connection with one definite employment, namely the one carried on by themselves. To them, accordingly, the week's labor which they consist to buy for the capitalist process is worth just so much as the product which it will turn out in this capitalist process. On our assumption, this will be 20 shilling, available in two years, but the question for the undertaker still remains. What are 20 shilling, available in two years, worth in relation to the present shillings in which he must pay the week's labor? Once for all, let us make this entirely clear. If capitalists were to realize their entire resource as present goods, that is, to consume their wealth in present enjoyment, the want of the present would evidently be provided for in superfluity, while the want of the future would have no provision whatever. They must, therefore, find it positively advantageous to change a part of their resources into future goods of some kind or other. In other words, if we look only at the relations of want and provision for want in present and future, present goods as such, are worth even less than future to the owner of a stock of wealth, which is greater than his present wants. It is true, of course, that there is a very simple way of changing present goods into future. They can be stored away either in natura or in neutral form of future money. This possibility naturally saves them from the prejudice of their value, which would, in itself, result from the overabundant provision for the present but on the other hand, it does not give them any positive advantage in value, or at any rate, a very trifling one. Nor can the underestimate of future wants form a reasonable basis for any such advantage. It will seldom be strong enough to outweigh the counteracting consideration of the overabundant provision for the present and to prevent the capitalists from preferring to employ part of their wealth in the service of the future. Persons, moreover, in whom this want of foresight might exceptionally be found are not or at least would not long remain capitalists an estimate like theirs dictated by a momentary desire and carelessness of the future would soon bear its consequence and would bring their fortunes into spendthrift consumption of the three considerations therefore which as we have seen generally serve as foundation for the preference of present over future goods the first two do not apply as regards the great majority of capitalists it is our third consideration, the well-known technical superiority of present goods, or as it is usually called, the productivity of capital, which is decisive with them. The way in which it takes effect is essentially different in simple circumstances from what it is in the full development of our modern economic life. In simple circumstances, where the undertaker is himself a worker and has no capital to speak of, present goods immediately obtain a higher use value. An undertaker, for instance, has just enough wealth to defray the subsistence of one working person for four years, or to advance that amount. The choice is now open to him, 
either to work by himself in a four years process or to assume a helper and work alongside him in the two years process. In a two years process, the week's labor yields, as we have assumed, 20 shillings. In a four years process, since longer methods are technically more productive, it will yield, say, 24 shillings. The balance now stands as follows. If our capitalist pays his helper for the week's work, the full 20 shillings in present money, he has to pay him 104 pounds for two years work. From its product, he recovers just the sum of 104 pounds. And finally, he can repay himself only 20 shillings a week. That is, in all, 104 pounds. His total net income for the two years thus amounts to 104 pounds. On the other hand, if instead of spending 104 pounds in paying a laborer, he spends it on his own maintenance during the third and fourth year of production, he may, from the 104 weeks of his own labor time at the higher rate of 24 shillings per week, recover 124 pounds 16 shilling, so that his two years net income is increased by 20 pounds 16 shilling. These circumstances, it is obviously more advantageous for the capitalist to have no helper. To obtain any advantage from a helper, it must be possible to pay him at such a price that the capitalist gains more by the buying of another person's labor than what he loses in the realization of his own labor by the shortening of the production period. In other words, that 20 shillings a week present money paid in wages should bring him more than 24 shillings a week future money in products. This will only be the case if he can pay a weekly wage that is under 16 shillings 8 pence. Were the circumstances of capitalist production generally so simple as this, the value to the undertakers of 20 shillings in future products would, speaking generally, be equal to the value of 16 shilling 8 pence present money. The actual figures varying a little, but not the tendency. And if the buyer's value at the commodity labor at not more than 16 shilling 8 pence, while the seller's value it at perhaps 5 shilling or 10 shilling, it is clear that the resultant of these valuations, the price of labor, will in no case exceed the amount of 16 shilling 8 pence, and must a fortiori come under 20 shillings the full sum of the future product, which was the point to be proved. But the circumstances of the present-day industry are not so simple. The great majority of our undertakers are not themselves workers, and their capitals, moreover, are generally so great to be far above what any one man could use for his subsistence during the very longest practical process. The possibility which capital gives its owner of employing his own labor in longer production processes does not, therefore, as a rule, under present conditions, give any higher use value to present goods. Our illustration of simple circumstances has very great importance in other lines of proof, of which later, but it does not suffice to explain the profit of capital in the circumstances of capitalist industry. These very complicated circumstances, however, develop a phenomenon which works in another form. To the same end, this phenomenon is credit. The capitalist cannot use his present goods to make his own labor more fruitful, but others are willing to take them in exchange for future goods, to make their labor more profitable, and are very willing to pay an agio in future goods. And evidently the capitalists need not barter his present money at par with the workers for their future product, when he can obtain on the loan market for a certain sum of present goods a greater sum of future goods. One is tempted to apply this fact to the explanation of profit as it were owning to the chances offered on the market for loans that the capitalist present goods had in all cases a higher subjective exchange value than future goods. But this is not my idea of explanation. We have no right either to represent loan interest as fate accompli and explain natural profit on capital from it, or conversely to represent the latter as fate accompli and explain loan interest thereby. The fact is that the loan market and the labor market are two markets on which one and the same commodity is mutually offered and demanded, which is present goods. On both markets, the demand for means of subsistence with the view of making labor more profitable by longer process of production. Only the circumstances of demands are different. For the present goods which he receives, the wage worker gives wholly and entirely the indefinite future product which his labor may create. The borrower in productive credit, consumptive credit, is much less important, but manifests its effects in the long run, in exactly the same direction, 
gives in exchange for present goods a definite quantity of future products, and if the actual product differs from this quantity, may gain or lose by it. Thus, wage workers and borrowers form two branches of the same demand. They mutually support its effect and jointly help to form the resultant price. Only in outside appearance are they two distinct markets. In reality, they overlap each other, and the market price of present goods is their joint result. To get to the root of the matter, therefore, before considering isolated and partial markets, we must take a comprehensive survey of that total market for advances of subsistence which, in every economic community, is built upon numerous communicating partial markets. Chapter 5. The Profit of Capitalist Undertaking, the General Subsistence Market At the outset, we must enunciate a proposition, as simple as it is fundamental, but one on the proper understanding of which everything depends. In any economical community, the supply of subsistence available for advances of subsistence is, with one trifling exception, represented by the total sum of its wealth, exclusive of land. The function of this wealth is to maintain the community from the time that their original productive powers are put in motion till these powers obtain their final and mature fruits. In other words, to maintain the community during the average social period of production. The greater the total stock of wealth in the community, the longer may be this social period of production. Here we really have three propositions, but they are so intimately connected that they may be conveniently grouped into one and explained and proved by one in the same argument. If we look at the uses to which a country's accumulated wealth is destined, and put leaving land out of account, we get something like the following picture. Some few owners of wealth, whether from necessity or prodigality, themselves consume it. Others, who produce on a moderate scale, for their own account spend their wealth in furnishing themselves with the necessary maintenance during their production period. But all other wealth, and that is, by far the greater amount, is in some form or other brought to the great market of advances for subsistence as supply. The owner either puts it into some undertaking carried on by himself, or he lends it to other people. If he puts it into his own business, it is, directly or indirectly, employed in giving advances of subsistence to laborers. I say directly or indirectly for the division of labor, splitting up as it does, the one united work of production into a series of apparently independent stages causes an important distinction in form, although it does not affect the essence of the matter. If the different stages of one and the same production process were united in the hand of one and the same undertaker, he would not buy any previous product. All previous and intermediate products needed would be made from the beginning by the workers in his employment. Here, therefore, his entire business capital would evidently be directly devoted to advancing subsistence to laborers. As it is, under the division of labor, he gets his previous products made by other undertakers, and buys them from these other undertakers. This amount to saying that, by this purchase, he takes upon himself the burden of the advances hitherto borne by other undertakers, and thus puts them again in a position to take upon themselves the burden of advancing subsistence for the following period of production. These previous and intermediate products, then, thus purchased, he gets worked up by laborers who are directly in his pay. In this way, therefore, by his wage payments, he advances subsistence directly to one set of workers, and indirectly by his outlays to a number of other sets employed in the preceding stages. If again the owner lent his wealth, to others, it may be either for consumption or production. If the former, the sum lent is a direct advance of subsistence to the borrower, if the latter it passes, as already described, from the borrowing employer to the laborers, as an advance of subsistence. Thus the entire accumulated wealth of society, with the very trifling exception of that portion which the owner themselves consume, is really brought into the market as supply of advances of subsistence. But the objection may be raised, how can the entire stock of wealth be offered as advances of subsistence when that stock consists only partially, and indeed to a very small extent, of actual means of subsistence, such as food, clothing, dwelling houses, etc., 
while the great bulk of wealth is represented by goods that are not adapted for immediate consumption, such as tools, machines, raw materials, factory buildings, and the like. The seeming inconsistency is, however, easily explained. It is simply that men never need their subsistence for the entire production period all at once. If in any community, 10 millions of men invest their original productive powers, labor, and uses of land in an average production period, or two years, it is quite unnecessary, indeed undesirable, that at any one moment the means of subsisting the 10 millions for the whole two years should be accumulated in finished form. It is sufficient if there is enough in finished form for, say, one month, and if, in the meantime, the means of subsistence for the following month are ripening into finished goods. In other words, all that is needed is that previous labor should have provided so many goods partly ready for consumption, partly intermediate forms of products ripening successively into consumption goods, as will cover the subsistence needs of two years, and thereby make it possible for the workers to invest their current labor in methods of production that will turn out the finished product in two years. Here we come to the second part of our threefold proposition. The entire wealth of economical community serves as subsistence fund or advances fund and from this society draws its subsistence during the period of production customary to in the community. All goods which appear today as the stock or parent wealth of society so far as they are not already consumption goods will in the more or less near future after a certain addition of finishing labor ripen into consumption goods and will consequently cover for a more or less lengthy time to come the people's demand for consumption. Of course this must not be understood as if there were some sharp line of division separating the period which is covered by the wealth already on hand from that later period which is not yet covered and for which consequently provision must be made through the current productive powers. What I mean is that the stock of wealth projects itself in the future as provision for the consumption of the future, as it were by stages, and not all at once. It does in two respects, in respect of the number of classes of goods for which provision is made, and in respect of the degree of maturity at which the work of production stands in the present. As regards the first, it is to be noted that for technical reasons in many classes of goods, such as various goods, provision is limited to the near future, perhaps to a couple of months, while simultaneously in other classes of goods, provision may be made for a couple of years. In others, again, where permanence is aimed at, or goods must be got ready long in advance, such as in dwelling houses, mining products, machinery, and the like, the means of provision must be prepared perhaps 20 or 50 or even 100 years before. Thus then, it is the nature of things that goods required in the future must now be ready or almost ready. For goods needed later, it is enough if, at that moment, they have gone through, perhaps, half of the production process, while for goods still required later, it may be enough if the production should have just begun. If a commodity, for instance, requires five years to make, then in the year 1888, the goods of this class destined to be used in the year 1889 must be ready, perhaps to the extent of four-fifths, those to be used in 1890 to the extent of three-fifths, those to be used in 1891 to the extent of two-fifths, while as regards goods destined for the service of the year 1892, it is enough if, at the moment, they have gone through the first fifth of the total production process. Thus it comes that the stock of wealth existing at the moment makes provision for the future in a doubly decreasing ratio. In proportion, as the time of consumption is remote, there are fewer classes, and the goods in these classes are less advanced or mature. To get an adequate representation of the circumstances of provision, then we should have to suppose that the stock of wealth existing on the 1st of January, 1888, contains nine-tenths of the goods required during 1888, and those goods are, on the average, nine-tenths finished. So that, on the whole, the labor required for the needs of 1888 is already finished and incorporated in the existing wealth to the extent of 81 one hundredths. That, further, it contains eight tenths of the goods required during the year 1889 
seven tenths finished, thus incorporating 56 one hundredths of the labor required for 1889, that it contains six tenths of the goods wanted for 1890, four tenths finished, thus incorporating 24 one hundredths of the labor required for 1890, and so on for 1891. 1892, 1893, incorporating respectively 12 one hundredths, 6 one hundredths, and 4 one hundredths of the total labor required for the service of these years. Adding up these amounts, we come to the result which I wished to elucidate by this illustration, which is that the entire existing stock of wealth provides an advance for something like two years' demand of the population. With this peculiarity, the stock of wealth instead of covering the exigencies of two continuous years, cover successively a decreasing proportion of the exigencies of a greater number of calendar years. Now the way in which this provision is made by the existing wealth and the extent to which it is made exercise a very suggestive and important influence on the employment of the original productive powers, labor and uses of land, coming into operation in the current year. For simplicity's sake, we shall consider the former only in detail. If the stock of wealth of existence in 1888 covers the want of the current year to the extent of eight tenths, it is clear that from the labor of this year the other two tenths will first be covered, but it is as certain that the remainder of the current labor will not be devoted to the service of the year 1888, and for two reasons. One, that any return in the year of 1888 could only be obtained by an unremunerative hand-to-mouth method of production, and two, that the few products thus obtained would come upon a market already stocked and find poor sale and poor prices. The other eight-tenths of the labor of the year will, therefore, be directed to the service of later years. And here again the following is clear. The fewer the wants of 1889, covered by the existing stock of wealth, the greater will be the amount of the current year's labor directed to the service of the year 1889. If there is not to be a gap, in the provision from year to year, and the smaller will be the amount of labor directed to the service of the years that come after it. Conversely, if the wants of 1889 are already, relatively speaking, amply covered by the stock of wealth, only a small fraction of the current labor will go to the service of 1889, and a proportionally greater amount can be reserved for remoter periods. The current labor thus adapts itself naturally to the existing stock of wealth, the one begins where the other ends. If it were to begin sooner, and so duplicate the provision already existent, it would come under the double disadvantage already mentioned of overstocked markets and less productive methods of production, and if it were to begin later, there would be a gap in the provision which would immediately cause scarcity prices, and thus call out speedy assistance from the productive powers. Thus it is, and here we come to the last part of our threefold proposition that in reasonable economic speculation, the current productive powers will and must, on the average, be directed to remote productive purposes, or in other words, invested in longer production periods. In proportion to the length of time for which the existing stock of wealth is able to be provided, if the accumulated wealth is so small that it only provides subsistence for one year, it is perfectly clear that it is impossible to invest the current productive powers in processes that average three years, since in the interval that must elapse between the consumption of the old wealth and the production of the new, the people would starve. And it is equally clear that it would be in the highest degree foolish and uneconomic to make the production period shorter than the existing wealth allows. The average period of production in a community is in exact correspondence with the amount of its stock of wealth, and is entirely conditioned by it. The principle is clear, but one not unimportant question of figures still remains to be considered. What is the numerical ratio between the amount of a nation's wealth and the average production period which that wealth limits? At the first glance, one would be inclined to answer, the average production period may be just so many months or years as there is months or years provision in the accumulated wealth. If, for instance, the year's wants of a nation are 500 millions, and the nation's wealth contains goods to the value of a thousand millions, we should be inclined to say that the average production period would be two years. This answer, however, would be incorrect, or to put it more exactly, 
but would only be correct under conditions which do not actually occur in practical life. It would only be correct, that is to say, if the work of production was not carried on by stages, if production were so arranged that all the workers cooperating generally in the manufacture of a finished product were employed simultaneously in the same stage. I mean, if all the workers were to begin with the first and preliminary processes simultaneously, were then to pass on simultaneously, as it were, in the line, to the second, third, fourth stage, till in the end they simultaneously turned out the total product finished and completed. Then, of course, the community's wealth must contain, in the form of finished goods, enough to supply the wants of just as many years as there are years in the production period. Suppose, for instance, that the manufacture of clothing were so arranged that all the workers employed in it prepared the wool in the first year, built the machinery in the second, spun yarn in the third, wove it in the fourth, and made up the cloth in the fifth. The stock of wealth would require it to contain finished provision for the entire demand of all the workers during five years. For, under a division of labor of this kind, during all the five years, there would be no addition of finished goods to the original finished stock. It is quite different if production is arranged in stages, as it actually is in modern industry. Of the workers occupied in the production of clothing, or, continue our illustration, various groups are employed simultaneously at various stages of it. In each year, a fifth part of them, perhaps, will produce wool, another fifth make machinery, another spin, another weave, and another do the making up. The result is that during the five years that elapse between the growing of the wool and the making of the coat, additions are successfully made to the fruits of labor which constituted the stock of wealth at the beginning of the period. That is to say, other fruits of labor, the result of labor expended at later periods, are arriving at the stage of finished goods. Say, for instance, on the 1st of January, 1888, a group of laborers begin the manufacture of woolen clothing. Nothing of the fruits of this labor will be ready before 1st of January, 1893. On the other hand, besides the wholly or partially finished products contained in the inventory of 1st of January, 1888, the following goods will arrive at maturity before the 1st of January, 1893, which the fruits of one year's labor of those workers who are busy with the final stage in 1888, of two years' labor of those busy with the second last stage in 1888, and with the last stage in 1889 of three years' labor of those who in 1888 reached the third last in 1890, the last stage of production, and finally, the fruits of four years' labor of those who in 1888 are occupied with the second stage and will reach the final stage in 1891. Now, since these goods, thus successively maturing, would provide for a very considerable proportion of the subsistence needed for the five years, 1888 to 92, it is evidently not necessary that the community, before entering on a five years production period, should have a stock of wealth equal to the entire five years' needs, or, if there is such a stock, a longer process than five years can be entered on. If we look at the same thing from another side, and one perhaps better suited to illustration, it is clear that, where workers are employed in stages, subsistence need be provided five years in advance only for those who work on the lowest or earliest stage of production. The workers on the second stage, the fruit of whose labor matures after four years, require subsistence advance them only for four years. The workers on the third and fourth stages require subsistence only for three and two years respectively. The workers on the last stage, those whose products will be finished in a year, require advances only for a year. Striking the average, we may say that to allow the entire body of laborers to embark on a five years production process, all that is required is subsistence for five plus four plus three plus two plus one divided by five, which equals three years, or a little more than half of the period production. What is true of five years process is true for all periods. If we take the trouble of calculating a number of concrete examples, we very easily come to an exact statement of the law relating to it as the follows. The stock of wealth must be sufficient for half the production period, plus half the usual stage period. If, for example, the work of production is carried on only by yearly stages, that is to say, if finished products are turned out by the process in question, 
only at intervals of one year, then in a five years production period, such as we have been discussing, the stock of wealth must last for half the production period, and beyond that, for half what we have called the stage period, in all three years. If again the stages of production are monthly, so that every month there is an output of finished products, the stock of wealth need only be such as will last two and a half years plus half month. To put it in general terms, we may say, if the production period embraces X stage periods, and stock of wealth must always be sufficient for X plus one, divided by two stage periods. Obviously, the greater X is, the smaller is the difference between this exact formula and the rough expression of half the production period, while X again increases with the length of the production period and the subdivision of the stages. In a two years process where goods are turned out once a year, the production period embraces two stages. The value of the exact expression is, therefore, 2 plus 1 divided by 2 equals 1 and a half years. That is, fully 50% higher than the rough expression. If again the process takes 5 years, and the goods come forward by monthly stages, x equals 60, and the exact expression has the value 61 divided by 2 equals 30 half months, which shows very little difference from half the production period of 2 and a half years. And if the production period be 10 years and the output be a weekly one, x will have 520, and the expression will have the value of 260 and a half weeks, which practically coincides with the rough expression of half the production period. Now, since in any organized industrial community, the average process is pretty long, and the subdivision into stages very minute. For not a day passes, but finished products are turned out of some workshop or other it may be assumed without much error that a community may, on the average, engage in production processes which are twice as long as the period for which the accumulated stock of wealth would provide subsistence. Chapter 6. The Profit of Capitalist Undertaking, the General Subsistence Market, Continued. It may be thought that in the disquisition of the last chapter, we have wandered entirely from our subject, the subsistence market. This, however, is not the case. We are here, indeed, at the very centre of the question, for which we are speaking directly of those things which form and regulate the supply and demand of the subsistence market. Who are the people that require to get subsistence advanced them? The answer is, everyone who wishes to produce in capitalist methods. How much is required? An amount proportioned to the length of the production process. And in what form is it required? By installments. Again, who are the people that have subsistence to give? All owners of wealth who do not consume but save it. How much can they give? As much as their stock of wealth contains. And in what form can they give it? Similarly, in installments. In the proportion that the unfinished goods contained in their inventory successively mature. This is the true nature of what occurs in our market for means of production and in our market for credit, over which I admit the division of labor and the use of money throw a veil very difficult to penetrate. Now at what price will finished present goods be exchanged for future goods on the subsistence market? This is the question in which our whole interest peculiarly centers. To answer it we must describe, with more care than hitherto, both the extent and, in particular, the intensity of supply and demand. To begin with supply, the extent of supply of subsistence we have already gone into with sufficient exactness, it is represented by the total stock of wealth accumulated in a community exclusive of land and after deduction of those amounts which are consumed partly by owners who are getting poorer, partly by owners producing independently and spending either on themselves or by way of advances. As to the intensity of supply, it may be assumed from what was said as regards modern economic circumstances that to the capitalists the subjective use value of present goods is not greater than that of future goods. In the most unfavorable case, then, they would be willing to give almost 20 shilling present money for 20 shilling obtainable in two years, or, what is the same thing, for one week of labor, which would bring them in 20 shilling in two years. Over and against the supply of present goods stands as demand one an enormous number of wage earners who cannot employ their labor remuneratively by working on their own account and are, accordingly, as a body inclined and ready to sell to the future product of their labor 
for considerably less amount of present goods. Recurring to the figures of our illustration, we may assume that for the future products of 20 shillings value, the product turned out complete as a result of a week's work and valued after two years at 20 shillings. One class of the laborers will, in the most unfavorable circumstances, accept a price or wage of 10 shillings, while another class will accept as low a sum of 5 shillings in present money. Two, a number of independent producers, themselves working, who, by an advance of present goods, are put in a position to prolong their process and thus increase the productiveness of their personal labor, say from 20 shillings to 24 shillings per week. Since these persons obviously get an advantage from this advance so long as it enables them to obtain anything over 20 shillings a week, they will be prepared, where necessary, to give up a portion of the surplus product of 4 shillings a week. As agio on the present goods to which they owe this surplus product, I purposely here mention only those undertakers who demand productive credit for the assistance of their own labor, and not those who demand for the employment of workers auxiliary to themselves. The demand of these latter forms only a passing stage. They take some part of the supply provided by the owners of wealth of the market, but only to offer it again on a different part market to the auxiliary workers. Three, a small number of persons who, on account of urgent personal wants, seek credit purposes for consumption and are also ready to pay an agio for present goods. Here then we see that in these groups constituting the demand, the circumstances are such that those who demand are willing and are able to pay for the present goods they require, where necessary by a larger sum of future goods, that is to say, by an agio. This being the state of the case, then, that all who own the supply value present and future goods alike, and all those who form the demand value present goods higher than future, the determination of the price simply depends on which side has the numerical preponderance. If more present goods are offered than are desired by the united demand, there can be no interest. The resultant market, as we know, must always be lower than the subjective value of those would-be sellers who do not affect a sale. Now, if the demand is numerically too weak, and if, in consequence, all the present goods offered cannot find a sale, and if all capitalists, even those who cannot find a sale for their present goods, value 20 shilling present money at something like 20 shilling future money, the market price of 20 present shillings cannot be higher than 20 future shillings, and there can be no agio on present goods. If, on the contrary, more present goods are wanted than are offered, all suitors cannot be supplied. In methods with which we are familiar, the weeding out process of competition now ensues. Those who are able to offer the highest agio for present goods succeed in effecting an exchange, while the others, be they few or many, are shut out, even although they may have been ready to offer some smaller agio. But since the market price must always be higher than the bid by the excluded buyers, and since this latter contains an agio, it is clear that, in the circumstances, the market price must also contain an agio, great or small, for present goods. Now it can be shown, and with this, we can come to the goal of our long inquiry, that the supply of present goods must be numerically less than the demand. The supply, even in the richest nation, is limited by the amount of the people's wealth at the moment. The demand, on the other hand, is practically infinite. It continues at least so long as the return to production goes on, increasing with the extension of the production process. And that is a limit to which, even in the richest nation, lies far beyond the amount of wealth possessed at the moment. Where a people, as in this case of Rosher's poor fisher folk, live from hand to mouth, it goes without saying that they will be eager to acquire the first hardly saved stocks, which allow them to make boats and nets, and their exchanges will be made with an agio against future goods. But among comfortably off and wealthy people, the position is different, not in kind, but in degree. If the stock of wealth be sufficient to maintain the population during an average one year's production period, every one will wish to engage in a two years process with its greater productiveness, and the stock of wealth not being sufficient to advance subsistence to everybody for two years, there will be, as before, bidding against each other. The circle of suitors will be weeded out, and the agio on present goods will appear nor does it make any difference if the community's wealth is sufficient for an average of five or ten years production period, since the provision for human wants 
would still be more abundant if, instead of 5 or 10 years, 6 or 11 years were the average periods. Men will always wish to embark on these more fruitful methods, will compete to obtain the subsistence that is not sufficient for all, and will thereby inevitably call forth an agio for present goods. Interest in agio must appear. Assume for a moment that they do not. Present and future goods are exchanged on the great subsistence market at par, and the laborers, for the week's work, get the whole value of the future product paid down to them in present goods. Say that the average production period, assuming the nation to be enormously wealthy, is 10 years, that the week's work consequently yields 40 shillings, and that the laborer receives the whole of this as wage. What will happen? The undertaker who employs people to work with him in a 10 years process makes no profit outside of his own personal labor. For the 40 shilling which the labor of his people yields him at the end of the production period has already been wholly expended as wage. But how if he extends the production period still further? If the week's labor has returned 40 shilling in the 10 years process, experience tells us it will return more in a 12 years process, say 44 shilling. In still longer processes, say 15 years, it may return perhaps 48 shilling. Now as the undertaker, by hypothesis, can buy present goods at par on the subsistence market, it would be foolish of him not to extend the production period for himself and his employees to 15 years. If he does so, he pays his workers out of the borrowed advances 40 shilling. The price on the labor market in 15 years he recovers 48 shilling from the product. From that sum, he pays back the advanced 40 shilling at par, and has remaining the respectable profit of 8 shilling out of each week of labor. And with this, we have the surplus value, the profit on capital. To prevent its appearance of laborer's wage would have to be raised from 40 shilling to 48 shilling, but this is not possible. For the well-known leveling tendencies of competition do not allow wages to rise permanently in any isolated branch so long as it does not presuppose peculiar personal qualities, inasmuch as there will at once be a rush from less pain branches into any particularly pain branch, but neither is a general rise of wages to 48 shilling possible, because the existing stock of wealth is only sufficient for an average 10 years period. The extension of the process to 15 years, consequently, can occur only in isolated cases. The bulk of productive employments must continue the 10 years process which yields only 40 shilling per week, and cannot, therefore, permit of any higher wage than 40 shilling. On the other hand, it is obvious that something else will make its appearance. However sharp undertaker A may be in borrowing money, free of interest and securing a nice surplus value of 8 shilling per week of labor, undertakers B, C, D, and E will not be far behind. The desire to prolong the production period, and with that, a demand for increased advances of subsistence will become general. It will not be possible to supply this increased demand from the limited funds of subsistence. And finally, the weeding out of competition will be among the classes who constitute the demand. Here then we have the agio again appearing in the universal market price of present goods, from which by hypothesis, we had for the moment banished it. And this result as regards the normal and really economic provision of society, is no less healthy than it is necessary. The possibility of obtaining means of subsistence free of agio would be certain to tempt undertakers into immoderate extensions of the production period. If this were to occur only partially and in a few branches of production, naturally the limited stocks of subsistence would leave so much less for the other branches of production. These latter would have to curtail their processes unnaturally, and there would ensue a deficiency in the social provision, which would outweigh the increased return got from the favored branches through the immoderate extension of their processes. But if the excessive extension were to be introduced all over, the community stock of subsistence would come to an end sooner than the fruit of processes thus unduly extended could mature. There would be a deficiency in provision, want, and distress Famine prices would recall the misdirected natural powers and put them with difficulty to supply provision for the moment. All this could not happen without serious disturbance, expense, and loss. Now the constant present of the agio on present goods is like a self-acting drag on the tendency 
to extend the production period without checking it all at once, it makes it more difficult and more difficult in proportion to the projected length of the process. Extensions which would be harmful as regards social provision are thus made economically impossible. Moderate extensions over the average process, however, are not absolutely prevented, but are limited to those branches where from peculiar economic or technical circumstances, the productiveness that goes with the extension of the period is so great that they can bear the progressive burden of the agio. Branches, again, where longer processes are somewhat but only a little more productive are tended to escape the burden of agio by recurring to periods under the average. Thus, finally, under the influence of the agio, the total fund of subsistence is divided out automatically among the individual branches of production in such amounts that each branch adopts that length of process which, in the given condition of the fund, is most favorable to the total provision. At this point, I think we may congratulate ourselves on having finished one of the most important demonstrations in the scope of our present task. It fully confirms those inferences which we had drawn from the nature of the productive instrument, labor as a future commodity, and it gives us the key to the explanation of the much disputed surplus value of the undertakers. It shows that in the great combined subsistence market of society, present goods must have an agio as a legitimate consequence of the constant fact that present goods are more useful and are more desired than future goods, and that they are never present and offered in unlimited abundance. This agio, thus organically necessary, is given directly on the loan market in the shape of interest, while on the labor market it is given in the form of a price for labor which remains under the amount of the future product of labor, and which, on that account, leaves room for the accretion of surplus value. The same principles as regulate the price of the productive instrument, labor, regulate the price of the original productive instrument, nature, or those services rendered by the earth which possess an economical character, generally called, from their chief representative, uses of land. If a piece of land, after deducting the share of the complementary productive goods which cooperate, will produce in one year 100 bushels of corn, or will rear in five years 100 hundredweights of beef, no one would be willing to pay the par value of 100 present bushels of corn or 100 present hundredweights of beef for the use of the land. When these last named amounts employed in lengthening the production process or directly exchanged against future goods on the loan market or spent in buying labor could obtain more than the 100 future bushels or hundredweights. Thus uses of land when exchanged against present goods cannot escape a deduction in price any more than can the productive goods labor. And finally, on the exactly similar grounds, the very same is true of the price of intermediate products. Concrete capital, generally, raw materials, tools, and so on, is bought and sold at a price which remains under the amount of the future product resulting from it. It would be a very easy matter to prove this point by point, as we did with the price of labor. But the case of intermediate products is so closely allied that it seems to me quite unnecessary. Generally speaking, the importance of the demonstration we have just completed does not consist in its proving that productive instruments are bought at a price which remains under the price of their future product. For this is an old and familiar fact taught not only by daily experience, but by the theory of the most divergent schools. The really important result of our investigations is that this well-known fact has been shown to be the necessary outcome of the same causes as give present goods the superiority in value over future goods. A few chapters back, I ascended to one feature of the socialist interest theory, that which explains surplus value from the low price at which productive powers are purchased. I may now add wherein the theory is wrong. It is wrong first in explaining interest by the cheap purchase of labor only. Interest is got as much by the cheap purchase of uses of land Quantitatively, of course, the profit from buying labor bulks much more largely in importance. The profit from the cheap purchase of intermediate products need not be mentioned here. It is explained on the same principles as the profit from the purchase of the original productive powers. Second, as I have already said, the purchase is not so cheap as it seems to be, because the object of purchase is measured in undervalued future goods. 
while the price is measured in full-valued present goods. And finally, the fact that the price of labor is relatively low is not the naked result of an exploitation in which want forces the laborers to acquiesce. To some extent, although probably to a less extent, the same would probably be the case without any compulsion, if wealth were divided almost equally among all. To prove this, let us recur for a moment to the consideration of those primitive circumstances which I hurried over as not immediately appropriate to modern economy. Suppose a society where all are owners of wealth and all independent producers, their labor embodied in, say, two years' process, is moderatively productive. Suppose that, in this society, which is not a poor one, a certain producer possesses means enough to make it possible for him either to maintain himself for six years or to maintain himself and one worker for three years. The product of a year's labor, we shall suppose, is as follows. In a two years' production period, 52 pounds at 20 shillings per week. In a three years' process, 60 pounds. In a six years, 65 pounds. If this man employs his wealth in lengthening the period of his production without employing an assistant, he obtains by a six years' labor six times 65, which is 390 pounds. If he employs an assistant and works along with him in a three years' process, he reaps from his own labor in six years, six times 60, which is 360 pounds. While the same amount is produced by the labor of his employee, how much can he pay his employee in wages? Obviously, it is quite impossible to give him the full 360 pounds, that is 60 pounds per year, in wage, for this would be to inflict positive injury on himself. Working by himself, he would have obtained in six years 390 pounds. By employing another, he only gets to keep 360 pounds. To avoid loss, he must, therefore, keep back of the product of the employee at least 30 pounds, and thus he will be able to pay himself at most 330 pounds. Or 55 pounds per year. If he does so, the whole advantage of the business is obviously still on the side of the laborer. The undertaker gains nothing, but the laborer gains inasmuch as he now earns 55 pounds instead of the 52, which is all he could have earned as an independent undertaker with a two years process. In these circumstances, the idea of exploitation is out of the question. So is the idea of a forced agreement, and still the wage, although stretched in favor, of the laborer to the extremest limit of the economically possible, remains under the full amount of his future product. Surely this is a clear enough proof that there is some other reason for the cheap buying of labor than compulsion and exploitation. Chapter 7. Interest from Durable Goods Material goods are of use to mankind through the action of natural powers that reside in them, or, as I have expressed it in another place, through the rendering of their material services. On the nature and importance of these material services, I have said enough in my former work, and I shall repeat only a few considerations which seem necessary to connect what was said then with the subject now before us. Many goods are so constituted technically as to be capable of rendering one single service, and in that service to exhaust the whole of their useful content. These are what we call perishable goods. In them, the good or the service coincide. Many other goods, again, are able to render several successive services. We call these durable goods. Tools, dwellings, clothes, and land are instances of such. Here, the single service forms of a smaller economical unit clearly distinguished from the good itself and is capable of obtaining a certain economical independence. To afford a single and limited act of satisfaction, a single service may be detached from the useful content of the good. Various services of the same good may be independently and differently disposed of. Single services or groups of services may be independently transferred, gifted, or sold to different people, as we see every day in the familiar legal contracts of lease and hire. Such services may obtain an independent price and, as this of course presupposes, an independent value. It is the value of these material services that now claims our attention. This value cannot be subject to any other laws than those which regulate the value of goods in general. A service obtains value exactly as a good does, that is, by the satisfaction of some want being dependent upon it, and the amount of its value is measured by the importance of the dependent want, that is, by the amount of the marginal utility 
which may be obtained from a service of such kind and such extent. Thus there is, naturally, an intimate relation between the value possessed by the material good itself and the value possessed by its services. The nature of this relation scarcely requires explanation. A material good obviously has the same value as the sum of all of its services, and a good is capable of rendering ten services, and if the satisfaction of a certain want depends on each of these services, it is obvious that what depends on the possession of the good is the receiving of these satisfactions, and indeed of all the ten satisfactions from which their services get their value. Naturally, the case of perishable goods is the simplest. Here the value of a single service coincides purely and simply with the value of the good itself. The value of a service rendered me by a cartridge is identical with the value of the cartridge. The case of durable goods is more complicated. We have always to think of the value of a durable good as a compound amount, as made up of the importance of more or less numerous wants to which it ministers by its successive services, or to put it another way, as made up of the individual values of the services on which those satisfactions depend. If a farmer is calculating the use value of a threshing machine with the view to buying it, he will take into account the time the machine will last and the work it is capable of doing, and it will calculate from that how many services it will render, and how much each service will be worth to him. In this, however, there may be another complication. If the services of the durable good be exhausted in a short space of time, the individual services, provided they are of the same quality, which for simplicity's sake we assume are, as a rule, equal in value, and the value of the material itself is obtained by multiplying the value of one service by the number of services of which the good is capable. But in the case of many durable goods, such as ships, machinery, furniture, land, the services rendered extend over long periods, and the result is that the later services cannot be rendered, or at least cannot be rendered in a normal economic way, before a long time has expired. As consequence, the value of the more distant material services suffers the same fate as the value of future goods. A material service which technically is exactly the same as a service of this year, but which cannot be rendered before next year, is worth a little less than this year's service. Another similar service, but obtainable only after two years, is again a little less valuable, and so on, the value of the remote services decreasing with the remoteness of the period at which they can be rendered. Say that this year's service is worth 100, the next year's service, assuming a difference of 5% per annum, is worth in today's value only 95.23. The third year's service is worth only 90.70. The fourth year's service 86.38. The 5th, 6th, 7th year services, respectively, worth 82.27, 78.35, 74.62 of present money. The value of the durable good in this case is not found by multiplying the value of the current service by the total number of services, but is represented by a sum of services decreasing in value. If the current year's use of a machine is worth 100, and the machine is capable of doing work of equal quality for 5 years more, the machine is not worth 6 times 100, which is 600, but 100 plus 95.23 plus 90.70 plus 86.38 plus 82.27 plus 78.35, which is 532.93. Now what happens during the working life of this machine? In the first year of its use, the owner realizes the current service with its value of 100. Naturally, the service thus consumed or rendered comes off the value of the machine, which we may call the bearer of the use, and the good suffers a loss of value, but this loss of value cannot be quite so great as the value of the service rendered and deducted. It is partly compensated by the increased value of the services that still remain embodied in the machine. That particular service which, at the beginning of the year of use, figured as next year's and had a value of only 95.23 in present money, figures by the end of the year as this year's use it has advanced one year nearer maturity and grown into the full present value of 100. Similarly, the former third year's service has now become next year's, and its value has grown from 90.70 to 95.23. The fourth, fifth, and sixth year's service has passed into the rank and value of the third, fourth, and fifth year services. Behind each of these latter services, there remains another service ready to take its place and entirely supply it. 
it is only the last, the sixth use service, that is not replaced by any succeeding one, and thus we find that the loss of value which the durable good suffers during the year's use turns out exactly equal to the initial value of the most remote service inherent in the good. This value, of course, is less than the value of the present service, the service known as the current return, and thus it happens again that to the owner of the durable good, something of the current return always remains over as net profit or net interest, after deducting the loss of value which the good suffers during its year of use, that loss of value familiarly known as wear and tear. This something amounts exactly to the customary percentage of the total value, the capital value, of the parent good, the bearer of the utility, a coincidence which it is the easiest thing in the world to explain. For this, something is got from the increasing value of the total services of the goods as these services come nearer to the present. Now, naturally, each service increases in value as it comes nearer the time of its realization, in the same ratio as it was underestimated formerly by reason of its remoteness. That is to say, its increases in value by the usual market percentage on its individual value. But since, as we saw, the sum of the individual values of all the services inherent in a good constitutes the value of that good, the increment of value of all the services added together must be exactly equal to the usual market percentage on the total value of the good. To put all this into figures, at the beginning of the first year of its use, the good, as bearer of six annual services, was worth in the present value 100 plus 95.23 plus 90.70 plus 86.38 plus 82.27 plus 78.35, that is 532.93. At the end of the first year, as now capable of five annual services of the present value of 100 plus 95.23 plus 90.70, plus 86.88, plus 82.27, it is worth 454.58. The loss in value is therefore 78.35, which is exactly the same as the former most remote service was. But since the sum received from the current year's service, the value of the service sold and now deducted amounted to 100, there remains a net gain of 21.65, which is exactly 5% of 432.93 the sum of which the good became worth immediately on deduction of the first service realized, as one might say, to account. Similarly, in the second year's use, the owner again realizes the service, now become present and worth 100. This comes off the value of the parent good, but the succeeding service, which before had become worth 95.23, now arrives at the full value of 100. That succeeding it becomes worth 95.23, and so on. Only the last service that originally worth 82.27 finds nothing to replace it. At the end of the second year's use, then the good, as capable of four remaining annual services of the individual values of 100 plus 95.23 plus 90.70 plus 86.38, is worth 372.31, as against the value of 454.58, which it had at the beginning of the year. It has suffered a loss of the value of 82.27, which is equal to the value of what was the last service, and as against the receipt of 100, it returns 17.53 net, the interest on the somewhat reduced capital that remains. And thus it goes on from year to year, the gross return always remaining the same, because by hypothesis the amounts of service remain unchanged in technical quality, the quota for wear and tear always increasing because the marginal service that which determines the loss of value stands nearer to the present and so to the full present value, and the net interest always decreasing in correspondence with the decrease of the capital, owing to wear and tear, on which interest has got to be paid. Till finally the good has entirely given up its useful content and is, as we say, consumed. Put in general terms, then, we get the following very simple explanation of the phenomenon of interest on durable goods. The owner of a durable good can always realize the full higher value of the then present utility, and this represents the gross return of the good, its gross interest. He loses, on the other hand, on account of the steady advance of the more remote services towards the present, only the smaller value of the last service then inherent in the good. This smaller value determines the amount of the wear and tear, 
and thus there is always a difference between gross interest and the amount of wear and tear, which difference forms his net profit or net interest. The cause, then, to which net interest owes its existence is nothing else than an increase of value of the future services. Services which were previously of less value, but during the period of the goods use have pressed forward into or towards the present. Thus our theory traces back the profit which durable goods yield their owner to the self-same causes, as explained interest on loans and undertakers' profit on production. I think I am justified in claiming this as the peculiar merit of the theory, and at the same time as a strong proof of its correctness, for it was just this interest on durable goods that formed the stone of stumbling to all earlier interest theories, and stood, as it were, a standing contradiction of them, supposing that the other kinds of interest could be explained by the productivity of capital. Obviously, this was no explanation of the interest yielded by a durable consumption good, which produced nothing, such as a dwelling house, household furniture, a hired piano, the books of a lending library, or, if undertaker's profit was traced, with more or less appearance of justification, to an exploitation of the laborers, the question remained, what laborers are exploited by the owner of a house? Suppose he has paid away the whole two thousand pounds, the worth of his house, in wages to the laborers who built it, so that in the origin of the house there is not a particle of profit from exploitation. Still the house, year after year, yields him one hundred pounds of interest on capital. Where shall we find the worker from whom the one hundred pounds could have been taken either by fraud or force? The use theory appears at first sight, at least better able to account for this form of interest since it borrows its special foundation directly from the phenomenon of durable use of non-perishable goods. But neither does it get beyond the mere semblance of an explanation. It gets entangled in subtleties of a wider and a narrower use of a gross and a net utility, terms, by the way, which may be quite proper as convenient expressions to indicate certain phenomena, but represent anything but clear and definite conceptions, and leaves entirely unexplained the nature of the relations existing between the value of the net and the value of the gross use, between the value of the parent good and the amount of its wear and tear. Whether net interest is high because the value of the capital is high, or whether the capital value is high because the net interest is high. Whether the amount of gross interest is cause or effect of the value of the other two amounts, on these questions we should seek in vain in the writings of Herman, Canis, or Schaffel. For anything approaching to clearness of inquiry and for anything like a real explanation. To all these questions, our theory gives one concise answer. The value of material services, gross use, forms the first link in the causal chain. The value of the bearer of the use, the parent good, is the sum of the individual values of its material services. Wear and tear is a result of the diminution of the services which still reside in the good and is, on account of the progression in time of the later services, neither equal to the value of the material service detached during the year of use, nor yet corresponding to the degree of physical wear and tear, which, if the good lasts six years, would amount yearly to one-sixth on the whole useful content, but is equal only to the value of that service which is the last, the most remote, at the time of calculation. And it is this same progression in time which causes the increase in value of the later services and from which comes a net gain, the interest on capital. The same considerations that have elucidated the cause of interest from durable goods throws a strong light on another phenomenon, equally familiar and equally misunderstood, that of capitalization. It is a well-known circumstance that, to such goods as yield us a more or less permanent return, we ascribe a certain capital value in consideration of this return. We estimate them as equal to a money capital which, at the ruling rate of interest in the particular country, would yield a similar amount of return for the same period. Thus a house which returns £500 a year we value at £10,000 if the usual rate of interest is 5%, or £12,500 if the rate is 4%, or we value a machine which, for six years, throws off annually a gross amount of £100 and certain net decrease in amounts at something over £500. Why do we attach just this value to them? The common explanation is because these goods yield a certain net return 
we must hold them equal in value to a sum of money which yields just the same net return. This, however, is incorrect, or rather, it is not an explanation at all, but a reasoning in a circle. The existence of a net return is not the primary fact which can be given as cause of the parent good having a definite value, but conversely, a definite value must already be put on the good if the net return as such is to appear. If in our example the machine, which in six years returns in all 600 pounds, has been valued at 600 pounds, its whole return evidently would have been absorbed by the wear and tear, and there would have been nothing left over as a net return. It is simply because it was valued at less, at something only a little over 500 pounds, that there remains a net interest after deducting the quota for wear and tear, and it is exactly as I shall show farther on in another connection, as regards the return and capital value of houses, lands, etc. The only correct conception, and the only conception which really gives an explanation of the phenomenon, is the one now stated. The true primary fact is the lower value of future goods and future services. Next, we have the parent good as capable of containing future services, estimated at a less amount than the total value which services successively given off will represent as they are given off. And finally, as consequence, comes the fact that the capitalized sum is less than the sum of the amounts realized by the services in the course of time, and that there is a net surplus from the current return, that on the one hand the value of the bearer of the use, and on the other its net return are represented by such figures that the former may be held equivalent to a money capital yielding at the current rate of interest. Exactly the same net return is a coincidence which I have already explained. And in virtue of this coincidence, it is finally as intelligible as it is justifiable that in practical economic life which finds and adopts as facts ready to its hand the things which we try to explain, the net return of goods should be taken as foundation for acts of valuation. It is an abbreviated method which, practically, is quite appropriate, although it turns the relation of cause and effect exactly the other way. Chapter 8. Interest from Durable Goods Continued To proceed, the phenomenon of interest just explained is characteristic of all durable goods, consumption and production goods alike. But in the case of production goods, there comes in one circumstance the influence of which has to be investigated. In goods which are to serve as instruments of production, not only are the future services remote from the present, but both present and future services are remote from that economical goal which is first to be reached through production. The final destination from which, according to principles with which we are now familiar, they derive their value, is the product obtainable from them in the future. But from the attainment of this goal, the current service, even that service in the very act of realization, is distant by the whole production period, which must intervene between its incorporation in the process of the turning out of the finished product. If this period, for instance, amounts to two years, the current service is two years away from attaining its goal, and at the same time from attaining its full present value, the next year's service is three years away, the next again four years, and so on, while in the case of durable consumption goods, every service attains its full present value, in the year or in the moment it is rendered. Now this has a twofold result. First, the services of productive goods undergo a greater reduction as compared with their full final value, and second, the growth of their value lasts longer on that account. After they are produced and set to work, they bear interest during the whole period of the production process on which they enter. Only in practice this interest is ascribed not to the durable good that forms an integral part of the outlay, from which indeed it is now separated, but to the business or circulating capital into which it is transferred at the moment of its separation. To illustrate this, a durable consumption good which lasts six years and yields at the end of each year a use of 100 is worth, as we have seen, 95.23 plus 90.70 plus 86.38 plus 82.27 plus 78.35 plus 74.62, which equals 507.55. 
a durable productive good on the other hand which lasts six years and whose use affords a final utility of 100 after a further production period of two years has the following value its current year's use which is first obtained by the end of the year and then brings in the amount of 100 after two years more that is after three years in all is only worth in present valuation 86.38 its next year's use which will bring in 104 years is today worth 82.27 similarly the third year's use has a present value of 78.35 the fourth years a value of 74.62 the fifth a value of 71.06 and finally the sixth has a value of 67.68 the whole productive good accordingly has a value of 460.36 at the end of the first year's use the first service is detached this, meanwhile, has come nearer to its final goal by a year, and accordingly advances in value from 86.38 to 90.70. The other services follow suit in the usual way. Thus the good, as still bearer of the five prospective services of the individual values of 86.38 plus 82.27 plus 78.35 plus 74.62 plus 71.06, is now worth in all. 392.68. It has therefore lost 67.68 in the course of a year's use, and as against the return of 90.70 represented by the service detached, has borne 23.02 of interest, exactly 5% on the initial value of 460.36. So far everything runs as before. But the service which was separated off with the value of 90.70 neither remains in its former shape nor remains its former value. It is detached from the fixed capital, and it has passed over into the circulating capital, where it remains incorporated in some or other of the intermediate products, say, in the yarn spun by machines. In this new shape, it is the object of the further production process, and is by it brought step by step nearer to full maturity, and so to its future value of 100. This it attains in the following, the second year of use. At the end of the second year's use again, the service, which is now the current one, is detached from the parent good with a value of 90.70. The parent good, now valued at 321.62, has lost 71.06 and, as against the return of 90.70, has borne 19.64 as interest. But during the same year, the service detached in the previous year and incorporated in the circulating capital has risen from 90.70 to 95.23 in value, and bears another 4.53 of interest. And again, in the same way, at the end of the third year of use, the service of the then value of 90.70 is detached, by which the parent good loses 74.62 in value, and interest gains 16.08. But since simultaneously, the service detached two years before, and incorporated in the circulating capital, increases from 95.23 to its full value of 100, and that detached one year before, from 90.70 to 95.23, there is a further gain in interest from 4.77 plus 4.53, that is, of 9.3. In this way, the peculiar combination of circumstances in durable productive goods gives occasion to a twofold interest relation. The services already detached bear interest after the manner, and as integral part of the circulating capital, that is, their claim or title to interest is based on their transformation into finished and final product. The services still contained in the good bear interest after the manner of durable consumption goods, that is, their claim is based simply on their approximation to the present, but of these two elements of the interest return, only the second is formally ascribed to the parent good from which it springs. For it the calculation is concluded at the moment in which the individual service is detached, and with the value which it then has. What further happens with it is ascribed to the circulating capital into which it passes at the moment of its separation. And thus we come to the final result. All interest borne by durable productive goods is borne by them simply in their character of durable goods, while their second property, that of being productive, only comes into play in the interest borne by the services already detached and transferred to circulating capital. In this lies the complete explanation 
of a developed interest phenomenon, which I before suggested, but had to delay going fully into until now. There is still, however, another highly important explanation we may gather in passing. In goods capable of only a moderate number of services, the contraction of value, even in the case of the last services, is but small. The result of this, on the one hand, that the value of the parent good is only a little behind the gradually developing value of its collective services, in our first example, the value of the machine lasting six years was not quite 600, but still it was over 500, and on the other hand, that the amount of wear and tear, even in the first year, is relatively high, and almost equal to the entire value of the current service. In our illustration, the value of the current service was 100, the value of the last service, that which decides the wear and tear, about 78. In goods again, capable of a very long series of services, both the value of the parent good and the amount of wear and tear fall proportionately. A good capable of rendering services of the annual value of 100 for 100 years is very far from being valued at 100 times 100, which is 10,000. At most, where the usual undervaluation of future goods is at the rate of 5%, it is worth 2,000. And the loss of value in the course of the first year's use, although a service worth 100 has been consumed and detached from the use content of the good, is not 100, but 76. That and no more being the present value, at a discount rate of 5% per annum, of a sum of 100 falling due in 100 years. Finally, if a good is capable of rendering not only a great many, but practically an infinite number of services, the phenomenon just mentioned is seen in full development. The present value of the parent good is infinitely less than the successively increasing value of its services. A piece of land, for instance, which bears 100 pounds each year for an infinite series of years, is worth not 100 times infinity, not 100,000 pounds, not even 10,000 pounds, but only some 2,000 pounds. And its loss of value sinks to zero. The piece of land whose annual current service is worth 100 pounds yields the whole 100 pound net. The law remains just as before, but the very remote services of the second, third, tenth century have so exceedingly small a value in the present that they can add almost nothing to the present value of the land. And the last service, the one which should decide the amount of depreciation as infinitely far away, has no present value at all. This is the ultimate reason why rent of land appears as a net income, and here first is the solution of the problem of rent traced to its real issue. The old rent theory gave only a preliminary and partial answer, and strangely enough, had not the slightest suspicion that its tentative solutions had never come near the heart of the problem. All preceding attempts, from Ricardo downwards, exhausted themselves in more or less successfully pointing out that the annual uses of land have an economic value, or yield an economic return, and why they do so. But the yield of such services is in itself, first of all, a gross return. That the owner gets a net return and net income has nothing to do with the fruitfulness, situation, kind of ground, or any such thing, but simply with the lower value put upon future goods, and the determination of the present value of the land in conformity with that. Suppose that a quarry, after deduction of all other recognized costs, produced for a hundred years of what we may call net and annual return of 100 pounds, and suppose that future services were not less valued than present. The value of the quarry would be the full amount 100 times 100. The quarry owner would draw an annual income of 100 pounds, but not a shilling of that would be rent in the present sense of that term. That is to say, a net income, the whole of it would be a protracted consumption of the parent wealth of 10,000 pounds. In the case of all other lands, is different from that of the quarry, not in kind, but only in degree. If a field is considered capable of producing crop for 1,000 years or 2,000 years, if one should prefer it for literal infinity in human affairs, is out of court. And if the future crops are to be valued as highly as the present ones, the valuation put upon such a field will reach an exorbitant height, which is 100,000 or 200,000 pounds, and the yearly rent of 100 pounds will present the character of a breaking off of the parent stem of wealth, a very gradual destruction of the stem, but still a destruction, 
not a net income. Landowners would be lords of a giant stem or stock of wealth, but they would have no net income. The theoretical explanation of rent from land then coincides ultimately with the explanation of interest obtained from durable concrete capital, and land rent is nothing but a special case of interest obtained from durable goods. That the two explanations do not entirely coincide, and that, on the contrary, the current rent theories are substantially so very different from the interest theories, is only traceable to the fact that, in the course of the explanation of rent, an intercalation had to be made which did not require to be made in the case of interest on durable capital, and that at the same time, from a faulty conception of the rent problem, economists exhausted the whole content of the rent theories in making this special intercalation. In the case of all products of labor, and consequently in all goods that constitute capital, it needs no explanation that they and their material services have economic value. Were it not so, they would be produced. In the case of the services of land, on the other hand, this is not self-evident, and therefore the economist must first exert himself to show why and under what circumstances the use of land receives a value and price. With a correct value theory, a few strokes of a pen will supply this proof, by means of the doctrines of marginal utility and of complementary goods. Wanting the guidance of such a theory, and entangled in the fetters of the labor value theory, economists gave it a shape which was unnecessarily circumstantial and clumsy, and was, at the same time, not very satisfactory in principle. Of Ricardo's rent theory, which in essence has remained the ruling one up till the present day, the theories of his opponents carry in Rodbertus, being quite exploded, it must be said that it contains an abundance of truth put in a formula essentially false. It is a brilliant piece of casuistry, which is out of connection with the central fire of correct principles. It lights up a bit of the road, but leaves the rest in obscurity and error, hence the peculiar fate of the Ricardian theory. It does not quite satisfy anybody. Even its friends are fain to discover a number of weak points in it, and its most universal propositions are, for the most part, its weakest. But there remains in an indestructible core of truth, which lives on under the most varied metamorphosis and, even to this day, constitutes the better part of its substance. But how far does the Ricardian or any other rent theory take us, even if it were correct in every point where it is disputable? It takes us no further than we get in the question of interest, when it has been shown that a threshing machine, after deducting all other costs, yields an annual gross interest, and why it does so. Where Ricardo ends his rent theory, there in truth ends the intercalation, which, because of its obviousness, did not require to be made in the case of movable capital. But it is just then that the chief question of the problem suggests itself why there is a net interest within that gross interest which is yielded by the year's use or service of the threshing machine, or the field, after deduction of the other costs. And to this question, which the rent theory up till now has entirely omitted to put, no answer can be given, either as regards the field or the machine, but to the point to the undervaluation of future goods and future services. Chapter 9. Results We have traced all kinds of methods of inquiring interest to one identical source, the increase in value of future goods as they ripen into present goods. Thus it is, with the profit of the undertakers, who transform labor, the future good, which they purchase into products for consumption, Thus it is with landlords, property owners, and owners of durable goods generally, who allow the later services of the goods they possess to gradually mature and pluck them when they have ripened into full value. Thus finally it is with the loan, even here it is not the case as one might easily think at first sight, that the enrichment of the capitalist comes from the creditor receiving more articles than he gives. For at first, indeed, the articles concerned here are less in value. But from the fact that the loaned objects at first lower in value gradually increase in value and on the moment of fruition enter into their complete higher present value what then are the capitalists as regards the community in a word they are merchants who have present goods to sell they are the fortunate possessors of a stock of goods which they do not require for the personal needs of the moment 
they exchange this stock, therefore, into future goods of some form or another, and allow these to ripen in their hands again into present goods, possessing full value. Many capitalists make this exchange once for all. One who builds a house with his capital, or buys a piece of land, or acquires a bond, or gives a loan at interest for fifty years, exchanges his present goods wholly or in part for goods or services which belong to a remote period of time, and consequently creates, as it were at a blow, the opportunity or condition of a permanent increment of value, and an income called interest, which will last over this long period. Once again, who discounts a three months bill, or enters on a one year's production, must frequently repeat the exchange. In three months, or in one year, the future goods thus acquired become full valued present goods. With these present goods, the business begins over again. New bills are bought, new raw material, new labor, these in their turn ripen into present goods, and so on again and again. In the circumstances, then, it is very easily explained why capital bears an everlasting interest. We may dismiss any idea of an inexhaustible productive power in capital assuring it eternal fruitfulness, any idea of eternal use given off year out year in to the end of time by a good perhaps long perished. It is because the stock of present goods is always too low that the juncture for their exchange against future goods is always favorable, and it is because time always stretches forward that the prudently purchased future commodity steadily becomes a present commodity, grows accordingly into the full value of the present, and permits its owner again and again to utilize the always favorable conjuncture. I do not see that there is anything objectionable in this. For natural reasons, present goods are certainly more valuable commodities than future goods. If the owner of the more valuable commodity exchange it for a greater quantity of the less valuable, there is nothing more objectionable in this than that the owner of wheat should exchange a peck of wheat for more than a peck of oats or barley, or that a holder of gold should exchange a pound of gold for more than a pound of iron or copper. For the owner not to realize the higher value of his commodity would be an act of unselfishness and charity which could not possibly be translated into a general duty, and as a fact would not be so translated in regard to any other commodity. In the essence of interest, then, there is nothing which should make it appear in itself unreasonable or unjust. But the essence of an institution is one thing, and circumstances which may accidentally accompany it in its practical working out are another. That the community has a power of choosing representatives is good, but if at every election there are broken heads and pothouse agitation and brute force instead of patriotic deliberation, decide the majority, it is not good. And like every other human institution, interest is exposed to the danger of exaggeration, degeneration, abuse, and perhaps, to a greater extent, than most institutions. It is undeniable that, in this exchange of present commodities against future, the circumstances are of such a nature as to threaten the poor with exploitation of monopolists. Present goods are absolutely needed by everybody, if people are to live. He who has not got them must try to obtain them at any price. To produce them on his own account is prescribed the poor man by circumstances. The only kind of production he could take up would be one yielding an immediate return, and this is not only unremunerative but almost impracticable under modern economic conditions. He must, then, buy his present goods from those who have them, either in the form of a loan or, more usually, by selling his labor. But in this bargain he is doubly handicapped, first by the position of compulsion under which he finds himself, and second by the numerical relation existing between buyers and sellers of present goods. The capitalists who have present goods for sale are relatively few. The proletarians who must buy them are innumerable. In the market for present goods, then, a majority of buyers who find themselves compelled to buy stands opposite a minority of sellers, and this is a relation which obviously is profoundly favorable to the sellers and unfavorable to the buyers. Now, of course, the circumstances unfavorable to buyers may be corrected by active competition among sellers. The fewer the sellers, the greater are the amounts of present goods they have to dispose of. To find purchasers for them all, competition must bring down the price from extreme heights to a moderate level that leaves no room for exploitation of poor men. Fortunately, in actual life, 
This is the rule, not the exception. But every now and then, something will suspend the capitalist competition, and then those unfortunate whom fate has thrown on a local market ruled by monopoly are delivered over to the discretion of the adversary. Hence direct usury, of which the poor borrower is only too often the victim, and hence the low wages forcibly exploited from the workers, sometimes the workers of individual factories, sometimes of individual branches of production, sometimes, though happily not often, and only under peculiar unfavorable circumstances of whole nations. It is not my business to put excesses like these, where there is actually exploitation, under the aegis of that favorable opinion I pronounced above, as to the essence of interest. But on the other hand, I must say with all emphasis that what we might stigmatize as usury does not consist in the obtaining of a gain out of the loan, or out of the buying of labor, but in the moderate extent of that gain. If exchanges are to take place between present and future commodities, the existence of some gain is an entirely normal phenomenon, is indeed an economic necessity. Some gain or profit on capital there would be if there were no compulsion on the poor, and no monopolizing of property, and some gain there must be. It is only the height of this gain, in particular cases, it reaches an excess that is open to criticism and, of course, the very unequal conditions of wealth in our modern communities brings us unpleasantry near the danger of exploitation and of usurious rates of interest. As little again will the unbiased spectator deny that in the circumstances accompanying the receipt of interest, it is frequently the case that one's sense of fairness is offended by the contrast between gain and desert. Where capital has once been obtained by personal exertion and ability, no one would grudge its owner the further profit he makes without exertion by exchanging his hard-won present goods into future goods. But often it is just the greatest fortune that falls into the lap of its owner without any personal desert, on his part simply by the happy chance of a legal enactment giving him the preference, and in this case the lucrative exchange of present goods for future goods, which steadily ripen into more valuable present goods, is made without exertion and without personal deserving. In all other branches of exchange, clever speculation is needed, timely season of opportunities, favorable conjunctures, if a gain is to be made by the exchange, but the merchant of present goods finds the conjuncture always favorable, he need only put out his hand to dispose of his goods, with a profit to any one among the thousands of eager buyers, while by his side the poor laborer drags out a painful existence of heavy toil, at a sacrifice of personal strength and personal happiness. But what is the conclusion from all this? Surely that, owing to accessory circumstances, interest may be associated with a usurious exploitation and with bad social conditions, not that, in its innermost essence, it is rotten, and the logical conclusion is that the axe should be laid to the decayed branches, and not to the sound stem, just as it would be foolish to take away the right of self-representation instead of simply putting down the riot at election time. But what if these abuses are so inseparably connected with interest that they cannot be eradicated or cannot be quite eradicated. Even then, it is by no means certain that the institution should be abolished. Arrangements absolutely free from drawback are never allotted to us in human affairs. Instead of the absolute good, which is beyond reach, we must choose what, on the whole, is the relative best, where the balance between attainable advantage and the drawbacks must be taken into the bargain, is the most favorable possible for us. Living in a great city has certainly many disadvantages, so has living in a small city, and so has living in the country. But we must live somewhere, and so we make our choice of the place where, after wise consideration of all the circumstances, the unavoidable evils seem to be the most outweighed by the advantages, and in the same way, before we abolish interest as such, we must first draw out a balance sheet to show whether human well-being is better promoted in a society which permits gain from capital and recognizes it, or in one which permits only income from labor. In making this calculation, it will not be overlooked that the institution of interest has its manifold uses, particularly as the prospect of interest induces saving and accumulation of capital, and thus by making possible the adoption of more fruitful methods of production, 
becomes the cause of a more abundant provision for the whole people. In this connection, the much-used and much-abused expression, reward of abstinence, is in its proper place. The existence of interest cannot be theoretically explained by it. One cannot hope in using it to say anything about the essential nature of interest. Everyone knows how much interest is simply pocketed, without any abstinence that deserves reward. But just as interest sometimes has its injurious accompaniments, so in its train it brings others, fortunately, that are beneficent and useful. And to these it is due that interest, which has its origin in quite different causes, acts, among other things, as a wage and as an inducement to save. I know very well that private saving is not the only possible way to the accumulation of capital, and that even the socialist state, capital may be accumulated and added to. But the fact remains that private accumulation of capital is a proved fact, while socialist accumulation is not. And there are, besides, some very serious a priori doubts whether it can be. Still, it is neither my purpose nor my duty to inquire what organization of society on the whole is best, the present or the socialist. I have only here to answer what comes up for answer in an inquiry as to the nature and origin of interest, and the answer here runs. There is no inherent blot in the essential nature of interest. Those then who demand its abolition may base their demand on certain considerations of expediency, but not as the socialists do at present on the assertion that this kind of income is essentially unjustifiable. Is the abolition of interest then possible? It may, I think, not be unprofitable to many of my readers to follow the fate of interest in a socialist state. Chapter 10. Interest under Socialism. Let us imagine the socialist state perfectly realized. All private property in land and capital abolished. All instruments of production vested in the hands of the community. All citizens working as laborers in the service of the common wheel and the national product distributed to all according to work done. How is it now with the action of those causes which produced interest under the individualist economy? First of all, it must be made clear that the causes are still there. There is always a natural difference between value and present and future goods, and since under socialism time does not stand still, future goods gradually become present ones and bring a surplus value with theirs. The difference of value between present goods and future goods, I say, is always there, for its peculiar causes continue to exist. The difference between the circumstances of provision in present and future, the partial underestimate of the future, which is characteristic of man, the uncertainty and shortness of life. In the socialist state, no one will be allowed to be an undertaker on his own account. And of course, the consideration of the greater technical productiveness of present goods employed as productive instruments ceases to be a motive for individuals. All the more strongly does this motive obtain as regards the great economic commonwealth, which now conducts and guides the total national production. Thus, even for the socialist state, it is absolutely inconceivable that economic subjects, whether as individuals or as the powerful economic commonweal, should, in their economic judgment and their economic practice, treat present and future goods as on the same footing. How, for instance, could it be all the same to the socialist worker whether he receives his hard-earned wage by installment of one pound a week or in 52 pounds at the end of the year, or in the shape, perhaps, of 52 pounds five or ten or fifty years later? Or how is it conceivable that under socialism a young oak sapling, which will be an oak tree with the value of an oak tree in 200 years, can be made equal in value to an oak full grown now. The central authority directing the national production must base its entire arrangements and dispositions on a calculation of present and future goods, having different values, if its dispositions are not to be quite inept and monstrous. If it do not put a less value on future goods, it must find that a process which promises a greater number of products in the far future is more remunerative than a process which yields a small number in the present or near future, and it must, accordingly, always turn its productive powers to remote productive ends, however remote they are, as being technically the most fruitful. The natural consequence would be very much as we have already pictured it. 
misery, and want in the present, and those in charge of the national economy would have no more pressing duty than to overturn this inept disposition, give the less amount of present goods the preference over the greater amount of future ones, and so prove that the difference in value between present and future goods is an elementary economic phenomenon independent of any human arrangements. If it is now clear that even in a socialist state, present goods will, universally, be valued more highly, it goes without saying that, if there is an exchange between the two, it cannot be effected at par. Exactly as under the present economic organization, present goods, as more valuable, will claim and will receive an agio. The emergence of this agio, and with it the emergence of interest in its most legitimate form, could only be repressed if every opportunity for it were repressed. In other words, if the exchange or barter of present goods for future were removed out of the world altogether. Now, of course, this would be attempted to considerable extent in the socialist state, all private ownership of the means of production being banished, all production on private account would be banished also, and all opportunity of buying the future commodities, labor, uses of land, and capital would be taken away from private individuals. Since then, in any case, the loan at interest would also be forbidden. The two chief springs from which interest flows to private persons in the present day would be happily stopped up, but certain opportunities would still remain open if exchange transactions between individuals were not entirely forbidden. Suppose, for instance, that free trade were allowed in durable goods, agio and interest would immediately slip in, as it were, by a back door. Say that a good lasts 100 years and that its present year's service is worth 100 pounds. 10,000 pounds must be the price of the good if the 100th year's service, rendered perhaps to some grandchild or great-grandchild, is to be paid full 100 pounds. No man would be willing to pay this price, but the moment that the purchase price is calculated at less than 10,000 pounds, the owner receives, in course of time, an income greater than the purchase price and harvests the excess as true interest. But much more important than any such sporadic obtaining of interest by private individuals is the fact that in the socialist state, the commonwealth itself, as against the citizens, would make use of the principle of interest, which today reviles as exploitation and deduction from the product of labor. The socialist state, as possessing all means of production, gets all the citizens to work in its factories and pays them a wage. It conducts, therefore, on the largest scale the buying forbidden to private individuals of the future good labor. Now, on technical grounds, various portions of the labor it buys it necessarily sets to work simultaneously towards various productive ends, widely removed in point of time. One group of laborers, for instance, it sets to baking. Another it sets to sink mining shafts, which perhaps assist in turning out consumption goods only 20 years later. Another it sets to replant a forest, the labor directed to distant ends, for reasons with which we are now familiar, obtains a greater technical product, and that product, when ripe, will possess a greater value. While, for instance, the product that a baker turns out in a day is worth perhaps four shilling. A laborer engaged in forestry may plant 100 oak saplings in a day, and these saplings, without added labor, may mature in a hundred years' time to strong oak trees worth 20 shillings apiece. Now how much can and should the socialist state pay as wage to those workers whose labor it directs to these far away but productive ends? Will it pay the foresters the whole value of their future product, say 100 pounds a day? Impossible. That would be a glaring injustice to the workers of other departments. If the entrance to individual branches of employment were left free to all comers, everybody would be a forester and nobody would bake bread. The country would relapse to primeval forest and the present, with its pressing needs, would remain unprovided for. If, on the other hand, the entrance was not free, and a very favoured minority were to be paid £100 a day, while others would receive four or six shillings, a plutology would emerge again in optima forma, only that it would not be based, as now on property, but much more fatally on favour and protection. But if foresters are paid exactly like bakers at four shillings per day, they are exploited, just as they are by capitalist undertakers under the present system. In buying the future commodity, labor, an agio was put on present goods 
and the labourer, instead of his future product of £100, is put off with a present wage of 4 shillings, which represents the present value of the planted saplings, but the surplus value which these saplings take on as they grow into oak trees ready for cutting, the socialist commonwealth puts into its pockets as real interest. Perhaps, probably, it is to be hoped not to keep it in its pockets, but to employ it in a general bettering of the wages of its workers. But any such supplementary common purse distribution of the interest thus pocketed does not make any difference in the fact that interest, as interest, has been received. In this, the socialist state only acts like a capitalist in the present day, who accumulates a fortune from a surplus value, and then disposes of it for purposes of the general good. A wage earned can be disposed of egoistically or altruistically, and interest received can be disposed of egoistically or altruistically, but it would be as rash to assert that a wage becomes an interest by being egoistically spent as to assert that an interest changes its nature and turns into wage when it is altruistically spent. It is too well worthy of remark that an equal distribution of interest obtained by the socialist state does not establish the same economic conditions as if the interest had not been taken at all. In this distribution, it is not the persons whose labor and product the interest was due that get the interest, but entirely different people. The forester had an amount of £99.16 shilling deducted from the value of his future product as interest. If now, through the distribution of all the interest thus obtained, the average day's labor is raised from 4 shilling to 6 shilling per day. The forester gets a couple of shillings returned him of the £99.16 shilling taken from him. The remaining £99.14 shilling other people get, and get indeed, just as at present, not by the title of wage, but by the title of property, or rather of joint property. The people who are employed in immediately remunerative production, such as baking, and create a day's product of four shilling, could, as labourers, ask and receive a wage of only four shilling. The other two shilling they receive only because they are at the same time joint owners in the national wealth, and because the socialist state, which administers the common national wealth as proprietor of this wealth, brings its entire right of property to bear on those workers whose labour are directed to more remote productive ends. In the socialist state, therefore, exactly as in the capitalist society, interest is deserved by the proprietor of present goods as against those labourers who create only a future product by their labour. The only difference is that in the capitalist society, property is unequally divided and interest falls to a few proprietors in great amounts, while in socialist society all are joint owners to an equal amount and all obtain an equally small quota of the total interest. In the above analysis I have taken my illustration from forestry because it illustrates the circumstances in question in the most striking and unambiguous way, in the most striking way because the difference of time between the fourth putting of labour and the receiving of the mature product, and with it, the difference in value between labor and future product is at its maximum, in the most unambiguous way. Because here no additional labor of any sort is necessary, and consequently the calculation of the final product produced by a definite expenditure of labor is quite simple. But it surely needs no further demonstration that exactly the same relation occur, in more or less weakened degree, in the case of all labor, which is directed to more remote goals of production. They are all technically more productive than those which yield their result on the moment. Their abundant future product, too, must always have a greater future value, because it could not economically have been produced at all, if already its present value, reduced by perspective, were not equal to the otherwise normal value of a similar amount of labor. Since finally the wage for similar and similarly valuable labor cannot be assessed at different levels according as the socialist state directs its labor to a near or a remote goal of production, the wage of those laborers who are put to a more remote tasks must necessarily be assured under the full value of their future product. And this secures that to a greater or less extent there appears a surplus gain for the community which is the owner of the present goods. Nor does it require any demonstration that the phenomenon of interest must emerge to a still greater degree if the socialist society be organized, not as one united community, but as a system of independent economic groups. 
For if this case at every exchange between mature and immature commodities, each group would appropriate surplus value, not only as against its own workers employed to remote productive ends, but in a much greater degree as against the other groups and would divide out this surplus value to the shareholders of the wealth belonging to the group as a dividend. Thus we come to a very remarkable and noteworthy result. Interest, which today the socialists abuse as a gain got by exploitation, a robbery from the products of labor, would not disappear even in the socialist state, but would remain in promise and potency, as between the community organized under socialism and its laborers, and must so remain. The new organization of society may make some change in the persons who receive it and in the shares into which it is divided by altering the relations of ownership. But the fact that the owner of present commodities in exchanging them for future commodities obtain an agio, it neither will nor can alter. And here again it is shown that interest is not an accidental historical legal category which makes its appearance only in our individualistic and capitalist society and will vanish with it, but an economic category which springs from elementary economic causes and therefore without distinction of social organization and legislation makes its appearance wherever there is an exchange between present and future goods. Indeed, even the lonely economy of a Crusoe would not be without the basis of the interest phenomenon, increasing value of goods and services, preparing for the service of the future. And of course, that in the absence of exchange transactions, there would be wanting the chief occasion to put exact figures on the value of goods, and therewith almost the only opportunity of calling attention and giving fixity to the phenomenon. Book 7. The Rate of Interest Chapter 1. The Rate in Isolated Exchange The exchange of present goods for future, in which interest has its origin, is only a special case of the exchange of goods in general. It goes then without saying that the formation of price in this case is subject to the same laws as govern the formation of price in economical exchange generally. The question whether present goods in general obtain an agio and also the further question of the height of that agio are both to be answered according to the rules laid down in Book 4. As regards price of goods in general, what remains for us here is only to amplify and vivify the colorless scheme which demonstrated that the current price of goods is the resultant of subjective valuations coming together in a market by pointing out those concrete circumstances which in this case the exchange of present against future commodities influence the mutual valuation of both. As before, it is advisable to distinguish between isolated exchange and competitive exchange. In the exchange which takes place between an owner of a present commodity and a suitor for it, the price will be fixed somewhere between the value of the present good to its owner as under limit and its value to the suitor as upper limit. If, for instance, £100 present money are worth to their owner exactly as much as £100 of next year's money, while to the suitor they are worth on subjective grounds, say on account of temporarily pressing circumstances, as much as £200 of next year's money, the price of £100 money will be fixed somewhere between £100 and £200 of next year's money, and the agio at something between nothing and 100%. The precise figure that is fixed in the individual case within these wide limits depends on skill and staying power displayed by both parties in conducting the negotiations, as a rule the owner of present goods will be in a position of advantage because he can do without the exchange and yet suffer no loss, while the suitor is often driven to pay any price for present goods. Hence the familiar case where, in the absence of competition, usuriously high rates of 50%, 100%, even 200% and 300% are extorted. When we go farther and inquire as to the deeper reasons which affect the subjective valuations of the suitors, and thus affect the economic upper limit of the agio, we find them a little different in the case of the consumption loan from what they are in the production loan, to which latter the buying of labor is closely allied. In the case of the consumption loan, the determinants are the urgency of want at the time, the probable provision at the time when the loan is to be paid back, and finally the degree of the suitor's underestimate of the future. The more urgently he requires the loan, the more easily he expects to be able to replace it, and the less he takes thought for the morrow, the higher the agio to which he will, 
in the worst case, consent, and vice versa. In the production loan, we find different concrete determinants. Here, the important thing is the difference in productiveness between the methods open to him who gets the loan and those methods open to him who has to do without it. To recur to our old illustration, if the fisher who has no capital and can catch only three fish a day by hand gets a loan of 90 fish, this is thus put in a position to make a boat and a net in the course of a month, and with these to catch 30 fish a day for the remaining 11 months. The balance stands as follows. Without the loan, he catches in a year 3 times 365, which is 1,095 fish. With the loan, he catches nothing in the first month, but 30 per day for the other 11 months. That is 335 times 30, which is 10,050 or a surplus of 8,955 fish. So long, then, as he has to give anything less than 8,955 next year's fish for the borrowed 90 present fish, he gains by the transaction. In this illustration, the difference in possible return between the two productive methods, and with it the upper limit of the economically possible agio, is absurdly high. 8,955 next year's units for 90 present units is something like 10,000%. But there will always be a very important difference when the choice lies between capitalist production and hand-to-mouth production, as the latter is, of course, always extremely unremunerative. The difference, again, will tend to grow less when the choice lies between two different capitalist methods, and will become more rapidly less in proportion to the length of the process already secured without the loan. This fact is of very great importance as regards the rate of interest, not only in isolated, but also in competitive exchange. If we put it in the clearest possible way now, it will give a good basis for what comes later. In an earlier chapter, I called attention to the well-attested fact that the lengthening of the capitalist process always leads to extra returns, but that beyond a certain point, these extra returns are of decreasing amount. Take again the case of fishing, if what we might call the one month's production process of making a boat and net leads to the return of the day's labor being increased from 3 to 30, i.e. by 27 fish, it is scarcely likely that the lengthening of the process of two or three months will double or treble the return. Certainly the lengthening it to 100 months will not increase the surplus by a hundredfold. The surplus return, for there will always be a surplus return, will increase by a slower progression than the production period. We may, therefore, with approximate correctness, represent the increasing productivity of extending production periods by the following typical scheme. It must be understood that I do not attach any importance to these particular figures. Everybody knows that, in every branch of production and at every stage of technical knowledge, the figures will differ. In one branch, the fall of surplus return may be slower. In another, it may be more rapid. All I lay stress on is the fact that the figures express the general tendency of surplus returns to fall. Assume to complete the hypothesis that a worker needs 30 pounds a year to maintain him in suitable circumstances, and let us try to find out on this basis the limit of the economically possible agio, which a suitor for productive credit may, in the worst case, offer for a loan of 30 pounds a year. If the suitor has no capital whatever, he can get a return of only 15 pounds without the loan. With a loan in a one year's production period, he can get a return of £35. In the most extreme case, he may therefore, without altering his position for the worst by the transaction, offer an agio of £20, that is 66 and two thirds of a percent. If, on the other hand, the suitor already has a capital of £30, once he gets it, whether it is his own or advanced from other quarters, does not affect the case. He can, without borrowing, engage in a one year's process and obtain a product of 35 pounds. And all that depends on his getting the loan is the extension of the process from one year to two, and the raising of the return from 35 pounds to 45 pounds, i.e. a yearly surplus of 10 pounds. Here then the suitor can economically offer, at the most, an agio of 10 pounds on 30 pounds, i.e. an interest rate of 33 and a third percent. Similarly, if the suitor, by whatever means, is already equipped for a two years process, the loan of £30 is now the cause of a surplus return of £8, which is £53 minus £45, which is 26 and two thirds of percent. 
Thus, the more ample the suitor's equipment is already, the more capital he has, the lower fall the surplus returns and the ratio of agio dependent on the loan. That is to say, the surplus falls to five pounds, four pounds, three pounds, two pounds, 30 shillings, 20 shillings, 10 shillings, and the rate to 16 and two thirds, 13 and one third, 10, six and two thirds, five, three and one third, one and two thirds percent. This fall is bound to emerge unless the returns obtainable in one, two, three, four X production periods should run not as we have assumed, but in the progression of 35, 45, 53, 58, 62, etc., but steadily in the much sharper progression of 35, 45, 55, 65, 75, 105, 1005, etc. In this latter case, on every one year extension of the production period made possible by the 30 pounds, there would depend a constant surplus return of 10 pounds, and the upper limit of the economically possible, again, would remain uniform at 33 and one third percent. But a ratio of increase like this cannot in any case go beyond a few stages in some few productions. It cannot go on permanently and without limit in any production. We come then to the important proposition that to intending producers generally speak, a present loan has less value in proportion to the length of the production periods already provided for from other sources. The proposition directly applies to the rate of interest in isolated exchange inasmuch as the valuation of the borrower for productive purposes directly gives the upper limit of the economically possible rate. It also allows us, however, to judge in what direction this proposition must influence the rate of interest in competitive exchange, where the price is the resultant of the subjective valuations of individuals, of whom many are intending producers. As has been said above, the case of productive credit is closely related to the case of the purchase of labor, the employment of productive laborers by the capitalists themselves. Here, however, there enter certain complications which may be as easily and briefly stated under competitive exchange. I shall not, therefore, discuss them separately, but shall go on at once to explain the rate of interest in developed competitive exchange. Chapter 2. The Rate in Market Transactions The character of the market in which present goods are exchanged against future goods has already been described. We now know the people who appear in that market as buyers and sellers. We know that the supply of present goods is represented by the community's current stock of wealth, with certain unimportant exceptions, and that the demand for them comes, one, from the suitors for productive credit who wish to equip themselves for their own work in production, two, from the suitors for wage-paid labor, and three, from the suitors for consumption credit. To these three categories we may add, under certain reservations, the maintenance of the landowners. Finally, it will be remembered that the resultant market price must, as a rule, be in favor of present goods and must lead to an agio on the same. What we have now to do is to group together the causes which determine the height of this agio to one adequate and typical picture. If we were to attempt all at once to draw a picture like this, covering, as it does, the whole area of the varied influences that cross and intersect each other on the market, we should meet with great, indeed insuperable difficulties, in the way of statement. I shall therefore act on the principle divide et impera, and first consider how the price is determined under the assumption that, confronting the supply of present goods, there is one single branch of demand, though in present circumstances by far the most important branch, which is the demand of wage earners. Once we have drawn in broad, clear lines the most important and difficult part of the whole picture, it will be relatively easy to define the kind and measure of the share which all the remaining market factors have in forming the resultant, and so gradually to make the picture true to the full complexity of practical life. For good reasons, I also retain provisionally the former assumption that the whole supply and the whole demand for present goods meet in one single market embracing the entire community. And finally, we shall suppose, meanwhile, that all branches of production show the same productiveness, and also the same increment of productiveness on each extension of the production period. That is to say, we shall assume an identical scale of surplus returns.
Suppose, then, that in our community the stock of wealth in the market as supply amounts to one billion five hundred million pounds, and that there are ten million of wage earners. The annual product of each worker increases in all branches of production, in proportion to the length of the production period, from thirty-five pounds in a one-year's process to seventy pounds in a ten-year's process. The question is, in these circumstances of the market, how high will rise the agio on present goods? It is quite certain, as we have already explained, that the agio will settle at that level where supply and demand exactly balance each other, and this lies between the subjective valuations of the last pair who actually exchange. But the fixing of these valuations here encounters a quite exceptional difficulty, and one which does not occur in any other exchange transaction, but has its basis in the special peculiarity of the commodity labour. Every other commodity, that is to say, has a predetermined subjective value to the one who wishes to buy it. Labour has not, and for this reason. It is valued according to its prospective product, while the prospective product varies according as that labour is invested in a short or in a long production process. We said above, that in the subjective circumstances of the capitalist, a sum of present goods was, as a rule, worth as much as the same sum of future goods. The capitalist will, therefore, count the value of labor equal to just as many present shillings as it will bring him in the future. But according as this labor is invested in a short or roundabout process, it may bring him in 35 pounds or 58 pounds or 70 pounds, of which these figures is the capitalist to value it. It may be answered according to the product aimed at it entering upon the method of production which is economically the most reasonable. He will therefore value the year's labour at £35, if, on reasonable grounds, he meditates adopting a one-year's process, at £70 if he considers a ten-year's period the most suitable. This would be very well if only it was certain beforehand what period was the most suitable for the undertaker. But this is not certain. On the contrary, the length of the process is itself dependent on the rate of wage fixed as a resultant price on the labour market. If the wage, for instance, stands at £25, a one-year's process is the most favourable for the undertaker. At £25, he gains £10 in the year, or, to put it exactly, in the six months, since, on the average, the advance extends over only six months, that is, 80% per annum. In a 10 years process for the 25 pounds in wages, he gets 70 pounds, and the surplus return of 45 pounds is absolutely much greater. But when divided as profit over an average of five years, gives only nine pounds for one year, or profit of 36%. On the other hand, if the year's wage is 50 pounds, it is quite clear that it would be as much absurd to choose a one year's process with its product of 35 pounds as it is most reasonable in the previous circumstances, and only those longer production periods which show an annual product of over fifty pounds could be thought of. The matter, therefore, stands as follows. Elsewhere in the case of other commodities, the employment for which the buyers wish to acquire them is already determined. It is the fixed point, the thing which first of all helps determine the price offered by the buyers, and then through that the resultant market price. Here, in the case of commodity labour, on the contrary, the employment is an undetermined amount, an X, which is first determined by the resultant price. In these circumstances, it is clear that the fixed point of the price transactions must be got somewhat differently from the ordinary way, not, of course, according to different principles or laws, but with a certain casuistical modification in detail, which we now have to examine. In place of the fixed point, which is not available because the employment of the labour itself is not fixed, we find a substitute in the fact that another amount, usually indetermined, is here fixed, which is the quantity sold. It may be taken as certain that all the labour offered, like the whole sum of present goods offered, finds a market. The certainty of this is based on a peculiar circumstance, exactly as in the science of money, it is a familiar dogma that in the long run, any sum of money, be it great or small, is sufficient to do the work of circulation in a community, so is it true that any sum of present goods, be it great or small, is sufficient to buy up the whole supply of wage labour that exists in the community. 
and to pay its wages. All that requires to be done is to contract or extend the production period. If there are 10 million wage workers and 1,500 millions of capital, this stock is just sufficient to pay the 10 million workers 30 pounds a year each over a 10 years production process. If there are only 500 millions of capital, no laborers need go idle on that account. Only, of course, they cannot have their maintenance advanced them for a 10 years process, but at the same wages of 30 pounds, only for a three and third years process, and the average duration of the production period must be curtailed accordingly. Suppose there are only 50 millions of capital. All the labor could still be bought, but now for only four months process, and it must be secured by a further shortening of the production period, that the scanty amount of present goods is renewed after every short period by the ascension of fresh returns. It is, therefore, always possible for the existing stock of wealth to buy all the labor, and there are certain reasons in this case that work very strongly towards always making the possible into the actual. Between capitalists and laborers, the economic conditions are, with very few exceptions, extremely favorable to the effecting of exchange. The laborers urgently need present goods and cannot or can scarcely turn their own labor to any account. They will, therefore, to a man rather sell their labor cheaply than not sell it at all. But very much the same is true of the capitalists. In their peculiar circumstances of want and provision for want, their present goods, which they, in any case, would lay up against the future, are not worth more to them than a similar sum of future goods. They will, therefore, prefer any purchase of labor where there is an agio, however little it may be, rather than let their capital lie dead. And the consequence is that all capital, like all labor, actually comes to a sale. As a fact, we see that, in all economic communities, although the quantitative relations between wealth and number of wage earners are extremely various, these two amounts exactly buy up each other. There are everywhere a few laborers who have no work and a few capitals which are not employed. But this is, of course, not in contradiction to what has been said. I need scarcely point out that the presence of such unemployed is never traceable to the purchasing power of capital being insufficient to the whole number of the laborers in a poor country. Indeed, a capital of half the amount would have to pay the same number of laborers and actually does pay them, but always to certain frictional and temporary disturbances of organization, such as are inevitable in a mechanism of so complicated as the industrial division of labor in a great country. We may, therefore, assume it as certain that the whole supply of labor and the whole supply of present goods comes to mutual exchange. In this fact, the length of the production period, and thus the amount of product which the undertaker may obtain through the labor he buys, obtains a certain definiteness. That is to say, we must, in any case, assume such a period of production that, during its continuance, the entire disposable fund of subsistence is required for, and is sufficient to pay for, the entire quantity of labor offering itself. If the period were to be shorter than this, some capital would remain unemployed. If longer, all the workers could not be provided for over the whole period. The result would always be a supply of unemployed economic elements urgently offering their services, and this could not fail to upset the offending arrangements. But we are not yet finished with the subject. It is not one single definite production period that harmonizes with the above assumption, but a great many different periods. Obviously, given the capital and the number of workers, a very varying number of years can be provided for according as the wage of labor is high or low. With a capital of 1,500 millions, for instance, our 10 million workers can be kept in work and wage for 10 years at a wage of 30 pounds, or for five years at a wage of 60 pounds, or for six years at a wage of 50 pounds. Now, which of these possible cases will be the one actually adopted? This will be determined by the play of the same egoistic motives as regulate the formation of price in competition generally in the following way. Assume for a moment that the usual wage is 30 pounds. A capitalist then with 1,000 pounds, for convenience sake, we shall take this amount as the unit throughout the following discussion, may employ either 66.6 .6 laborers 
in one year's process, or 33.3 .3 laborers in a two years process, or 22.2 .2 in a three years process. Naturally, he will choose the process which he finds most advantageous, which process that is will be seen from the following table, showing how many workers can be employed by 1,000 pounds in each production period, and how much annual profit may be got from that sum. The table shows that in the given circumstances of all the factors, it is most profitable for the undertakers to devote themselves to a three years production period. They obtain thereby the very considerable rate of 51.1%, while both in the longer and in the shorter processes, the profit is lower. In these circumstances, naturally, all undertakers will seek to adopt this length of process. But to what does this lead? In a three years process, 1,000 pounds can employ 22.2 .2 workers and therefore to employ all the available capital in the community, which is 1 billion 500 million, 33 and a third million workers would be needed. While there are only 10 millions, these 10 million workers could be employed by a sum of four and a half million pounds, leaving capital to the amount of 10 and a half million lying idle. Of course, these 10 and a half millions of capital would not and would not remain so. They would compete for employment, attract laborers by offering higher wages, and the necessary result would be a rise in the rate of wages. The £30 rate, then, assuming the above position of the factors, cannot possibly be a permanent one. Suppose now that the rate of wages is £60. We get the following table. This table proves that if we assume £60 as the rate of wages, production in anything less than a five years period shows a positive loss, while of the longer periods, the eight years process is the most profitable. It yields the modest interest of 3.54%, but relatively speaking, it is the most favorable rate that can be got. It is easy to see, however, that it is as impossible for a wage of 60 pounds as it was for 30 pounds to be the definite resultant price of labor. Under the assumed circumstances of productivity, the eight years period is the most profitable length of process at a 60 pound rate of wage. By adopting a capital of 1,000 pounds, can employ only 4.16 laborers. Consequently, the entire capital of 1 billion 500 million can employ only six and a quarter million workers, and the remaining three and three quarter millions must starve. This again is impossible. The unemployment will offer their services in competition with each other and the wages will be pressed below the rate of 60 pounds. At what point, then, will this overbidding and underbidding, which come from unemployed capital when wage is too low, and from unemployed labor when wage is too high, come to an end? Obviously, it will be when the most reasonable production period exactly absorbs the wage fund on the one side and the labor offered on the other. This will be the case, as the following table shows, at a wage of 50 pounds. At a wage of 50 pounds, the six years production period proves the most profitable. It gives an interest of 10% on the invested capital, while a five years process would return only 9.6%, and a seven years, 9.7%. Moreover, as at that wage, the 1,000 pounds employs six and two third laborers, the entire 10 million workers, and the entire 1,500 millions of capital find employment. And the point is reached where the formation of price may come to rest. All who have it in their power to disturb the settlement by further over or underbidding have no inducement to do so, and all who might have an inducement have not the power, as on economic grounds they are already excluded from competition. There is no idle capital which might be tempted to seek employment by overbidding, and there are no idle laborers who might be tempted to seek employment by underbidding. And finally, the undertakers who have replaced their production on the footing which makes this favorable position of things possible are rewarded by this arrangement being at the same time the most profitable for them, and they too have no inducement to make any change. Those undertakers, on the other hand, who might have wished to engage in longer or shorter processes and would thus have made either capital or labor insufficient are excluded from any such disturbing competition by the fact that such methods of production show either a loss or a smaller profit. The price of labor, then, will and must settle at a wage of 50 pounds, 
and this involves, at the same time, an agio of 10% on present goods. I say it must do so, for so long as this point is not reached, there are certain tendencies always at work to force the price towards it. If, for example, the wage were only a little higher, say 51 pounds, the six years process would still be the most profitable, but only 9,800,000 laborers could be employed by the available capital of 1,500,000,000. The unemployed, by the urgency of their circumstances, would exert a pressure on the price of labor till such time as they could be taken in, which would be the case when wage came down to 50 pounds. If, on the contrary, the wage were a little lower, say 49 pounds, the employment of the 10 million workers would take up only 1,470,000,000 pounds of capital. The unemployed remainder would attract employment through overbidding, and the result again would be a rise of wage till such time as the point was reached at which equilibrium all round could take place. If the assumed state of the factors, an agio of 10%, is therefore the economically necessary result, why exactly 10%? The considerations hitherto presented can only answer negatively that the necessary equilibrium could have been reached at no other rate of interest. But we may now inquire whether our figures do not bring out some other circumstances which may positively indicate a rate of 10% and give us matter for a precise positive law of the interest rate. To arrive at a position of equilibrium, the capital of the community had to be taken out of shorter processes where full employment could not be found for the existing stock of labor, and employed in gradually extending methods till all the laborers were fully occupied. This was arrived at in the six years process, on the other hand the adoption of still longer processes for which again the capital is not sufficient had economically to be prevented. In these circumstances the six years producers are the last buyers, the marginal buyers, the would-be seven years producers are the most capable excluded suitors for means of subsistence, and according to our well-known law, the price that results must fall between the subjective valuations of these two. How does it stand with these valuations? What we have to look to simply is what is the utility which, for those two sets of buyers, depends on the disposal over a definite sum of means of subsistence. Here, first of all, it may be put down generally that on the disposal over each half year's wage, in the present case, 25 pounds depends one year's extension of the production period per worker. Accordingly, with respect to the six years producers, it specially depends on their possession or non-possession of the 25 pounds, whether as regards one laborer, they can embark on or continue in the six years process instead of the shorter five years process. But according to our scheme of productivity, the year's return of one worker in a five years process amounts to only 62 pounds, while in a six years process, it amounts to 65 pounds. What therefore, as regards the marginal buyer, depends on his having the disposal over 25 pounds is the obtaining of a yearly surplus product of three pounds. On the other hand, those would be producers who are trying to take the means of subsistence out of the market in order to extend the production period to a seventh year could gain by their extension only a surplus return of two pounds. For them, therefore, all that depends on their disposal over the 25 pounds is a surplus of two pounds. And they are excluded from competition inasmuch as the resultant price has established an agio which exceeds the rate of two on 25, which is 8%. If, therefore, and this is indispensable to equilibrium being reached, the extension of the production period is to halt at the limit of six years, the agio established by the fixing of the price must lie between the rate that represents the valuation of the last buyer, three pounds on 25 pounds or 12% as upper limit, and the rate representing the valuation of the competitors first excluded 8% as lower limit. And thus, our former empirical and circumstantial demonstration of the rate of wage and the rate of interest at which equilibrium may be reached on the market must point provisionally to the rate of 10%. It must at least point to the zone between 8% and 12%. The fact within this zone, the rate of 10% is exactly brought out, is due, of course, not to the limitations indicated by the valuations of the marginal pair, but 
simply to the quantitative effect of supply and demand. We shall see immediately, however, that the wide latitude 8% to 12%, which our abstract scheme leaves for the narrowing action of supply and demand, looks considerable only on account of figures accidentally chosen. In practical life, the latitude given is almost always vanishingly small. Meanwhile, we may put the results at which we have arrived in general form as follows. The rate of interest on the assumptions already made is limited and determined by the productiveness of the last extension of process economically permissible and of the further extension economically not permissible. In this way that the unit of capital which makes this extension of process possible must always bear an amount of interest less than the surplus return of the first named and more than the surplus return of the last named extension. Within these marginal limits, the price may be more exactly determined by the quantitative relation between wage fund and number of workers, according to the law of supply and demand. In practical life, however, the latter method of determining price is seldom taken. It is true that in our abstract scheme, there was an unusually wide latitude to come and go on, because we had assumed a sudden decrease of the surplus return from three pounds to two pounds, that is, a fall of fully one half. But in practical life, sudden differences like this scarcely ever occur. The figures which represent the productiveness of the last permissible and the first non-permissible extension come usually very close to each other, and consequently they are sufficient to limit the variations of the interest rates so strictly and sharply that the theoretically more exact determination by means of the relation of supply and demand is practically unimportant. Indeed, assuming that these two marginal limits are very near each other, one of them may even be left out of account without any serious inaccuracy, and the law be simply formulated thus. The rate is determined by the surplus return of the last permissible extension of production. This coincides almost to a word with Thunen's celebrated law, which makes the rate of interest depend on the productiveness of the last applied dose of capital. Chapter 3. The Rate in Market Transactions Continued But our task is not yet finished. Following the same lines as we took in developing the general law of the price of goods, we must attempt to lay down the concrete determinants which decide the degree of productiveness of the last extension and from our knowledge of these we must, in particular, try to get an explanation of the variations to which the interest rate is subject in practical life, sometimes rising, sometimes falling, but with a constant tendency in the latter direction, over the whole field of economical development in historical times. This analysis, too, will give us a welcome opportunity of verifying our abstract theory by experience. If we find that our theory, starting with certain assumed conditions, of fact leads us of internal necessity to expect just that movement of interest which in the experience of practical life and history we see actually and always taking place when these conditions are realized we shall be justified in taking it is a strong guarantee that our theory although it uses such abstract machinery in the stating is no vain imagining but a theory obtained from the study of practical life moreover in what follows I shall be in much less marked opposition to old doctrines than I have been in the foregoing chapters. For certain connections between the rate of interest on the one side and the definite facts on the other are so distinctly and unquestionably given by experience that it was impossible for the adherents of any interest theory, however erroneous, to overlook them. And however different the theoretical points from which they may have started, they find themselves at one in recognizing these. All the same, I venture to hope that what follows will give more accuracy and definiteness, as well as a new and more adequate explanation to many a proposition long accredited by experience. Following the line of inquiry already pursued, I shall try to investigate the concrete determinants of the rate of interest and the manner of their working in such a way that we can successively vary the individual assumptions in our illustrative scheme and then see what result the variation gives us as regards the formation of the interest rate let us look first then at the influence of the amount of the national subsistence fund assume that other circumstances remaining unchanged 
the available subsistence fund amounts not to 1 billion 500 million, but to 2 billion 400 million. The repetition of the same calculation as made above leads us to the conclusion that the equilibrium of the market cannot now be obtained otherwise than by eight years production period, a 60 pound rate of wages, and a corresponding interest rate of 3.54%. It shows that where the rate of wages is 60 pounds, the rate of productivity being given, the undertaker finds an eight years production period, the most profitable. That 4.16 laborers may be employed by 1,000 pounds of capital and therefore 10 million of laborers by 2 billion 400 million. And finally, that this relatively most profitable method of production yields 3.54% interest on the undertaker's capital. As compared with the earlier ones, this rate shows a considerable decline, the reason of which is very easily explained. When the subsistence fund is increased, men can only keep it fully employed by entering on further extensions of the production period, which extensions are accompanied by steadily decreasing surplus returns. Indeed, the surplus return of the last extension of production economically possible from seven to eight years is only 30 shilling, and the surplus return of the first non-permissible extension from eight to nine years is only 20 shilling, and since the rise of the year's wage from 50 to 60 pounds requires for the one year's extension, not a capital of 25 pounds, but a capital of 30 pounds per man. The marginal limits for the interest rates are 30 shillings on 30 pounds as upper limit and 20 shillings on 30 pounds as lower limit. As a fact, the agio of 3.54%, which we found empirically falls between these determining marginal limits. Assume conversely that the available subsistence fund amounts only to 1 billion pounds. The equilibrium, as will be seen from table four, is attained at a rate of wage of 42 pounds and an agio of 19.048%. This is accompanied by some interesting circumstances which will repay a moment's attention, as they may be often enough realized in practical life, although not seen there in their full abstract purity. At a prevailing wage of 42 pounds, as it happens, two different production periods of four and five years respectively are equally profitable and pay 19.048% interest on the capital invested in them. The result of this is that neither of them economically shuts out the other. Both may be adopted simultaneously, indeed, not only may, but must, to keep the equilibrium. If the four years period alone were adopted, only 840 million pounds of capital would find employment at a wage of 42 pounds. If again, the five years period were exclusively adopted, the existing capital would employ only 9,524,000 laborers. And in either case, the unemployed elements would, as we know, disturb the equilibrium by overbidding and underbidding. The equilibrium can only be found if the two equally profitable methods of production are engaged in simultaneously. When 7,619,000 laborers will be employed by a capital of 800 million pounds in five years production and 2,381,000 laborers by a capital of 200 million pounds in four years production. And in virtue of this peculiarity, the latitude allowed in fixing the agio by the valuations of the marginal pair will be much more sharply limited in this than in the former examples. The last economically permissible extension of production it's from four to five years, which brings in a surplus return of four pounds, that being a surplus on 21 pounds, half the year's wage. But as it happens, the first excluded extension of production is also that from four to five years, inasmuch as, as shown above, the existing capital allows only a portion of the producers to take the five years production period. Consequently, the surplus return of the first excluded process that which forms the lower limit of interest is also fixed at four pounds. The upper and lower limit therefore coincide and the interest must be determined strictly at the rate of four pounds on 21 pounds, that is at 19.048%, just as actually shown in our former scheme. Now the agio here is considerably higher than in the former cases and our theory again explains it quite simply. The reason is that the diminished subsistence fund allows only a comparatively short processes on the average, and consequently the last extension of production, though which decides the interest rate 
falls in a sphere where any extension of the production periods is attended by very considerable surplus returns. So much for the effect of an alteration in the amount of the subsistence fund. We have still to follow the effect of alteration in number of workers. Any detailed calculation here, however, should not be necessary. It does not require much consideration to see that a change in the number of laborers must exert its influence on the rate of interest in exactly the opposite direction. Whether, for example, the number of laborers remains steady at 10 million and the subsistence fund contracts from 1 billion 500 million to 1 billion, or whether the subsistence fund remains at 1 billion 500 million and the laborers increase from 10 million to 1 billion 500 million. In either case, the subsistence fund is just sufficient to employ the existing laborers partly in four, partly in five years periods, while the last and decisive surplus return is four pounds on 21 pounds and the resultant rate is 19.048%. And it is as clear that if subsistence and laborers vary simultaneously in the same direction, say that both increase, the variations will weaken the efficiency of both and the final movement of the rate will follow that direction taken by the stronger of the varying factors. And that on the other hand, if both factors vary not only in the same direction, but also in the same ratio, the rate will remain unchanged. Suppose, for instance, that the number of workers and the amount of subsistence fund both double. It is evident that the doubled fund will be sufficient to provide for the doubled numbers over the same production periods as before, and that the last and decisive surplus, and with it the interest rate, will remain unchanged. If, again, the fund were to double while the numbers increased only by a half, it is obvious that, on the average, a longer production period could be adopted than formerly, in which case the decisive last surplus return would be reduced to a lower point on the descending scale of surpluses, and the interest rate would also fall. Finally, we might inquire, on the same lines, what will be the effect of an alteration in a third factor. The state of productivity, assuming that subsistence fund and number of laborers remain constant, here also we may spare ourselves any detailed tabular statement. It does not require any exact calculation to prove that if other circumstances remaining unchanged, the scale of surplus returns constantly shows higher figures. The surplus return yielded by the last extension of production that is economically permissible, that which decides the interest rate must be higher and vice versa. Say that subsistence fund and number of laborers stand in such a relation as to permit of an average five years production period, the interest will be higher if the extension of the production period from four to five years is attended by a surplus return of six pounds as against four pounds or of four pounds against one pound. We have then over the sphere of our investigation so far to record three elements or factors which act as decisive determinants of the rate of interest the amount of the rational subsistence fund, the number of workers provided for by it, and the degree of productivity in extending the production periods, and the way in which these three factors affect the rate may be put as follows. In a community, interest would be high in proportion as the national subsistence fund is low, and the number of laborers employed by the same is great, and as the surplus returns connected with any further extensions of the production period continue high, Conversely, interest will be low the greater the subsistence fund, the fewer the laborers, and the quicker the fall of the surplus returns. This is the way in which the interest rate should be formed, and the way in which it should alter, if our theory is correct. How is it in actual life? Exactly as our formula predicts, and thus experience gives that formula the most complete verification. For first, it is one of the best accredited and recognized facts of economic history that the increase of the subsistence fund or to use an expression not quite so accurate but yet roughly significant the increase of the community's capital has a tendency to depress the rate of interest second it is no less familiar and less evident that here we do not speak of the absolute amount of the national capital but of the relation between that capital and the numbers of the population in other words we mean that an increase of population without a simultaneous increase of capital has a tendency to raise the interest rate. And thirdly, it is also an acknowledged empirical fact 
than the discovery of new and more productive methods of production, outlets, business opportunities, etc., which conduce to check the fall of surplus returns, tend to raise the rate of interest, while the closing of former opportunities of production or sale, or other occurrences which end in a reduction of the previous degree of productiveness, tend to lower the interest rate. We find, therefore, that all those factors to which, on the lines of our former inquiry, we were forced to ascribe a decisive influence on the interest rate, do, as a fact, possess and exert that influence. And now it is time to give, one by one, the features and forms of actual life to our abstract scheme. Chapter 4. The Market for Capital in its Full Development Up till this point we have assumed that the annual product of each worker, and also the annual wage, is the same in all branches of employment. Of course, in actual life, this is not the case. But that does not in the least disturb the normal connections and relations we have laid down. Otherwise, than by acting as if there were a somewhat different number of unskilled laborers with ordinary wages and ordinary productivity. For even if the absolute amount of the return to labor on the one hand and that of the wage of labor on the other be ever so various in the various branches of employment, still the ratio between these two amounts will, in virtue of the familiar law of equalization of profits, remain the same all over. And this is the essential matter in the question of interest. If, for instance, in one branch of production, the wage of unskilled labor be 50 pounds, and the product of a year's labor 65 pounds in another branch, carried on mostly by skilled labor, the worker's annual product may perhaps be double, say 130 pounds. But then the wage of such a worker will rise also to double, say to 100 pounds, for if it did not rise, the undertakers in this branch of business would obtain an abnormal surplus. This would attract stronger competition, and competition would either raise wages by creating an active demand for workers, or press down the price of products by increasing supply. But if the wage of the skilled laborer were to rise higher than 100 pounds, the undertakers in question would again obtain too small a profit, and the consequent limitation of that branch of production would undoubtedly either press down the wage of workers who would now have become partly superfluous or raise the price of the restricted product till such time as wage and product here as everywhere stand in the ratio of 50 pounds to 65 pounds or 100 pounds to 130 pounds. But if this ratio between wages and product holds, all the ratios relating to the formation of interest are exactly as they have been assumed to be in our earlier tabular statement, with the single qualification already mentioned that the existence of better paid skilled labor has exactly the same effect as a somewhat greater number of normally paid unskilled laborers. For obviously it is all the same as regards the resultant derived at in the subsistence market, whether two laborers produce 65 pounds each and claim 50 pounds each of subsistence, or one laborer produces 130 pounds and claims 100 pounds. Further, we have assumed up till now that in all branches of business the increment of annual return that accompanies the increasing extension of the production period moves in the same rate of progression. This is also not the case in real life. On the contrary, each branch of production, in virtue of its technical circumstances, has a different and often indeed a very different scale of productivity. It is, for instance, quite possible that three different branches of production, call them A, B, and C, which were each turning out in one year's process an annual product of 50 pounds might show an exceedingly divergent return or surplus return if the process were extended for two to five years more we might have something like the following naturally this has its practical consequences it is the producer's interest to obtain the greatest returns or surplus returns they will therefore invest the available capital where they are tempted by its greatest returns if there is capital over or, if new capital is added, they will look out for the next best paying employment, and so on, in such a way that they will only take a less paying employment when all the more paying chances have been utilized. Now if, as we have hitherto assumed, the progression of surplus returns obtainable from similar extensions of production were the same in all branches of employment, then in all branches of employment the same surplus would be reached by the same length of process, and consequently an equally long production period would prevail simultaneously over all employments. 
As capital increased, it would press on with one united front from one to two, from two to three years production, and so on. But as we have said, owing to different technical circumstances in the various branches of production, we actually meet the same surplus returns in productive periods of different lengths. While then, in the investment of capital, we pursue an isohypsy, to borrow a geographical term of surplus returns, we must diverge from an isohypsy of extensions of production. Production in its various branches must be carried on in unequally long processes, and indeed in those branches where the surplus return sinks rapidly, it must be carried on in shorter periods. The above scheme will illustrate this. First of all, production is carried on in all three branches, in a one year's process with a return of 50 pounds per labor year. If the subsistence fund increases so much that at least a partial extension over the one year's period is possible, people will pass first to a two years process in branch C, which bears a surplus return of 10 pounds for a half year's payment. Then the production period will be extended in the same branch C to three years with a surplus return of five pounds and to four years with a surplus return of two pounds 10 shilling. While the other two branches of production are all the time persisting in the comparatively unremunerative one year's process, only where the subsistence fund increases still further, they will pass in branch B to two years production with a surplus return of two pounds. But in branch A, they will not be able to extend the period of their production, which only gives a surplus return of one pound until all opportunities of production have been utilized up to the isohypsy of one pound. This will only be the case when in branch C, the production period has been extended to five years and in branch B to three years. Production then will and must be carried on simultaneously in the three different branches in two, three, and five years periods. A conclusion which we see verified in economic practice in the familiar fact that different products are produced with very different degrees of capitalism. Food, for instance, is a much less capitalistic product than metallic goods or clothing stuffs or manufacturing products generally. How then is our law of the rate of interest affected by this complexity of actual circumstances? It is not disturbed in the least, for all the essential circumstances on which it rests remain unchanged. It is still the case that the existing capital is employed in gradually extending processes till it is fully occupied. It is still the case that there is a certain level of these extensions yielding a certain surplus return which is the last economically permissible, and a succeeding level yielding a somewhat less surplus return, which is economically not permissible. And finally, it is still the case that the surplus returns of these marginal employments also form the marginal limits of the interest rate. The single difference, and that is not an essential one, is that the isohypsy of the surplus returns, and with it the product of the last permissible extensions of production, is not a straight line, but runs in an undulatory or zigzag fashion through the different branches of production according as the same surplus return is reached by them in no longer or shorter processes. But this modification gives our law a still sharper power of definition. For as in consequence of the complexity of actual life, the scale of productivity is much more finely graduated than was our simple, typical scheme. The two marginal limits as a rule stand much nearer each other and consequently narrow the zone within which price is determined very much more closely than is shown in our abstract illustration. To proceed hitherto, we have assumed that the demand for present goods comes simply from the wage earners, either directly or through the mediation of undertakers, but this again in actual life is not correct. There are a few other competitors in the market. There are, first, the suitors for consumption credit. Their demand is graduated and stratified according to their urgency of their need for present goods. One class will be in such pressing need that, in the worst case, they will be glad to offer an agio of 100%, another class will only go to the length of 80%, a third will offer 60%, others 50%, and so on down the scale, perhaps to 2%. Now these suitors join their claims to the demand which comes from the wage earners and each class or layer of them is satisfied concurrently with the layer of productive employments yielding a surplus return that represents the same percentage. If, for instance, the investing of capital reaches the isohypsy of a surplus of four pounds on 21 pounds, all those suitors for loans will be satisfied simultaneously 
who in the worst circumstances are able to offer 19.048% or more. If it reaches the isohypsy of the surplus of two pounds 10 shilling on 25 pounds, all suitors will be served who are willing to offer at least 10% and so on. It would be quite erroneous to understand this as meaning that the rate of loan interest is determined simply by the rate of interest obtained in production. It contributes just as much to determine the latter as it is determined by it. Both classes of demand work in entire coordination. The fact that here is a certain class of suitors for consumption loans, and that this class takes a portion of the existent means of subsistence out of the market, involves that there are fewer means at the disposal of productive investors. Investment must call a halt at the high isohypsy of surplus returns, and this again involves a higher rate of interest in the sphere of production. Conversely, the presence of the productive demand results in a considerable portion of the means of subsistence being claimed for productive purposes, and this again has the result that the wants of consumption credit are not satisfied at such low levels as would otherwise have been the case. In the present day, of course, the productive demand is so much the more important of the two that the one is apt to suppose that it alone rules the rate of interest, but this false impression is now and then sensibly corrected by experience when some great state loan for consumption purposes, say for a war, makes the general interest rate fly up. But even when the demand for consumption credit is quite insignificant, it does not fail to exert some influence on the rate. It may always be contended, if it were to disappear, the interest rate would be at least a fraction lower than it is now. Another competitor in the market for capital is the landowner. If owners work their own lands and are content to maintain themselves by the fruits of their labor, whereby they lay past their rent as saving, they are no burden on the subsistence fund of the community. If, however, they live wholly or partially on their rents, their subsistence also must be advanced out of their community's fund for a length of time proportional to the production periods in which their land is laid down. Suppose, for instance, that the wealthy cotton planter lives in idleness on his rents, and that the total production process of textiles, including the various stages of spinning, weaving, etc., down to the manufacture of the finished cotton stuffs, takes five years, the maintenance of the planter, just as much as that of his field worker, must be advanced out of the subsistence fund over five years. The advance will then, of course, be refunded out of that quota of product, which, according to the law of complementary goods, is due to the cooperation of the uses of land. But in the meantime, the landowner lives at the expense of the subsistence fund. What kind of effect has this on the rate of interest? Its effect is entirely similar to that of consumption credit. The competition of landowners takes a certain amount of subsistence out of the market. It thus curtails the investment of capital in production and makes it call a halt at a higher isohypsy of surplus returns, and this finally keeps up the rate of interest. In doing so, however, the claim of the landowner on subsistence comes under a reflex influence from the height of the interest rate. This, of course, has no reference to the height of the annual rents, for this is fixed by those circumstances which influence the economic value of uses of land, and need not be mentioned here, but to the number of annual rents for which advances of subsistence are demanded. That is to say, if interest is high, lengthy periods of production are not profitable. The uses of land will be invested in comparatively short processes, and as consequence, the advances made to landowners will only be for a short period. If, whenever, the interest rate is low, then concurrently with the increase in production and consumption credit increases the subsistence advanced to the landowners. It now extends over greater number of annual rents according as the uses of their land can now be invested in much longer processes. There is one other competing party in the market. The capitalists themselves, so far as they live entirely or partially on their interest, their maintenance also will be defrayed from the subsistence fund, and in so far as the fund available for other purposes is thereby contracted, will the interest rate tend to rise. There is, however, one important difference between the claims of the capitalist on subsistence and those of the wage earners, the suitors for loans, and the landowners. The claims of the latter are the cause of the agio on present goods, 
The claims on the former are simply its effect. If the claims on subsistence presented by the wage earners, borrowers, and landowners did not by themselves alone exceed the existent subsistence fund, there would be no agio on present goods, and as consequence, the capitalists as such could make no valid claim for subsistence on the funds of the community. In default of an income from interest, they would have to support themselves by work. It is only because there is an agio as effect of the other classes of demand that the capitalist can claim a quota of the product as interest and claim it indeed in advance. Reflexly, of course, this claim of the capitalist's influences, the rate of interest. It is exactly as, for instance, in electrical induction. The chief current first calls out the induction current, and then the latter reflexly influences and indeed strengthens the chief current. Just in the same way does the demand for other competing parties in the market by creating an agio first call out the claims of the capitalists on subsistence, but so soon as the agio is a fact, it diverts a portion of the subsistence fund into the income of the capitalists. It thus contracts the disposable remainder, determines the saturation point in the remaining branches at a higher marginal utility, and so, in the last resort, causes a rise of the agio. Suppose we try now to unite the scattered features into one picture. In this collective stock of wealth, every people possesses a greater or less fund of subsistence. This is consumed definitely by uneconomic persons who waste their parent wealth, and by suitors for consumption credit, it is consumed as an advance by landowners, capitalists, and wage earners during the social period of production. The greater the subsistence fund, the longer can the social period of production be extended, and the more completely can the demands for consumption credit be satisfied. The return of the last extensions of production still possible, and concurrently, the valuation of the last suitors who obtain loans determine the height of the agio on present goods. Consequently, on the basis of our completed inquiries, the following factors emerge as the most important concrete circumstances or determinants which influence the rate of interest. First come the same three factors which, from our inquiry into the circumstances of the labor market in its most abstract form, we are forced to recognize as decisive. One, the amount of national subsistence fund. Two, the number of producers to be provided for out of the same Three, the position of the scale of surplus returns connected with the increase in extensions of process. After these come, four, the extent of the intensity of the desire for consumption loans. Five, the existence and the height of land rent. The higher that rent is, the more persons there are who can live on their rent without working, and the higher will be the standard of living by which they regulate their maintenance. Naturally, if the amount of subsistence which they take as advances out of the social subsistence fund goes parallel with that standard of comfort, there will be less for other purposes, and interest will remain at a higher level. The existence of land rent, therefore, tends to enhance the rate of interest. Six, the existence of a numerous capitalist class living on their own interest for reasons which apply equally to landowners and capitalists. And seven, finally, the economical habits of the population have a great influence directly and indirectly, indirectly inasmuch as national thrift gathers together a greater stock of wealth, directly inasmuch as thrifty living diminishes the claims on subsistence, whereby if subsistence remains constant, the population is maintained for a longer period, and the investment of capital is extended till there is a lower isohypsy of surplus returns. If a nation is thrifty, neither landowners nor capitalists will consume all their rents, they will either work as undertakers and live simply by their own labor, or at least they will save a portion of their income. The portion saved represents, as it were, a certain amount of the subsistence fund allotted, but not taken up, and the amount is left free for another employment, particularly for a further extension of the production period. The same is true of savings, which the laborers or such persons as are in possession of a secondary income are able to make. If we pursue this line of thought a little further, we shall repair an omission in our former analysis. Hitherto we have considered subsistence fund and subsistence claims as something actually existing and present. We must now consider them in the act of becoming. Hitherto we have looked at the subsistence fund as standing over against and disputing the claims 
which the open market made on it. We have still to consider the noiseless but never ceasing war waged on wealth in each individual economy by the desire of enjoyment. What follows will form both continuation and conclusion of another line of thought on the subject of formation of capital. Chapter 5. The Market for Capital in its Full Development Continued Every man has the power of disposal over a certain amount of goods, small or great, partly delivered him as parent wealth by the past, partly obtained by him as income in the present, and these two together form his wealth. The natural destination of this wealth is to satisfy his wants. It may be said wealth exists for wants, but many wants compete with each other and put in rival claims. On the one hand, wants of different kinds compete at the same point of time. On the other hand, wants of different times, wants of the present and wants of the future compete with each other. How are these various claims to be adjusted? In a good economical system, they will be adjusted in accordance with the principle of economical conduct, which prescribes that the goods available should secure the highest possible personal utility, and since even the richest man's wealth is not sufficient to satisfy all his wants and wishes, this again demands that he make a wise selection among his wants so that he may procure satisfaction, as his available means will allow, to the most important and leave the unimportant unsatisfied. Applied to the competition of different classes of wants, this leads to the principal harmonious satisfaction by which is meant that in all branches of want, satisfaction reaches down to the same level of importance, so that over the whole field, the unit of goods procures the same marginal utility. For if in one department of want, a man were to break off the satisfaction he gets at a high level in order to seek for satisfaction in another department at a low level, it would mean that he deliberately renounced a greater utility for a less one, and this would be to run counter to economical principles. But we employ the very same principle of harmonious satisfaction, and for the same reasons to regulate the competition between the wants of various times and the economical furtherance of our life, we reach the highest possible point when we distribute the means of satisfaction which we have at our disposal over the various periods of time in such a way that the last unit of goods procures the same marginal utility at all points of time. For so long as this is not the case, we shall obviously be able to increase the amount of our gain by withdrawing units of goods from those times in which they procure a smaller marginal utility, and applying them to the provision of those times in which they are fitted to procure a greater marginal utility. Rationally speaking, therefore, of the presently existing stock of goods, we should only consume so much in the present that the satisfaction of present wants is broken off at the same level of the satisfaction of wants will be broken off in future economic periods. Considering the then state of wants and satisfactions, everything over that should be preserved for the service of the future. In terms of this rule, parent wealth should economically almost always be saved, for if it were consumed in the present along with income, the present would be relatively overprovided and provision would be made for unimportant classes of want, while in the following years only the current income and that in the decreased amount would be available, and the consequence would be a loss of satisfaction affecting even important classes of want. In exceptional cases, on the other hand, it is directly on the lines of rational economic management to lay hands on this parent wealth at such times, say, as the income of present is abnormally small or want is abnormally urgent, while the prospects are that the future will bring a more favorable state of provision. As regards the employment of current income, the standard law of harmonious satisfaction of present and future will lead to a very different method of treatment in different cases. People whose future is secured by a safe permanent income and who at the same time do not expect any essential increase of their wants may quite reasonably consume their entire current income in the current period. Such people, for instance, as rigid landowners who have not a very large family or who have no wish to secure each of their children in a similarly comfortable life, people again whose future income is uncertain or decreasing, or people whose future wants, either their own or their families, will rise while their income is likely to remain unchanged, must economically retain a portion of their present income against the more poorly provided for wants of the future. They must save, 
and must save enough to put the present and the future on the levels as regards provision. To be exact, something more should be saved, and the provision be made a gradually augmenting one. The reason for this lies indeed in the existence of interest. Interest on capital being a fact, what we have to choose between is not whether £100 worth of wealth gives us more utility according as we assume it today, or consume it next year, or consume it in two years. The £100 saved today increases in the next year, through interest to £105, and the next again to £110, and so on. And the choice now is whether it is more useful to us to consume £100 today, or £105 next year, or £110 the next again, and we shall increase the total amount of our utility by withdrawing more and more goods from the present so long as with £105 in next year, or £110 in the next again, and so on, we can secure a greater marginal utility than by £100 in the present year. Thus while, if there were no interest, the limit of rational saving would be the point at which the utility obtainable with just £100 now, and with £100 obtainable at various future periods, is exactly the same. That limit when interest is a fact is the point where the provision for the various periods is so adjusted that £100 today are as useful as £105 next year, £110 in two years, and so on. But if an increase in expenditure in the future only gives the same amount of utility, it presupposes that, as time goes on, wants of less and less urgency are satisfied. In other words, that the provision for future periods is becoming progressively more ample. Thus it would be if the principle of economical conduct were followed with mathematical exactitude, but one might almost say that there is no point where it would be so difficult for men to act up to the claims of this principle as here. To divide the stock of goods adequately between present and future, they would require to know exactly both the future's wants and the future's provision, the provision which the future periods, when they come, will make for themselves. But men have merely vague conjectures as to both amounts. Even as to the momentous question of how many the future periods should in general be provided for, the uncertainty of human life makes them grope about completely in the dark and uncertainty which, it must be said, has no disturbing influence on the economical transactions of that very large class who are anxious to provide not only for themselves, but with as much or even more devotion of their heirs. All the more sensibly, however, is economical conduct disturbed by the familiar psychological fact that almost all men, in greater or less degree, underestimate the future and its wants. Under the influence of the circumstances just described as economical conduct of human affairs suffers a twofold deviation from the ideal of economical provision. First, men provide for the future, on the average more insufficiently than they should. They do not distribute their goods between present and future in such a way that the marginal utility of the unit of goods allotted to the present is equal to the effective marginal utilities of those units allotted to future periods, and increased by the intermediate interest. They distribute them in such a way that the marginal utility of the present unit of goods is equal to the marginal utility of the units assigned to the future, that the marginal utility is prospectively reduced. They save something for the future only in so far as it is clear that if they did not, they would have to do without future satisfactions whose urgency, even as partially underestimated by them, still appears as great as the urgency of the last present wants, which are satisfied, while its real urgency is, to a more or less degree, greater. Since the partial undervaluation of the future varies excessively in different individuals, classes, and nations, the divergence from the ideal of economic provision caused by it naturally very, very different in degree. Among prudent and savingly disposed peoples, its influence will be almost nil. In others, it will show itself only in an insufficient percentage of saving. In others, again, in the absence of all saving, or even in the light-hearted squandering of parent wealth. Second, economical deliberation on the claims of present and future is not often a finely worked out piece of economic calculation. For the most part, it is only a rough and ready reckoning of tendencies. For exact action before deciding whether to spend or save a particular sum of goods, one would always have to be making an accurate picture of want, provision, and marginal utility for the current period. 
and another picture of want, provision, and marginal utility for all future periods, but this is a piece of work which is somewhat difficult, always troublesome, and one that, in spite of all care, offers no guarantee of any correct result, for in dealing with the future, one is always compelled to work with very uncertain and conjectural data. In these circumstances, not only is it easily explained, but from the point of view of economical conduct, it is even commendable that the majority of men, instead of repeating from one case to another, or from one year to another, the troublesome and yet deceptive calculation of the claims of present and future, should once for all accept the guidance of an economic tendency which suits their circumstances fairly well, and only make a revision on occasion of great changes in their economical position, such as a marriage, receiving a legacy, and the like. Very often this rough and ready way of economic deliberation takes this form, that persons to whom the exact application of the principal rules of economical conduct is too troublesome, make a secondary rule for their circumstances and for the time live up to it. One man, for example, makes it an inviolable rule to keep his parent wealth intact, another to leave his cumbered estate free to his children, a third to put it past so much that he may leave each child a farm, a fourth to save enough to yield himself 500 pounds a year, and so on. Secondary rules like these will generally coincide more or less for those who adopt them with the demands of the true principle of economic conduct. Sometimes, however, they do not thus coincide with the result that the people who faithfully follow their secondary rule sin grievously against the primary law. For instance, it is grossly uneconomic conduct in any one to cling doggedly to his resolution of not breaking on his parent wealth and refuse the costly treatment necessary to restore his health. It is uneconomic not to make some sacrifice for the education of one's children, and so on. Finally, a great deal of uneconomic conduct arises from the fact that people who have once got into a definite habit of saving, quite reasonable at the time when it was commenced, persist in it, in a wooden sort of way, when their economic position has entirely altered. How often do we see people on the very brink of the grave who have become rich through great saving, still grudging everything to themselves and others, and continuing to scrape and hoard mechanically for love of it. They begin with saving for love, and they end with love for saving. Of these two deviations from the ideal economic conduct, the first mentioned is the more important and the more pernicious. The neglect of exact calculations prevents people from following closely the guidance of economic conduct, but it very seldom prevents them from being more or less true to it. While the psychological undervaluation of the future forces men positively and often far off the lines of economic conduct. In the undervaluation of the future, we have thus to notice a factor of interest and of the interest rate, which economically is not at all a pleasing one, but practically is a very active one. In an earlier chapter, we saw that it cooperates in the origin of the phenomenon of interest in so far as it assists to give a foundation for the undervaluation of future as against present goods. Now we come to recognize it also as an exceedingly active indirect determinant of the rate of interest. The stronger its action in the community, the higher will interest rise in that community, for the partial undervaluation of the future leads to curtailing the claims of the future as against those of the present, to assigning too many instruments of satisfaction to present wants and too few to future. But this leads on the one hand to an increase of the present claims on subsistence and on the other hand to a wasteful nibbling at the stock or at least to an inadequate renewal and increase of it through saving and thus emerges a situation favorable to a high rate of interest which is that a relatively small subsistence fund is eaten up by relatively heavy claims on subsistence and so suffices only to defray these claims for a relatively short period. The theory I have put forward has a certain resemblance to the noted, or perhaps I should say notorious, wage fund theory of the older English school. Like it, I maintain the existence of a certain subsistence fund from which the wages of labor in any country are defrayed, and like it, I attribute to the amount of subsistence fund an important influence on the reciprocal height of wage and interest. But here the resemblance ends. All the other features, and among them, the most essential features of both theories are widely divergent. The wage fund of English economists, although considered by them a given and fixed amount, 
is really a fluctuating indefinite amount, an amount which, consequently, cannot give any secure point of support on which to base any conclusion as to the height of wage. I mean that the amount of capital destined by capitalists to pay wages is neither equivalent to the total national capital, nor to the total circulating capital, nor yet to any one fixed quota of the national capital. It represents a variable portion of the community's wealth, and a portion the extent of which varies directly, among other things, with the height of wages. It is greater when and because wages have risen, smaller when and because wages have fallen, in explaining then the rate of wages by an amount which itself is conditioned by the rate of wages, the wage fund theory describes a circle. My subsistence fund, on the other hand, starts with a fixed given amount, the stock of wealth accumulated in a community. Of course, that amount of goods which specially serves as subsistence for laborers, and which I might call the wage fund, forms a part of the total subsistence fund. But the amount of this portion does not hang in the air, as it does in the English theory. In exactly analyzing what parties share in the total subsistence fund, and according to what laws my wage fund becomes at least relatively fixed and indefinite. But the most important difference is the following. The English theory has it, the rate of wages is simply got by dividing the wage fund by the number of existing workers. This is entirely wrong. In any case, the laborers get the wage fund wholly and entirely as wage, but that does not say wage for what time, for one year or two years or three years or more. The increase of the subsistence fund has not at all the result assumed by the English school, that the number of laborers remaining constant, the rate of wages rising in the same proportion as the amount of the fund increases. The increase in the subsistence fund is, in the first instance and principally, used up in lengthening the production period, and it is only in so far as the lengthening of the production period leads, at the same time to a decrease of the surplus returns according to the diminishing scale of surplus returns which accompany successive extensions of production, that it leads to a curtailment of the capitalist's share, and to a proportionate rise in the wages of labor, the rise too being in a much weaker ratio than the increase of the subsistence fund. The English wage fund theory has thus a core of truth, but it is wrapped up in a quite overpowering mass of error. And now we may dispense with one last abstraction which has served us as scaffolding in our work of explanation. Hitherto we have represented the total supply and the total demand for present goods as concentrated in one single great market. Instead of this, the commerce in present and future commodities is split up into innumerable part markets. First, it is divided into certain great groups, such as the loan market, the labor market, the land market, the market for concrete capital. And each of these markets is divided up again and again partly according to branches, partly according to districts of business. There is one market for mortgages, another business credit in connection with large undertakings, and still another business credit in connection with small. There are different loan markets for the peasant and for the citizen, for men of position and for the poor artisan, or factory hand, and so on. And again, within each of these subdivisions, there are as many distinct local markets as there are natural or artificial districts devoted to that particular department of economic life. The labor market too, it does much split up as the loan market. First there are as many groups as there are branches of labor, and then each group is divided up into as many part markets as there are local districts, and so on through all the chief groups above named. What results from this division and subdivision? As there is not one market only for present goods, neither is there only one price for them, but many and diverging market prices, as these arise directly out of the relation of supply and demand ruling in each of the individual part markets. There are in the community, at the same moment, perhaps a hundred different agios on present goods, and accordingly, a hundred different rates of interest. But the hundreds or thousands of part markets are not hermetically sealed against one another. They are all in communication and constantly engaged in arbitrating each other's prices, if in one part market the agio on present goods is for the time abnormally high, new amounts of capital quickly press into it to get the advantage and thus reduce the advantage again to zero. If conversely in one part market the agio is for the moment abnormally low, the fact is sufficient to prevent any further ascension of capital and even to convey a part of the capital employed in it to other and more favorable part markets. 
till such time as the unfavorable difference of price again disappears. It is therefore quite right to say that the price which obtains in each part market is indeed first determined by the relation of supply and demand as it exists in the special part market, while this local condition of the market itself, and with it the local price also, is determined indirectly by the immensely more powerful pressure exerted by the totality of supply and demand over the whole community. The vast mass of the national supply, acting under the influence of those tendencies to equalization with which we are familiar, forces itself into all part markets in proportional amounts. Part markets where there is not sufficient capital, it hurries from other quarters to supply. From part markets oversupplied, it flows off to other communicating part markets. And if there are neither inflowing nor outflowing, and if therefore the local market seems to form its local price purely of its own power, it is then that it is really least independent, it is not required to yield to any foreign market influences at the moment, just because it has so completely yielded to them already. It is for the moment at rest only because it is supplied in exactly the proportion which is required and affected by the pressure coming from the total relation of supply and demand over the community. It was then no empty abstraction when we spoke of one united gigantic market for present goods and of the laws of its united market price. The circumstances of the whole decide on the average amount of supply given to the part markets. Local influences may, for long or for short periods, raise the supply above the average level in one place and depress it below the level in another. But these are only secondary phenomena showing themselves, as it were, on the surface of the principal movement, and carried up or down with it, just as the surface of a great wave is furrowed and ridged by smaller wavelets that rise and fall with it. If the mobility of capital were perfect, the particular divergences from the normal rate of interest could not have any considerable strength, and still less any considerable duration. But as matter of fact, there are numerous hindrances, little and great, which check the leveling ebb and flow of capital like weirs on a stream, and these raise or depress local prices. People do not so easily change their employments of capital. If sugar refining yields 1% more than cloth making, a power loom weaver does not become a refiner on a snap of the fingers, and it may be a pretty long time before so many people have put capital in sugar refining that the rate of profit is pressed down to the normal level. Indeed, in specially favorable circumstances, one special branch of industry may retain permanently an abnormal rate of agio. The disinclination of a great many affluent people to tend their capital in small amounts and without security to necessitous persons, from whom it is difficult to get it back without strong personal effort and supervision, or it may be lengthy processes and processes of distraint, which are painful to one's own feelings, almost universally keeps the supply of this particular loan market permanently and abnormally low, and the agio permanently and abnormally high, even disregarding this deduction, which must, of course, be made in this case for premium against risk, and similarly the discount market may enjoy a permanently and abnormally low rate of interest, owing to the frequent inflow of large amounts of capital seeking short, temporary employments, and naturally not finding such either in the mortgage market or in agricultural loans or in industrial investments. The great security of the investment again, and the prospect of future rise in value, keeps the rate of interest in immovables always low, in considerations closely akin to this account for the present lower return of interest on state bonds, preferences, etc., payable in gold as compared with those payable in silver or paper. It is not my intention to pursue the fate of the rate of interest into all these much tangled bypaths where special circumstances and special considerations by the thousand may drive it. The divergences from the normal rate, temporary divergences even more than permanent, are, in truth, in their totality, a highly important phenomenon. In them lies the soul and the source of the greater part of undertakers' profits. That profit which falls to the undertakers as fruit of their prosperous arbitrage transactions in present goods. But to work this out in detail is a task by itself, an important and grateful task, but one which in importance comes behind the developing of the great law of the rate of interest. In any case, it is a task much too troublesome and much too lengthy to tempt me to a new effort, 
When I am in sight of home, after a long and difficult journey, I have stated the way in which the particular abnormalities are connected with the chief law, and for the moment enough has been done towards understanding the theory of them. And now to finish, on a former occasion, at the end of the historical part of my work, I laid down the program for my positive theory in the following words. To find for the vexed problem a solution which invents nothing and assumes nothing, but simply and truly attempts to deduce the phenomena of the formation of interest from the simplest natural and psychological principles of our science. I cannot wish more than the recognition that in the carrying out of the work I have been true to my program. For if, through logically developing the elementary theory of value, I have succeeded in obtaining the explanation of interest, it will give the strongest security that could be wise that we are moving on to the right lines with two theories, that of value and that of capital. It can be nothing but a support for my theory of capital, if that theory can assert its existence as the legitimate and natural outcome of a value theory, which has already given so much fair proofs of its correctness, and which is now receiving adherence among all systematic schools and in all countries that have shared in the advance of economical theory. And for the value theory again, it will be a new proof and perhaps the most powerful one, if by the instrumentality a problem is solved, which all theoretical systems hitherto have attempted in vain.